Malafrena by Ursula K. Le Guin. Copyright 1979 by Ursula K. Le Guin. Narrated by John MacDonald. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. From the book jacket. Ursula Le Guin has proven her amazing versatility many times over. Winning awards for her short stories, fantasy and science fiction novels, children's books and essays. In Malafrena, she offers her devoted readers something new. A magnificent mainstream novel set in the imaginary country of Orsinia in the turbulent early 19th century. The land of Orsinia has never existed, but through the brilliant vision of Ursula Le Guin, Orsinia and its people come clearly and powerfully alive. Her most impressive achievement, though, is the creation of the novel's protagonist, Itale Sorde, son and heir to an estate owner in the beautiful Malafrena Valley. Malafrena is his story an elegant, sweeping tale of Itale's remarkable education, his descent into the maelstrom of a nation's turmoil, and his final emergence into maturity and self-awareness. When the fiery, idealistic Itale is sent away to school, he quickly falls under the sway of an underground revolutionary movement, sworn to destroy Austria's domination of Orsinia. Itale is prepared to die for his country's independence, and refuses to return home to the complacent life of a wealthy landowner. He forsakes Malafrena for Krasnoy, a city in ferment. Here he embarks on a new, exciting life, learning the lessons of love from a beautiful baroness, and lessons in life from a dazzling group of intelligentsia and dissidents. But Itale pays a bitter price for his convictions. Having already given up the secure life of Malafrena, the respect of his father, and perhaps the love of his childhood sweetheart. He is jailed by the Austrian secret police. Though he is brutalized in prison, Itale's spirit and faith in his cause remain unshaken. And when the Baroness arranges his freedom in the conclusion to this towering novel of romantic and political passions, Itale finally returns to Malafrena to fight for his shining destiny. About the Author Ursula K. Le Guin was born in California in 1929. Her contributions to the literary world have come over the past decade. In that time, she has published a large body of work and has won four Hugo Awards, three Nebula Awards, the Jupiter Award, the 1969 Boston Globe Horn Book Award, a Newbery Honor Citation, and the National Book Award. She currently lives and writes in Oregon. Other books by the author. Orsinian Tales, Very Far Away from Anywhere Else, The Word for World is Forest, The Wind's Twelve Quarters, The Dispossessed, The Lathe of Heaven, The Left Hand of Darkness, City of Illusions, Planet of Exile, Rokanon's World, The Earthsea Trilogy, A Wizard of Earthsea, The Tombs of Atuan, and The Farthest Shore. Contents Part 1, In the Provinces, Side 1. Part 2, Exiles, Side 2. Part 3, Choices, Side 3. Part 4, The Way to Radico, Side 5. Part 5, Prisons, Side 5. Part 6, The Necessary Passion, Side 7. Part 7, Malafrena, Side 9. Except the Lord build the house, their labor is but lost who build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is but lost labor that ye haste to rise up early, and so late take rest, and eat the bread of carefulness, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Psalm 127 Part 1 In the Provinces 1 in a starless May night the town slept and the river flowed quietly through shadow. Over the empty courts of the university loomed the chapel tower full of silent bells. A young man was climbing over the ten-foot iron gates of the chapel quadrangle. Clinging to the ironwork, he dropped down inside and crossed the courtyard to the doors of the chapel. He took out of his coat pocket a large sheet of paper and unfolded it, 
fished around and brought out a nail, stooped and took off one of his shoes. Having got the paper and nail positioned high on the iron-barred oak door, he raised the shoe, paused, struck. The sound of the blow crashed around the dark stone courts, and he paused again as if startled by the noise. A voice not far off shouted something. Iron grated on stone. He struck three more blows until the head of the nail was driven home to the wood. Then, holding one shoe and wearing the other, he ran hopping back to the gates, threw his shoe over, climbed up and over, caught his coattails on a spike, jumped down outside with a tearing noise, and vanished into the shadows just before two policemen arrived. They peered into the chapel yard, argued in German about the height of the gate, shook its lock, and went off, boots ringing on the cobbles. Cautiously the young man reappeared, feeling about in the shadows for his shoe. He was laughing, wildly but silently. He could not find the shoe. The guards were returning. He went off in his stocking feet through the dark streets as the bells of Solary Cathedral struck midnight. As the bells were striking noon next day, a lecture on the apostasy of Julian ended, and the young man was leaving the hall with other young men when his name was spoken. Herr Sorde. Herr Itali Sorde. The students, deaf mutes, walked past the uniformed officer of the university guard without a glance. Only the one called stopped. Yes, the Herr Rector will see you. This way, please, Herr Sorde. A handsome red Persian carpet, badly worn, covered the floor of the rector's office. There was a purplish growth on the left side of the rector's nose. A wart? A birthmark? Another man stood near the windows. Please answer our question, Mr. Sorde. He looked at the paper which the other man was holding out, a sheet about a yard square, half of a poster announcing the sale of draft oxen in Solary Market, June 5, 1825. On the blank side was written in large, clear letters, O come, put your neck in the collar of Miller, von Gentz, and von Haller. All the best governments have replaced common sense with von Haller and Müller and Gentz. I wrote it, the young man said. And? The rector glanced at the other man, out the windows, and asked in a mild, deprecating tone, And you nailed it on the door of the chapel? Yes, alone. No one was with me. It was entirely my idea. My dear boy, the rector said, paused, frowned, and said, my boy, if nothing else, the sanctity of the place. I was following an historical precedent. I am a student of history. From white he turned red. Until now an exemplary student, the rector said. This is really most regrettable. Even understood as a mere prank. Excuse me, sir, it was not a prank. The rector winced and shut his eyes. It's obvious that the intent was serious. Why else have you called me in? Young man, said the other man, the man with no wart, no title, no name, you talk about seriousness. You can find serious trouble, you know, if you insist upon it. The young man went dead white this time. He stared at the man, and finally managed a very short, stiff bow. He faced the rector again, and said in an unnatural voice, I do not intend to apologize, sir. I will withdraw from my college. You have no right to ask more of me. I haven't asked that, Mr. Sorde. Please control yourself and listen. This is your last term at the university. We should wish you to finish your studies without hindrance or disturbance. He smiled, and the purplish wart on his nose moved up and down. I ask you, therefore, to promise me that you will attend no student meetings during the remainder of the term and to stay home in your rooms after sunset until morning. That is the long and the short of it, Mr. Sorde. Will you give me your word? After a short pause, the young man said, Yes. When he had gone, the provincial inspector folded up the paper and laid it on the rector's desk, smiling. A young man of spirit, he observed. Yes, mere boyish folly, this sort of thing. 
Luther had 95 theses, the provincial inspector said. He has only one, it seems. They were speaking in German. Ha, <laughs> ha, the rector laughed appreciatively. He plans a civil career? Law? No, he'll go back to the family estate. An only son. I taught his father my first year of teaching. Val Malafrena, up there in the mountains. Depths of the country, you know, a hundred miles from anything. The provincial inspector smiled. When he had gone, the rector sighed. He sat down behind his desk and looked up at the portrait on the facing wall. His look, absent at first, gradually sharpened. The portrait was of a well-dressed, well-fleshed woman with a thick lower lip, Grand Duchess Maria, first cousin once removed of Emperor Francis of Austria. On the scroll she held, the red and blue colors of the nation of Orsinia were quartered with the black two-headed eagle of the empire. Fifteen years ago the portrait on the wall had been of Napoleon Bonaparte. Thirty years ago it had been of King Stephen IV in his coronation regalia. Thirty years ago, when the rector had first become a dean, he had called boys onto the carpet for their follies. He had tongue-lashed and excoriated them. They had been sheepish, and they had grinned. They had not turned gray in the face. He had not felt this painful wish to apologize, to say to young Sorde, I'm sorry, you see how it is. He sighed again and looked at the documents he must approve. Governmental revision of curriculum, all in German. He put on his spectacles and opened the sheaf, his hands reluctant, his face weary in the radiance of May noon pouring in the windows. Sorde, meanwhile, had gone down to the park along the Molson and was sitting there on a bench. Behind scrubby willows the river stretched smoky blue in sunlight. Everything was quiet, the river, the sky, the willow leaves against the sky, the sunshine, a pigeon sunning and strutting on the gravel. At first he sat with his hands on his knees, frowning, his face vivid with emotions. Then gradually he relaxed, stretched out his long legs, then stretched out his arms along the back of the bench. His face, distinguished by a big nose, heavy eyebrows and blue eyes, got to looking more and more dreamy, even sleepy. He watched the river run. A voice went off like a gunshot. There he is. He looked round slowly. His friends had found him. Blonde, stocky, scowling Freynan had said, You haven't proved your point at all. I disallow the proof. That words are facts? Those were words I nailed up. But the act was nailing them up. But once they were there, it was them, the words, that would act and bring about results. What results did they bring about in your case? inquired Brillevi a long, thin, dark young man with an ironical look. No meetings, house arrest nights. Austria will keep you pure, by God. Brillevi laughed delightedly. Did you see the crowd in front of the chapel this morning? The whole college saw it before the Austrichers found it. Almighty Christ, I thought they'd arrest a lot of us. How did they know it was me? Go to the head of the class, Herr Sorde, said Freynen. Das würde ich auch gerne wissen. The rector didn't say anything about Amictia. There was an ostrich there. Do you think it'll make trouble for the society? Another good question. Look here, Freynen, Brillevi burst out. Both had spent the last hour in anxious search for Itale and were upset and hungry. You're the one who keeps telling us that we talk and do nothing. Now Itale's done something and you start complaining about it. Personally, I don't care if the society gets into trouble. It's a stupid lot of fellows. I'm not surprised there's a spy amongst them. He sat down by Itali on the bench. If you'd let me finish, Tomas, said Freynen, joining them on the bench, what I was going to say was this. There are about five of us in Amictio who are serious about the ideas, right? Well, after this, with Itali under observation and the whole society suspect, we're getting to the time when we have to decide how serious we are. Are we in it for the wine and the songs, or is there more to it than that? Do you nail up your verse and take your scolding and finish the term and go home to your farm, or are there, in fact, further consequences? Are our words acts? What are you thinking of, Jivan? I'm thinking of Krasnoy. What would we do there? Brillevi asked. 
skeptical, startled. There's nothing here in Solary. There's nothing in the provinces. These damn burghers, your peasants. We can't fight the Middle Ages. The capital is the only place for us if we're serious. My God, is it so far away, Krasnoy? I suppose the Molson was running through it a day or two ago, said Itale, looking at the blue river beyond the trees. Listen, this is an idea. This is a real idea, Jivan. I've got to think. I've got to eat something. Come on. Krasnoy. Krasnoy. He looked at his friends joyously. We can't go to Krasnoy, he said. They went off together, laughing. When they parted late in the afternoon and Itale set off home, his mood was still one of joyful and wondering anticipation. Was it possible that a new life was going to begin? Would he, in fact, go to the city, live there, work with other men in the cause of freedom? It was inconceivable, fantastic, splendid. How did one go about it? There must be men in the city who would welcome them and put them to work. There were said to be secret societies there, which corresponded with similar groups in Piedmont and Lombardy, Naples, Bohemia, Poland, German states. For throughout the territories and satellites of the Austrian Empire, and even beyond, throughout Europe, stretched the silent network of liberalism, like the nervous system of a sleeping man, a restless sleep, feverish, full of dreams. Even in this sleepy town, people referred to Matthias Savenskar, in exile on his estate since 1815, as the king, which he was, by right and by the will of his people, hereditary and constitutional king of a free country, and emperor and empire be damned. Itale went striding down the shady street like a summer whirlwind, his face hot, his coat open. He lived with the family of his uncle Angele Drew. Before supper he explained to his uncle that he was under nightly house arrest. His uncle laughed. He and his wife, parents of a large brood, had given their nephew a small room, large meals, and unlimited trust. Their own elder sons were none too steady, and sometimes they seemed as surprised as they were pleased by Itale's justification of their trust. "'What's the scrape? What did you pups do now?' his uncle asked. Posted up a silly poem on the chapel. Is that all? Have I told you about the night we brought the gypsy girls right into the college? They didn't use to lock it up at night. And Angele retold the story. So, what's your poem, eh? Oh, politics. Angele continued smiling, but a line of dismay or disappointment appeared in his forehead. What sort of politics? To appease him, Itale repeated his verse, and then had to explain it. I see, Angele said vaguely. Well, now I don't know. Things have changed since I was your age. All these Prussians and Swiss, Haller, Miller, Jesus Mary, what's that to us? Now I know who von Gens is. He's the head of the Imperial Police. That's a very important position. What such men do is none of our affair. None of our affair, when everything we do is theirs? When we're arrested if we open our mouths? Itale always meant to avoid discussing politics with his uncle, but his ideas were so clear and the facts so patent that each time he was sure he could convince him. Angele got more and more alarmed and obstinate till he was refusing to admit even that he disliked the foreign militia who policed the city and the university, and that he too thought of Matthias Savenskar as the king. It's just that we got on the wrong side in thirteen. Should have joined the Alliance and let Bonaparte hang himself on his own rope. You don't remember what it's like when all Europe's at war. All you hear is war. The Prussians lose, the Russians win, and armies here, and armies there. The food gets short, nobody's safe in bed. Plenty of money to be made, but no security in it, no stability. Peace is a great thing, lad. If you were a few years older, you'd have learnt that. If the price of peace is liberty, oh, well, liberty, rights. Don't be fooled by words, Itali, my lad. Words go down the wind, but peace is a God-given thing. That's the truth. Angele was sure he had convinced Itale, 
the ideas were so clear, the facts so patent. Itale at least gave up arguing. At table, Angele went off into a tirade against the new tax laws imposed by the Grand Ducal government, which an hour ago he had been defending. He ended on a plaintive note. When he smiled and glanced around apologetically at his family, he looked very like his sister, Itale's mother. The young man looked at him with affection, forgiving him. He could not be blamed for his obtuseness. After all, he was nearly fifty. At midnight, Itale was sitting at his table in his little attic bedroom. His legs were stretched out again, his chin was on his hands. He gazed over stacks of books and papers out the open window into the dark. There was the rustle and storm and hush of trees in the May night. The house was near the edge of town, and no other light was to be seen. Itale was thinking of the window of his room and home over Lake Malafrena, and of going to Quisnoy, and of the death of Stilico, and of the blue smoky river beyond the willows, and of man's life, all in one long, unarticulable thought. The clap of two pair of military boots, Austrian issue, came down the street, stopped before the house, went on. If it must be so, it must. It's necessary, he thought with apprehensive joy, as if these words summed up the rest, and listened to the soft storming of the leaves. His climb over the gate into the silent courts of the university and his interview with the rector now seemed to have occurred long ago, when he was a boy, before his acts had significance. It now seemed to him that when Freynin had said, I'm thinking of Krasnoy, he had expected the words. They had to be said. They were inevitable. He would not go back and live out his life on the farm in the mountains. That was no longer possible. It was so completely impossible that he was free to look back on that existence, which until today he had considered his unquestionable destiny, with longing and regret. He knew every foot of the earth there, every act of the day's work, every soul, knew them as he knew his own body and soul. Of the city he knew nothing. It must be, it must be, he repeated with conviction, joy, and fear. The night wind, fresh with the smell of damp earth, touched his face and swayed the white curtains. The town slept on under the stars of spring. Two. His memories of childhood were fathomless, dateless, all place and no time. The rooms of the house, the floorboards of the stair landing, the blue ringed plates, the fetlocks of a great horse standing at the smithy. His mother's hand, sunlight on gravel, rain on water, the outlines of the mountains against dark winter sky. Among these, one time was distinct that time when he stood in a room lit by four candles and saw a head on a pillow, the eye sockets pits of black, the large nose shining like metal, and a hand lay on the quilt but did not move as if it were not a hand but a thing. A voice kept murmuring. It was his grandfather's room, but his grandfather was not there. His uncle Emmanuel cast a huge shadow that moved behind him on the wall, there were huge shadows behind all the people, the servants, the priest, his mother. He was afraid to look at them. The murmur of the priest's voice was like water lapping up the walls of the room, higher and higher, singing in his ears, closing over his head. He began to gasp for breath. In suffocating terror and shadow, he had felt a big hand touch his back, and his father had said quietly, You are here too, Itale? and his father had taken him out of the room and told him to play in the garden for a while. He had run out gladly, discovering that outside the room with the candles it was not even dark yet. The bronze of sunset still glowed on the lake, the humped back of the mountain called the Hunter over a Valde Gulf, the peak of San Lorenz in the high west. His little sister Laura had been put to bed. He stayed out alone and did not know what to do. He tried the door of the tool house, but it was locked. He picked up a reddish stone from the path and whispered to himself, I am Itale. I am seven years old. But he was not sure of that. 
A child wandering in a garden in the broad, dark wind of night, lost, lost until at last his Aunt Pernetta came scolding and reassuring and hurried him off to bed. Itale Sorde, the grandfather, had lived in France in the 1770s and had traveled in Germany and Italy. His neighbors of Val Malafrena slowly forgave him, though some of them never trusted him again. At forty he had returned for good to the mountain province and to his wife, a cousin of his neighbor Count Guide Valtorskar, had improved his estate, rebuilt his house, and settled down. He sent his sons down to Solary to college, but both returned without further divagation to the Montana, the elder to run the estate and the younger to practice law, moderately, in Porta Chica. Their father never left the province after 1790. Over the years his correspondence with friends abroad had slowly decreased, then stopped. They were dead or had forgotten him, or knew he had chosen to be forgotten. After his death in 1810 he was remembered for his good management of the estate, his stately kindness, his skill as a gardener. The family was of the Dome, the commoner landowner class, which had in 1740 been granted by royal charter equal privilege with the nobles of the kingdom. In the eastern provinces, the Dome still stood outside the old social hierarchy, insulated off. In the center and west, they had, with the burghers of the capital and the major cities, become more closely engrafted with the nobility by intermarriage and custom than convention permitted most people to admit, more numerous and potentially more influential than most of them realized themselves. The magic of names still held minds enchanted, the Dome did not have names. They had property. Dom Itale's property was small but excellent. The house he built there looked out on three sides on the lake. It stood on a blunt peninsula, the end of a ridge running down from the shoulder of San Givan Mountain. The steep ridge was crowned with native oak and pine, so that approached from the east the house seemed to stand alone in a somber sweep of lake and mountain. But coming from Porta Checa, the town in the pass, one saw the fields and orchards and vineyards, the peasants' and leaseholders' houses, the roofs of other manors. The estate raised wine grapes, pears, apples, rye, oats, barley. It was a dramatic, but not a harsh climate. In a hard winter snow lay deep on the forested peaks, but not for a century had the ice frozen across Malafrena or the other lakes that stretched in a chain among the mountains to the southwest border of the land. Summers were long and hot, and thunderstorms roamed growling among the mountains. The years there were marked by drought or great rain, vintage, weather, harvest, rather than by the events of history. Whether King Stephen ruled, or Napoleon and Grand Duke Matthias, or Francis and Grand Duchess Maria, it did not much affect the weather in the earth, the flavor of the wine, the aspects of the hills. Landowners and their tenants lived wholly within the mountain barrier. Taxation they grumbled at. So had their great-grandfathers. Guide Sorde, the inheritor, was a tall man, spare, dark, with acute gray eyes, a good type of the taciturn peasants of his province, from whom his ancestors had risen to be landowners in the seventeenth century. His wife, Eleonora, born in Solary on the southern plain, was the only thing he had found outside the mountains that he prized, and he brought her back with him for good. In 1803 their son was born, their daughter three years later. Eleonora taught both children until Itale was eleven and Laura eight, then, since education had got to be a tradition in the family, and Guide upheld all traditions, a tutor began to come in thrice a week for Laura, and Itale went off to school with the Benedictines on Sinvia Mountain. He came home most weekends. It was only seven miles. On the Thursday half-holiday he would go down to Porta Checa, whose peaked slate roofs and climbing streets lay under the windows of the monastery school, and have dinner with his uncle Emmanuel and Aunt Pernetta in their high wooden house, with its garden full of marigolds, pansies, flocks, and its view over the dark streets and roofs out through the pass. The town was set in a deep gap between Sinvia and San Givan Mountains, 
Framed by the towering slopes, Portacheca's northward view had a quality of vision. It seemed as if the shadowed pass could not lead out to those remote and sunlit azure hills, but only look down on them as if on fabled kingdoms across the barrier of possibility. When clouds gathered full of thunder on the peaks and hung low over the town, sometimes the view of the lower hills shone out in a clear golden light, an enchanted realm free of the storm and darkness of the heights. Idling by the Golden Lion Inn, Itale saw the coaches of the southwestern post set off for distant cities, or come in, high, swaying, dusty from their journeys. And Portacheca, the gateway of his province, had for him the glamour of voyage and the unknown that a seaport has for one whose country's border is the sea. Saturdays at noon he walked down through town, through the oak-wooded rolling foothills, past the slopes of vine and orchard to the house by the lake. On the way he might meet and stop with his friends among the boys of the estate, or stop to talk with Brom, the master vintner, a long-legged, high-shouldered, grim old man. He would ask and tell Brone all the events of the week. If they were mishaps, Brone would say, So things go. And if triumphs, I but work certain and reward seldom domital. When he was seventeen, the monks of Sinvia sent him home, with blessings and a first prize in Latin. And he took up the life of a young landowner, learning how to prune grape stocks and drain fields and keep accounts, hunting, riding, sailing his boat Falcone on the lake. The work filled his time, but not his mind. He got restless. An important person to his family, he felt he ought to do something important. Status was obligation, that he had learned from his father, who never talked about duty, but autocrat as he was, served it unquestioning. Seeking a worthy duty, the boy studied the lives of great men. Aeneas had been his first hero. His grandfather had told him the story. Then he had read it in school in his father's battered school copy. But he found others in the meager lot of books he could get, Pericles, Socrates, Hector, Hannibal, and there was Napoleon. His childhood passed under the empire, his boyhood during the exile. Powerless on his island jail, defeated, humiliated, Napoleon loomed there like Prometheus in chains, while over the broad lands of Europe and Russia ruled little apprehensive kings. In his grandfather's library, the seventeen-year-old found so many French books that, enlisting his sister's willing aid, for she was being tutored in French, he taught himself enough of the language to be able to read Voltaire. Laura tried to read with him, but found it boring, and returned to her mother's favorite, the new Eloise, at which Itale was relieved, since at the monastery school Voltaire had been mentioned only in the same breath with the devil, and he was not quite sure what he was getting into. There were some odd volumes of the Moniteur, the French government newspaper. He looked at one from 1809 and found it, like all newspapers he had ever seen, the mouthpiece of authority. But later he chanced on a volume from the early 1790s. He did not at first recall what had been going on in Paris then. The monks had not been strong on recent history. He came on speeches made by Monsieur Danton, Monsieur Mirabeau, Monsieur Vergniaud. They were strangers to him. Monsieur Robespierre he had heard mentioned, along with Voltaire and the devil. He turned back to the year 1790 and began reading steadily. He held the French Revolution in his hands. He read the speech in which the orator called down the wrath of the people on the house of privilege, the speech that ended, Vivre libre ou mourir. Live free or die. The yellow newsprint crumbled under the boy's touch. His head was bowed over dry columns of words spoken to a lost assembly by men thirty years dead. His hands felt cold as if a wind blew on him. His mouth was dry. He did not understand half what he read, knowing almost nothing of the events of the revolution. It did not matter. He understood that there had been a revolution. The speeches were full of rant, cant, and vanity. He saw that clearly enough. But they discussed freedom as a human need, like bread, like water. 
Itale got up and walked up and down the quiet little library, rubbing his head and staring blankly at the bookcases and the windows. Freedom was not a necessity. It was a danger. All the lawmakers of Europe had been saying that for a decade. Men were children, to be governed for their own good by the few who understood the science of government. What did this Frenchman Vaniot mean by stating a choice, live free or die? Such choices are not offered to children. The words were spoken to men. They rang bald and strange. They lacked the logic of statements made in support of alliances, counter-alliances, censorships, repressions, reprisals. They were not reasonable. Itale came late to supper, looking feverish. He ate little and soon escaped the house, going down to the lake shore in the darkness. There he wrestled for some hours with the angel, the messenger who had challenged him that afternoon. He put up the best fight he could, since for a nineteen-year-old he regarded clear thinking highly, but the angel won hands down. Itale could not refuse what he had wanted and sought, the ideal of human greatness, not embodied in a person, but to be won for all by the fellowship of mankind. So long as one soul is unjustly jailed, I am not free, thought the new convert. And when he thought of these things, his face took on a stern expression, and also a look of great happiness. His twentieth year was, in fact, the happiest of his life. When, out of long silence, he would reply to something his mother said, she would look at him wistfully and wonder where it was he had been, so far from her that his blue eyes looked at her with joyous recognition, as if he had been long away in distant lands. She knew before he did that he wanted to leave home. He found it out for himself that summer. When his work was done, he would take his boat and run the shining lake, returning at dusk from the farthest eastern gulfs where the river Chiasa sprang from the lake and started down the forested mountainsides to the foothills and the plains to join the Molson and run on with it. The stream he watched chasing down amongst the rocks would by summer's end have reached the sea, while he stayed home by the still lake. Guide Sorde was told that it was natural for a young man to want to leave home for a while, but he saw it as mere folly. The estate had to be run. Itale was the heir. If one had a job, one did it. Eleonora, following her brother-in-law's suggestion, had proposed sending Itale to college in Solari. After all, your father sent you and Emmanuel there. There's nothing there he needs, said Guide, in his quiet voice, in which one could hear, like a wind blowing from the edge of distant storm, a muted resonance of passion. Waste of time. Eleonora had never combated her husband's arrogant provincialism for herself, but for Itale she did. He needs to meet people, to know the world a little. What good will he be to his peasants if he's no more than another peasant? Guide scowled. His wife was using his own weapons against him, more cleverly than he could use them, and he felt besides that he had not been able to express his real reason for not wanting to let the boy go. He was angry at his family for not understanding this motive, which he did not understand himself, and offended because he knew he must give in. Everybody knew he would give in, even Itale. Only Eleonora had the tact to argue with him. So in September of 1822 Itale set off on the Montana diligence, northward through the pass and down. Looking back, he saw the mountains above long rising ranges of foothills, their familiar outlines changed and changing. San Givan had revealed a great falling eastern slope, Sinvia a second peak. The faint blue outline beyond them, the farthest away, must be the hunter. As it sank out of sight, Itale got out his watch, his grandfather's silver watch, and checked the hour, 9.20 of the morning. Here on the descending road, now bending towards the southeast, it was sunny. Crickets sang in the mown fields. Harvesters were at work. The villages were deserted, tranquil in the sunlight. It was the golden land he had seen from beneath the storm clouds of Porto Checa. They passed through towns and villages whose names he knew from hearsay. Vermare, Chaga, Bara. 
With the last, they left the Montaigne province, and at Ereme he changed to the Sudana post. He looked intently at the people, the houses, the chickens, and pigs as the Sudana post rolled along to see what pigs, chickens, houses, people looked like down here. In Solari all things were sleepy. Livestock was fat, houses drowsed in their overgrown gardens full of roses, even the Molson slept as it flowed through Solary under the old bridge, sending its wide flood slow and shining to the south. The students of the university did not work hard. They did not duel. They drank a lot of wine and fell in love continually, and the girls of Solary fell in love with them. In his second year, Itale, abandoned by a faithless baker's daughter, renounced love violently and turned to politics. He became a leader in the student society, Amictia. The government was barely tolerant of Amictia. All such student groups had been outlawed in the Germanies. A society at the University of Vilno so aggravated the Tsar of all the Russias that in 1824 he disbanded it, exiled the boys that led it, and put the entire student body and faculty under permanent surveillance. It was this sort of thing that gave Amictia its spice. They drank a lot of wine and sang the society's forbidden anthem, Beyond this darkness is the light, O liberty, of thine eternal day. They passed contraband books around, discussed the revolutions of France, Naples, Piedmont, Spain, Greece, talked of constitutional monarchy, equality before the law, popular education, a free press, all without any clear idea of what they were getting at, where it all led. They were not supposed to talk, so they talked. So the third year passed, and Itale thought himself ready to go home for good, until he found himself half-shod and laughing in the dark court of the chapel, until he heard Freynin say in the sunlight over the river, I'm thinking of Krasnoy. 3. Emmanuel Sorde cleared his throat and remarked with the carelessness suitable to an explosive topic, The newspaper is quite a puzzle this week. I wonder if the estates aren't going to be convened after all. The National Assembly? Why, dear me, they haven't met, have they, since King Stefan died? Thirty years ago, that's right. How extraordinary. It's only my guess, Count. The courier Mercury says nothing. Therefore, one suspects something. Yes, Count Orland Valtorskar sighed. My wife used to have me subscribe to the Esnar Mercury. It seemed to have more facts in it. Whatever became of it? It was banned so long that its owners went bankrupt, Detale answered with heat. Since then we've had no free press at all. What if the estates do meet, said Guide, in his slow, hard, quiet voice. They'll talk and do nothing, as in ninety-six. Talk, said his son, setting down a wine glass, which continued to ring for a moment. It's not unimportant that— But Emmanuel interrupted him. They might be able to do something about taxation, at least. The Hungarian diets won back control over their taxes from Vienna. What if they did? Taxes won't be decreased. Taxes are never decreased. The money wouldn't go to support a foreign police force at any rate, said Itale. What's that to us up here? Count Orlant's long face, smooth and rosy for his years, wore a look of increasingly bewildered compunction as the discussion went on. He felt sorry for them all. Emperors, policemen, tax collectors. Poor fellows caught in the webs and pressures of material affairs— but he knew something more than sympathy was expected of him, and he was never able to meet their expectations. There was Guide looking black, Emmanuel watchful, Itale getting hotter and hotter and finally bursting out as usual. A time will come! But to Count Orlant's relief, Guide spoke, setting the challenge aside. Let's go out to the terrace. They joined the women on the railed and paved garden old Itale had built out over the lake under the south windows of the house. It was a warm evening, the last of July. The water reflected the pale blue sky evenly, except where in the large shadows of the mountains it lay translucent brown. 
Far off east, where the lake was hidden by slopes descending sheer into it, a little haze veiled the water. In the west, sunset still colored the sky behind San Lorenz Mountain, and lighted the air so that the white flagstones of the terrace, the white Nicotiana flowering in pots, the white dress Laura wore, the blue surface of the lake, all were faintly flushed with rose, fading now as the sky paled, and Vega overhead sent its first broken radiance down through the quiet air. The cypress at the outer corner of the terrace stood black against luminous water and sky, and the air bore a scent of dusk, dampness, flowers, and the murmur of women's voices. Oh, Lord, Lord, what a wonder of an evening, sighed Count Orlant in a strong provincial accent, submissively, as if asking what he had ever done to merit so fine an evening. He stood looking out over the lake, his long face serene. Eleonora and her sister-in-law were going through the week's gossip, which they exchanged weekly, Eleonora reporting on Val Malafrena, and Prunetta covering events in Porta Checa. The two girls, Piera Valtorskar and Laura, were talking together, and lowered their voices when the men came out. He can't dance at all, Laura was saying. The hair on the back of his neck looks like moss on a stump, said Piera dreamily, with complete lack of feeling. She was sixteen years old. Her face, like her father's, was long and naturally serene. She was small, and her figure and hands were still childishly plump. If only there was somebody new, for a real ball, Piera asked with sudden interest, do you think they'll have vanilla ices? Pernetta, meantime, had interrupted a complex narration to ask her husband, Emmanuel, isn't Alicia Vera Choi Alexander Sorrentai's second cousin? No doubt. She's related to everybody in the Montana. Then it was his mother who married a man from Val Altesma named Berchoi in 1816, wasn't it? Whose mother? Alicia's husband's. But Pernetta, dear, said Eleonora, Jeevan Vera Troy died in 1820, so how could his wife have remarried in 1816? Sir, 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 Emmanuel went and escaped, while Pernetta said, But Rosa Bertroy is Alicia's mother-in-law, don't you see? And Eleonora cried, Oh, it's Edmund Sorrentai, you mean, not Alexander, and it was her father that died in 1820. Guide's brother, though six years younger than he, was grayer. His face was more mobile, less strongly marked. Unambitious and sociable, he had chosen to live in town and practice the law, in which he had taken his degree at Solary. He had twice refused a judgeship, never explaining his refusal, which most people ascribed to indolence. He was, in fact, indolent and inclined to irony, describing himself both as a superfluous man and a supremely fortunate one. He deferred to his brother. He would counsel him, but unwillingly. A lawyer's experience of humanity had rubbed him down, worn the corners off him, while Guide, like a flint, never dislodged from its cliff above the torrent, had kept every angle and salience of his character intact. Emmanuel and Pernetta had had one child, stillborn. She, an active woman of a temperament drier and more sardonic than his own, made no comment when he described himself as supremely fortunate, nor did she ever meddle in the upbringing of her niece and nephew. But they were her sunlight, her pride, her fortune. Itale joined his uncle at the balustrade under the cypress. The young man's face was still flushed, his hair and cravat were rather wild. You saw in the Courier Mercury that the provincial diet of the Polana is meeting? That's the man I was talking about, Stefan Oregon. I remember. So he'll be a deputy if the assembly meets. Yes, he's what we need, a Danton, a man who can speak for the people. Do the people want to be spoken for? This was not the kind of question the members of Amictia had asked one another. And which people? Emmanuel pursued his advantage. Our class is scarcely the people. The merchants? 
The peasants here? The city rabble? Don't the different classes have rather different demands? Not ultimately, Itale said, thinking as he spoke. The ignorance of the uneducated limits the usefulness of education in those who receive it. You can't limit the light. You can't build equity on any foundation but equality. For four thousand years that has been proved over and over again. Proved, Emmanuel demanded, and they were off, full gallop. Their discussions always started thus, with Emmanuel in control, pressing Itale to defend his opinions, and always ended with Itale out of control, prevailing through sheer good-natured eloquent conviction. Then Emmanuel would reorganize, provoke another defense, all the while persuaded that he did so to keep his nephew from second-hand thinking, and not because he, too, craved to hear and speak the words, Our country, our rights, our freedom. Itale's mother called him to fetch Prunetta's shawl, which she had left in the gig. When he returned, sunset was over, the breeze smelled of night. Sky, mountains, lake lay drowned in a deep obscurity of blue, shot through with luminous mists. Laura's white gown showed against the shrubbery with the same misty gleam. You look like Lot's wife, her brother said. The stickpin's coming out of your tie, she retorted. You can't see it in the dark. I don't need to. Your tie has never been the same since you read Byron. Laura was tall like her brother, thin, with strong, delicate wrists and hands. She loved her brother passionately, but was ruled by an imperative honesty of heart. When Itale's mother brought him down out of the clouds, she scarcely knew it and never intended it. His sister, admiring and intolerant, always did. She wanted him to be himself, considering him in himself superior to all fashions, opinions, authorities. A very gentle, unassuming girl of nineteen, she was in this as intransigent as her father. Itale valued her opinion of him above any other, but at this point he was merely mortified, because Piera Valtorskar was listening, having rapidly adjusted his necktie, he said with pedantry, I have no idea why you think I should want to imitate Lord Byron in any way except perhaps his death. He died a hero, no doubt of that. But the poetry is trivial. But last summer you made me read that whole book about Manfred, and you were quoting him today. Thy something or other wings are something. Thy wings of storm are held at rest. That's not Byron, that's Estenscar. You mean you haven't read the odes? No said Laura meekly. I have, said Piera. Then you know the difference, at least. But I haven't read the translation of Lord Byron. I think Papa hid it. Piera spoke very softly. Well, that's all right. At least you've read Estenscar. You liked it, didn't you? That was the eagle, and it ends, But cage thou seest the centuries open before thee like the open sky. Ah, oh, really, that's magnificent. But who is it about? Laura inquired in honest confusion. Napoleon, her brother thundered, outraged. Oh, dear, Napoleon again, said their mother. Itale, dear, will you fetch my shawl, too? It's in the hall. Or call Cas, but I expect he's having his dinner now. Itale brought her shawl and then hesitated, standing by her chair, as to where to go next. He ought to return to his uncle at the balustrade and have a sensible, manly conversation, thus proving to Piera and himself that it was only because she was so childish that he appeared to be childish when he was with her. But he wanted to stay and talk with the two girls. His mother looked up at him. Whenever did you grow so tall? she asked in a puzzled, musing tone. Light from the house window shone on her upturned face. When she smiled, her underlip hid beneath the top one, and this gave her a demure, sly look that was perfectly charming. Itale laughed for no reason, looking down at her, and she laughed at him because he looked so tall and because he was laughing. Count Orlant had wandered over and asked, touching his daughter's hair, You are not cold, Contesina? No, Papa, it's lovely out here. I suppose we should be going in, Eleonora said comfortably not moving. 
What's become of the picnic in the pine forest? asked Pernetta. We've been promised it all summer. Oh, I forgot to say, if we want we can go tomorrow. The weather will hold, won't it, dear? Likely, said Guide, who sat near her, sunk in his own thoughts. He did not like the discussions his son and his brother carried on at his table. He treated all political discussions with contempt. Some of his fellow landowners, who had no interest in events outside the province but were engrossed in local politics, returned the contempt. Sorde never looks up from his plow. Others said with envy, Sorde is one of the old breed, the independent gentry, comparing him to their fathers and grandfathers, for whom, as usual, life had been so much simpler. But Guide knew well enough that his father had not been one of the old breed. He remembered the letters that had used to come from Paris, Prague, Vienna, the guests from Krasnoy and Esnar, the discussions at table and in the library. Yet old Itale had taken no part in local politics and had never explained his own ideas except in direct answer to a question. There had been more to his silence and self-exile on the estate than natural tolerance and reserve. It had been a choice, scrupulously kept, made perhaps in self-knowledge, perhaps in the bitterness of defeat. Guide did not know. The child of that choice, he had never questioned it. Now for the first time he was forced to, and to consider that what he had considered his destiny was also perhaps an unacknowledged, unexamined choice. So he sat somber in the mild summer dusk. His son's voice, the girl's voices, flowed past him like water. Pernetta sat silent. Count Orlant and Eleonora had joined Emmanuel at the terrace edge. The three young people were talking softly. It's going to sound very silly, but you know I have an idea about that, Laura was saying. I don't believe you have to die if you don't want to. I mean, I know you do, and still... I can't believe people would die if they really absolutely wanted not to. She smiled. Her smile was like her mother's. <laughs> I told you it was silly. No, I've thought the same thing, said Itale. He found it extraordinary, mysterious, that he and his sister had had the same thought. He admired Laura. She had had the courage to speak it. He had not. I can't find the reason for dying, the need. People simply get tired, give in, isn't that it? Yes. Death comes from outside. A disease or a whack on the head, something from outside, not oneself. Exactly. And if one were really oneself, one would say, No, sorry, I'm busy, come back later when I've done everything I have to do. All three of them laughed, and Laura said, And that would be never. How could you ever get everything done? You certainly can't in seventy years. It's ridiculous. If I had seven hundred, I'd spend the first century thinking, finishing thoughts I never have time to finish. After that, I could do things properly, instead of rushing in and making a mess every time. What would you do? Pierre asked. Well, one century for traveling. Europe, the Americas, China. I'd go somewhere where no one knew me at all, said Laura. It wouldn't have to be that far. Val Altesma will do. I'd like to live where no one knew me and I didn't know anyone. And I think I'd like to travel, too. I should like to see Paris and the volcanoes in Iceland. I'd stay here, said Piera. I'd buy up all the land around the lake, except yours, and make the disagreeable people move away. I shall have an enormous family, fifteen at least. On July 31st, every year, they'll all come home from wherever they were, and we'll have a great enormous party on the lake with boats. I'll bring fireworks from China for it. I'll bring volcanoes from Iceland, said Laura. And again they all laughed. What would you do with three wishes? Piera asked. Three hundred more, Laura said. Not allowed. It's always three. Well, I don't know. What would you wish, Itale? A decent-sized nose, he said gravely, after consideration. One that people didn't take notice of. And I'd like to be at King Matthias's coronation. That's two. What else? Oh, nothing else. That's enough, Itale said with his quick, broad smile. I'll give the third one to Piera. I expect she has a use for it. No, 
Three is plenty, Piera said, but she would not tell what her three wishes were. All right, Laura said. I'll use up Vitale's spare wish. I'd wish we find out we were right and all live seven hundred years. And come back summers for Piera's party on the lake, Itale added. Can you make any sense of it, Pernetta? Eleonora inquired. I never listen to them, Lele, Pernetta answered in her dry contralto. It's no use. It's just as sensible as all that about whose mother-in-law is somebody else's stepsister's uncle, Laura retorted. And far more profound, said her brother. Oh, but the Soren ties ball. We haven't even decided on Pierre's dress, and when is it to be the twentieth? The twenty-second, both girls replied. The conversation turned with vigor to the subject of taffeta, organdy, Swiss, Ampere, tuckered, a la Grec. White Swiss with tiny green dots with a dropped tucker. I can show you the very thing in Pernetta's book. But, Mama, that's ancient. That book's from 1820. My dear, if we did dress in fashion up here, who would know it? Eleonora inquired without asperity. She had been a beautiful and admired girl in Solary, but had left all that behind her, down there, without a backward glance when she married Guide Sorde. I think the dropped tucker is an uncommonly pretty style. Do you like the idea, Piera? Piera's mother had died fourteen years ago in an epidemic of the cholera that had also taken the Sorde's last born, a baby girl. There were nurses and servants aplenty in Count Orlan's house, an ancient great-aunt, cousins, relatives of the mother. But Eleonora had taken charge of the two-year-old Piera at once, firmly, as if by right. Count Orlant, grieving, anxious, grateful, soon dared not decide anything concerning his daughter without consulting Eleonora, who in turn had never presumed on the privilege of affection. She and Piera loved each other more easily, more cheerfully than any mother and daughter could do, however good their disposition. Piera, often slow to speak, was considering Eleonora's question. Yes, she said, and thought a little longer. I'd like a grey silk gown with panel, she said, like that plate for the court ball dress, and a gold scarf, and silk shoes with gold roses. Oh, dear! said Eleonora. Count Orlant was listening. He had never got over a deep wonder at the fact that Piera, this young person who was so candid yet so secret, and in whom he glimpsed when he least expected it a whole strange world of ideas, knowledge, and emotions which could not possibly have had time in sixteen years to grow so deep and strong, that this extraordinary child on the point of becoming a woman was, when you came right down to it, his daughter. Though he relied upon her love, he was often afraid of her. Just now the wonder returned. He saw her vision, a royal maiden in silk and cloth of gold. That sounds very charming, he said, timidly, proffering his opinion to the wise ladies. They sighed, hedged. Perhaps a gold scarf with a white organdy? Eleonora went on, trying to soften the veto. The Valtorskars, father and daughter, accepted the judgment without question, listened to further suggestions, and, listening, continued to entertain their tacit and contented vision of magnificence. Guide and Emmanuel were talking about hunting. It was Itale that now sat unheeding, tense with his thoughts. Down in Solary he had planned to tell his family his decision on the night he came home. He must not deceive them by letting them think him home to stay. He had been home three weeks now and had said nothing. Coming in at the Golden Lion in Porta Cheka, as he swung down off the coach he had seen his father turn to look for him. On Guide's face had been the rare smile that made him look a different man, awkward, vulnerable. At the memory of it, Itale clenched his hands in unavailing protest. It was unjust of his father to be so happy, to show his happiness at his return. How could a man act like a man, Say what he had to say, and do what he had to do when all these unspoken feelings clung and clustered round him, holding him back, tying him down. And not only other people's feelings, he would admit, but his own. 
all the happiness of his boyhood around him once again, unchanged, all his own love and loyalty, all his old expectations of life. The earth itself held him here more strongly than any other bond, the red dirt of the vineyards, the long great lines of the mountains against the sky. How could he leave all that? The scythe he was honing, or the boat tiller, or the book in his hand would be forgotten for a moment, and he would look unseeing out over Malafrena with a heaviness in him. It was as if a spell was laid upon him here, which he could not break, though he might escape from it, a charm that grew strongest in certain hours, certain conversations. He did not want to think about it. That was the rankest injustice, the least tolerable. He could not fall in love here with a mere child. There was no question of it, of childish flirtations and unspoken understandings. He had outgrown all that. It was love he wanted, adult love, and he would find it in Krasnoy, for he had to go to Krasnoy. Beneath all his hesitations the same voice said to him resolutely and mournfully, It's necessary. It must be. Did you track her, Itale? Emmanuel was talking of the she-wolf that had been seen up on San Lorenz. No luck, he answered, and as he spoke he decided that he must speak to his father. He prepared himself for the ordeal by speaking to his uncle that night after the others had gone indoors. Emmanuel seemed not unprepared for the revelation. After he had determined Itale's plans, which consisted of going to Krasnoy and finding out how he could be useful to the patriotic cause, if in fact there was one, and after he had watched and listened to his nephew a while, he made his meditative noise. It all sounds vague. It all sounds dangerous to me. But lawyers always see the wrong side of things. I don't know how Guide will see it. I'm afraid it will make no sense whatever to him in any terms. Surely he'll understand me if he'll listen to me. He won't. He's counted on you these twenty years to work with him. Grudged you the three years in the South. Now this? Besides, I don't know that you understand what you're doing yourself. You aren't following reason as well as I can see. Like him, you act from passion, a passion for moral clarity, the will to be yourself. And now your will is different from his, radically different. You think you're going to discuss that difference reasonably and come to an agreement? I doubt it. But Father believes in duty, in serving principle. Of course, in a way, I'd rather stay here. I wish I could stay here. But this is more important than any private wish, and I know he could understand that. I can't stay here until I'm free to stay here. And you're to win that freedom by serving other men's needs? I won't win it, the young man said. Freedom consists in doing what you can do best, your work, what you have to do, doesn't it? It's nothing you have or keep. It is action. It is life itself. But how can you live in the prison of others' servitude? I can't live for myself until everyone is free to do so. Until the kingdom is come, Emmanuel murmured ironically with pain. The lake stretched away from them, very dark, very still, barely a noise of water lapping the foundation of the terrace or the pilings of the boathouse. Eastward the bulks and slopes of the mountains stood outlined against a dim whiteness in the sky. Moonrise. Westward was only darkness and the stars. 4. Hoy! The cry re-echoed off the water that lay sparkling between the boats, but there was no answering call, and the sharp brown sail ahead of them skimmed on unheeding. Call out again, Count Orlant. They're too far away, said Pernetta. Oh, dear, and we'll never catch Falcone. Itale, dear! They're turning, said Count Orlant, frowning into the dazzle. The brown sail, sharp as a hawk's wing, was coming round. Count Orlant brought Mazeppa into the wind, heading her home. Soon the smaller boat had come up even with her, and they heard the boatsman's hail. Hoy there! Hoy! 
Eleonora hailed gallantly, sounding like a quail. Clouds! It's going to storm! We ought to start home! What's up? Home! Pernetta contributed, waving at the passing thunderclouds over San Lorenz. Flora wants to hunt mushrooms at Evalde. Oh, dear, I can't shout any more. Do tell them it'll take too long to hunt mushrooms, and I already have two barrels down in pickle. It's going to rain. Oh, dear. They heard laughter in Falcone, and presently Emmanuel's voice. Mushrooms? No, mushrooms! Evalde! called Itale, standing up in the prow. Home! Count Orlot roared in an unexpected mountaineer's bellow. The figure in the prow of the other boat made a sweeping bow, executed a few dance steps, and vanished. He fell in, Eleonora cried. But Falcone sailed on past them, Itale and Laura now performing a minuet in the stern. By the time Mazeppa lumbered in, Emmanuel and the three young people were already up on the terrace. Itale was expounding something. His blue eyes shone in his wind-flushed face. Eleonora and Pernetta both looked at him with unqualified admiration. And Pernetta said, Itale, what on earth did you do with your hat? It's all wet, Eleonora said. You did fall overboard. Piera suddenly laughed, a loud, irrepressible laugh. He was fishing with it. With his hat? With his hat, said Emmanuel, and two young ladies holding a leg apiece and shrieking, Don't kick, don't kick. But what for? My ferns. Piera dropped her ferns overboard when the boom came round, so I tried to get them back. And what's become of the dipper I keep in Falcone? He and the girls were red with laughter. I begged you to let me come in Mazeppa, Emmanuel said. And, Laura, you never once put up your parasol. Now you'll be freckled till Michaelmas. Freckles, said Count Orlan thoughtfully. I remember when this contesina was small and running about all day. I once counted eighteen freckles on her nose alone. Rather becoming, I thought. And a fine thing if they go to the Sorrentai's ball looking like a pair of old saddles said Eleonora. You needn't look so pleased with yourselves, you two. Itale looked at Piera as she stood half turned from him, and saw on the slender nape of her neck below the wind-loosened chignon three freckles. A pleasant sight. And he never even got the ferns, said Laura. Because neither of you would hold on, and I couldn't keep my face out of the water. He bubbled, Piera said and they all began laughing again. Oh, he lay there on the water, waving his arms and bubbling. Oh! <laughs> when they recovered, Eleonora said, wiping her eyes, How can you all be so silly? Is Guide still out? He probably hasn't even looked up at the sky. Dear lady, said Emmanuel, taking his sister-in-law by the waist, Twenty-seven years in Val Malafrena, and she still isn't used to thunderstorms. Twenty-eight years, dear. But I do think it's a shame all the best days up here end in a lot of pouring and growling and Guide coming in dripping on the floor. She and Emmanuel rocked back and forth on their heels, beaming at the others. There was a long roll of thunder from San Lorenz, and one of them said, Here it comes. The thunderheads had massed gray and gray-black, boiling over the mountain and reaching across the lake. "'In with us,' said Eleonora. Guide was standing at the south windows of the living room. Itale stopped short in the hall, looking at that black figure against the stormy light. "'Tea! Eva!' cried Eleonora, vanishing kitchenward. "'A beautiful day!' said Count Orlant, sitting down with relief in one of the heavy old oaken armchairs. Wish you'd been with us, Sorde. Eh? I should be having some days free soon. I'd like you to try the hawk old Rika's trained. 
Falconry was still a common sport in Montana. Guide and his son were adepts. Emmanuel took pleasure in it, and Count Orlanche could appreciate the points of a hawk, though in his heart there was no great desire to go trotting about the countryside, carrying on his wrist a big bird, before whose cruel straight stare he felt somehow inferior. I wish you'd take her out, Itale, Guide was saying. She should fly. I haven't had the time working with Steri. I will. He answered the simple request with a bad conscience, and was relieved when his mother interrupted the falconer's talk, coming in with Ava the cook and tea. The pleasure of the day was gone. As soon as he had entered the house he could think of nothing but that he must speak to his father tonight. He sat, his damp hat between his knees, like an awkward guest, who could neither talk nor take his leave. The women were aware of his attitude. His mother was profoundly uneasy, knowing there was some change in him. Laura thought he was up on his pedestal showing off again. She didn't know why he would no longer talk to her about what preoccupied him, and felt cheated and resentful. Pernetta thought him very funny and very handsome as he sat there, nursing his weed-looped hat. She never worried about him, convinced no harm could come to a boy like that. As for Piera, who sat next to him on the couch, she was aware of his silence, of the blue coat he wore, of the slight rough darkness of his cheek, of his presence, the weight and reality of his being there. She went no further. Had he spoken, she would have listened to his voice as part of that inexplicable presence. He was silent. She listened to his silence. She thought she had never been so happy as she was right now, and most likely would never be so happy again, since things would not be exactly the same again. Her joy, undulled by age and habit, unfounded on any permanence of life, knew its own defenselessness. She dared not handle it, clear and fragile as glass. If she felt the trouble in him, it was as part of her own trouble and joy, part of the strangeness of him and of their sitting side by side on the couch drinking tea. Count Orlant returned from prowling in the library. That must be an interesting botanical collection your father made, Sorde. I wish he'd gone in for astronomy. I suppose no one much reads those. Itale's in there a good deal, but not for botany, said Laura hoping for a rise out of her brother. I remember your grandfather teaching you the Latin names of the plants out in the garden. I don't suppose you remember that. At least Itale can still tell me the name of that exotic under the east windows, that I always forget again immediately. What is it? Eleonora said. Mondevilia suaviolens, said her son. Brief hard rain whitened the windows. The thunder had passed over. Low sun shone gold on the lake through rain. Oh, do you know these summer storms are pleasant? They lighten the air. I get much the best results with my telescope after a thunder shower, Count Orland confirmed. As Emmanuel asked him something about his astronomy, Itale said to Piera, without knowing he was going to say anything, Have you read Estenskar's other books? Just the odes. May I lend you the torrents of Croatia? It's very fine. If, if Papa approves. Itali frowned. Eston Scar is a great poet and a noble mind. It's fear that bans his works, but mere sloth that accepts the ban. You should insist on a freedom which is your obligation. The sixteen-year-old countess, with her round arms, her curly hair, and slender freckled neck, glanced at her father, who was saying, but if a comet came very close to the earth, there's no telling, and looked at Itale and said, I will. After a moment she added, Papa likes to know what I read, and I think he did hide Lord Byron, but I don't think he'd really stop me from reading anything. I didn't mean him exactly, that is, not personally, but let me lend you the book, Piera. I really think you'll find it very fine. He ended up pleading. The matter, like everything that came up that day, seemed of illimitable importance. I like to read it very much, Itale. He started up to bring the book from his room. 
But you'll be over Tuesday night, and if you brought it then, Papa wouldn't notice me carrying it home and ask. He hesitated. I'd better give it to you now. She was puzzled, but took the book he brought her and did not ask what could keep him from coming to Valtorsa on Tuesday night. Everyone went out together to leave or say goodbye as they went down the path. There was a gust of perfume about them in the rain-washed evening air. Piera asked, Is that the Mandevilia? Suaviolens, said Itale, walking beside her, and smiled. As Emmanuel and Pernetta were driving up to Porta Checa, fields and wooded hills flowing past them, molasses dark in the late evening, the clop of the horse's hooves dull on the dust-thick road, the wife broke a long silence between them. Our nephews come home moody. Hmm, said the husband. Owl. What? Owl flew over. Hmm. He and Pierre, girls sixteen. I was nine the first time I saw you. You're not saying they're in love. Certainly not, but you never think anyone's in love. Don't know what the word means. Hm, said Panetta in her turn. No, I suppose I do. I've seen it once. Guide in ninety-seven. He was a new man in a new world that year. So they married. How long did it last? Eight months? Ten months? Most people never have that much. A few hours, if anything. Rubbish. Funny old man, said his wife, in one of her rare and always private impulses of tenderness. But all the same, Piera and Itale, of course, it's the most natural thing in the world. But Itale's leaving. Leaving? Going to Krasnoy. The horse snorted several times, starting the pull up towards the pass. Why? He wants to work for a patriot group. Politics? But there are offices here to be had. Our provincial politics are a swindling game played by idle landowners and professional incompetence. Well, but... Pernetta meant that was what all politics meant to her, and Emmanuel understood her. Itale is not looking for an office, but for a revolution. Do you mean, she asked after pondering, the Sovenskarists, those people, like that writer in Esnar that was put in jail? Yes, they're not common criminals, you know. They're mostly gentlemen and parish priests, I believe. Decent men all over Europe are involved in this sort of thing. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Emmanuel said violently, and shook the patient horse's reins. Does Guide know? Do you remember when Julian's flour mill blew up? She stared, then nodded. When did Itale tell you? Last night. Did you encourage him? I? I, at fifty, encourage a boy of twenty-two to go remake the world? <laughs> This will break Eleonora's heart. No, it won't. I know you women. The more risks he runs, the more follies he commits, the prouder you'll be of him. But Guide, the boy is Guide's future. To see that at risk, astray. The boy is his own future, Pernetta said very gravely. But how much risk is there in this? I don't know. I don't want to think about it. I think too much about risks, about people's feelings, all that. That's why I'm a provincial lawyer and have never done anything that took courage, and never will, because I'm too old now to upset the housekeeping. I wish that once, only once, when I was twenty-two, I'd said to someone, as Itali said to me, this is important, even if it wasn't important, even if it wasn't true. Pernetta put her large, hard hand over his lightly. She said nothing. They drove on through the warm night to Porta Checa that lay a few scattered lights below them in the pass. At about the same time, Itale, standing at the foot of the stairs, was saying, This is rather important, Father. Very well. Come into the library. 
In the high-windowed room, starlight defined the shadows of leaves against the glass. Guide lit a lamp and sat down at the table in his carved, age-black chair, a relic of the furniture of the house built by his great-grandfather in 1682, and rebuilt by his father a century later. The table was piled with documents, some written in the fine cursive of law clerks dead two hundred years, the deeds and titles, contracts, and records of the Sorday estate. Most of them concerned rents and settlements with the tenant farmers, or deeds and rights to new properties acquired over the generations. That stack of Latin documents, Itale had thought when he saw Guide and Emmanuel at work on them, was the Middle Ages, obscure, intricate, muddled, arid. Beneath the aridity, pungent with life and overwhelming in its concreteness, its multifarious humanity, its absorption in the land, the land worked, owned, rented, leased, the land that made a peasant bound and a landowner free, the land source, root, subject, and end of life. Over against all that was a sheaf of printed papers to which Emmanuel would refer, scowling, the tax laws of 1825, concise, precise, impersonal, modern, and when applied to the Middle Ages in the form of those piled-up records, meaningless. Here was the family and the land. Here was the state and uniformity, and nothing existed to bridge the gulf between. No revolution, no representation, no reforms, nothing. At Itale's end of the long table, not yet swamped by documents, lay only a copy of Rousseau's social contract, which he had been rereading. He picked it up and turned it round absently in his hands as he spoke. Since Austria wants us to use Napoleonic tax methods, it would help if she'd let us carry out the reorganization the French began here, wouldn't it? It would. If they must have money, why don't they come to me for it? Do they think the peasants can raise cash? City men. Guide's face stood out heavily shadowed against the obscurity of the book-lined walls. It was a hard, strong face. But what impressed Itale in it as a quality he had never consciously seen in it before was its repose. That was not temperament, for Guide's temper was not reposeful. It was character, the gift of time, and not only the years of Guide's own life, but the time he had accepted and made his own, the seasons and the generations past. Itale could see in his father's face that he was tired tonight that he wished Itali would say what he had to say, and at the same time dreaded what he might say. All that was plain enough. But beneath it was the passive, unmoved repose, the will underlying all personal emotion, his inheritance. I want to try to explain some... a change in my thinking, Father. I'm aware that we disagree on certain matters. Times change. We needn't think alike on everything. Time spent discussing opinions is time wasted. Some ideas are more than opinions. To hold them is to serve them. That may be, but I have no wish to argue, Itale. Nor have I. The social contract came down on the table with a light thump, raising dust from the old papers and parchments. None at all. But I wish to act by my principles, as you do by yours. Your mind is your own. Your time is your own so long as you do your work here, and you do, you always have done. My work's not here. Guide raised his head at that. He said nothing. I have to go to Krasnoy. You have to do nothing of the sort. I'm trying to explain. I don't want explanations. If you won't listen, there's no use my trying to speak. Itale stood up. So did Guide. Stay here, he said. He walked down the room and back down it and back a second time. He sat down again in the carved chair. Itale remained standing by the table. Behind the house in the valley a sleepy cock crowed. Old Ava was singing in the kitchen, rooms away. You want to go to Krasnoy? Itale nodded. Do you expect to take money from the estate to support yourself there? Not if you are unwilling to let me have it. I am. Itale tried to repress his resentment and defiance, making so harsh an effort over himself that it weakened him physically. 
For a moment the reaction was so strong that he wanted to go to his father like a child and ask his pardon, anything to spare this anger. He sat down as before across the table from Guide, picked up the book as before, watched the lamplight flicker on its worn gold edging, and finally said, I will find work. My friends and I hope to write, perhaps to start some kind of journal. For what purpose? Itale did not lift his head. Freedom, he said. For whom? All of us. You think freedom's yours to hand out? What I have I can give. Words, Itale. These are words, too, this book. It brought the Bastille down. Those are words, those documents about our land. You've given your life to what they stand for. You're very eloquent. There was a long pause. Guide spoke with careful restraint. Let me tell you how I see this. You want to go down there, mix yourself up with other people's business. You say you see that as a matter of principle, of duty. What I see much more clearly is your duty here to your family and your property and the people on it. Who is to run this estate when I die? A Kresnoy journalist? That is unjust. It is not. It is the difference between duty and self-indulgence. You cannot speak to me as if I were a child. I am not a child. I am what you made me, and I know what duty is, and I respect your principles. Therefore I ask you to respect mine. Guide was speechless a moment before Itale's self-confidence. Respect. Respect for what? Your theories, your opinions, your second-hand words that you want to throw away all this for? You are of age. You needn't obey me. But you can't touch your inheritance until you're twenty-five, and thank God for that. I would never touch it against your will, but you're throwing it away. You're turning your back on it, everything I've worked for. It's not yours to throw away. That was a cry from the heart. The young man answered desperately. I'm not. I'll come back when you need me. I need you now. If you go, you go. I'll go, Itali answered on his feet. You can keep all that, but you can't take my loyalty to it, to this house, to you. A time will come when you'll see that. A time will come, will it? The social contract landed on the floor, pages down, a loose end paper skittering across the room like a scared bird. Not in my time, or in yours. Both were suffocated with self-righteous anger. Both knew there was no more to say. Nothing. Guide turned away at last. If you think better of this, he said in a stifled voice, no more needs to be said. If not, the sooner you go the better. I'll go on the diligence, Friday. Guide said nothing. Itale bowed and left the library. His silver watch said 8.20. They had gone into the library only a few minutes before. He felt that hours had passed. Itale... His mother came into the hall, looking puzzled. Is your father in the library, dear? Yes. He went quickly upstairs to his room and shut the door. The room was full of the blue of late evening, reflected upward from the lake beneath the windows. A warm, unreal atmosphere in which objects seemed to hang suspended like the dim plant seen underwater just offshore. The serenity of light, vague, weightless, picked up and opened out the anguish that bore him down. He felt he could draw breath again, but never in his life had he felt so lonely and so deathly tired. 5. It was the 5th of August, a day hot with the dull intensity that ends in storm. Since dawn the fields had baked in sunlight, the lake lay glassy. The sun was warped and reddish in the sky, pale with heat. Crickets sang in the moan and the yellow fields, in the orchards, under the oaks, Shadows now touched the lake from the western peaks, and there was a softer color low in the sky, a vague blue-violet, but still no wind rose, and Malafrena lay like a bowl of heat and light. Piera Valtorskar was coming downstairs, an action that to her in this huge, timeless afternoon of August seemed to last a long while, an interval full of intangible thoughts and manifold sensations. The house built of limestone and marble, was cool. One knew it was a hot day only by the dryness of the air, the cricket chant, 
the molten glare of a sunstreak finding its way through a shuttered window. Piero was wearing the women's dress of her province, a full dark red skirt, black vest, linen blouse embroidered at the neck. The sleeves of the blouse were stitched at the shoulder into twelve pleats. It had been made in Val Malafrena. A blouse made in Val Altesma would have gathered sleeves, and certain motifs and stitches of the embroidery would be different, a flower design instead of a pattern of birds and branches. All these things were as they should be, as they had always been. So Piera preferred this dress to any other. As she descended the stairs she was smoothing out the skirt, aware of the garnet color, feeling the cool grainy texture of the homespun cloth. Her right hand was on the marble stair railing, soap slick and cold. Step by step she descended, feeling herself descend, feeling the heavy skirt sway, feeling the railing under her hand, thinking of a great deal, though she could not have said what. On the fourth step from the bottom she began to hum the song, Red are the berries on the autumn bough. On the last step she stopped humming and ran her finger down the backbone of the cupid on the newel post. He was a crude, squat, provincial cupid carved of grey Montana marble. He looked anxious and dyspeptic. Piera poked his belly to see if he would belch. Then all at once she wheeled round and darted up the stairs in a fifth the time it had taken her to come down them. The upstairs hall was dark and smelled of dusty velvet. She listened at her father's door. Silence. Count Orlant was still asleep. On hot days he generally slept away the afternoon on his old leather couch, though he never meant to. Piero went back down the stairs smartly, trip, 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 swung round the newel post using Cupid as a fulcrum, and went off to her great aunt's room. Auntie, so she was always called, and the servants called her Countess Aunt, was very old. She had been very old during all Piero's life. She had birthdays like other people, but she could not possibly remember them, as Piero remembered all her birthdays since the eleventh one. And what difference could a ninety-fifth birthday make? Whether she was ninety-three or ninety-four or ninety-five, Auntie sat in her straight-backed chair wearing a black dress and grey shawl, and sometimes dozed and sometimes did not. Her face was netted with countless dry lines radiating from her mouth and the corners of her eyes. Her features, nose, cheekbones, cheek hollows, were as if obliterated by that network of tiny lines. Most of her teeth were gone, her lips sunken. Her eyes were like her grandniece's eyes, grey, translucent. Auntie was not dozing this afternoon. She looked at Piera with clear grey eyes across the gulf of eighty years. Auntie, did you ever dream you could fly? No, my dear. Auntie usually answered no. This afternoon, when I was lying down, I dreamed I could float. All it takes is knowing you can. You just push off from the wall, so, with one finger, holding your breath, and then take long steps, you see? And to change direction, you just push off the wall again. I'm sure I was doing it. I came clear downstairs without touching. Shall I hold wool for you? Auntie's hands had got too stiff years ago for knitting or embroidery, but she liked to hold needles and wool, or a panel and silk, and doze with them. And she particularly liked to wind the hanks of wool and silk into balls. Piera also enjoyed this. She could hold hanks for Auntie for an hour, watching the red or blue or green yarn slip off her parallel hands and gleam in Auntie's stiff, deliberate fingers, winding it round and round and round. Not now, my dear. Is it time for your tea? Auntie said nothing. It was not time for her tea. She dozed, and her grandniece slipped away. She looked into the kitchen, an enormous low room darkened by the oaks outside. The house of Valtorsa, built in 1710, was screened from the lake by trees and faced the valley and the foothills. Old Itale Sorde's notion of building his house right on the water had been one of his foreign fancies. No one was in the kitchen now but Maria the cook, gutting a hen. Piera came and looked. What's that, Maria? The crop, Contesina. All full of seeds. Yes. What's that? An egg, Contesina. Didn't you ever see an egg? Not inside a hen. Look, there's more of them. 
It's that old fool Marty. I told him the brown hen with white specks, and he brought the Chiasofonte hen instead. Had her head off already, the old fool. She's old, but she was a fine layer. Look there, the bitty eggs, like beads on a necklace. The stout woman and the girl peered into the blood-scented innards, Maria roused to momentary interest by Pierre's interest. But how do they get there? Why, the he-bird! Maria shrugged. Yes, I know, the he-bird, Pierre murmured. She sighed, wrinkling her nose at that dry smell of blood. Are you going to bake this afternoon, Maria? Thursday afternoon? Oh, I knew you weren't. I just asked... Where's Stasio? In the fields. Everybody's in the fields all day. They might as well have died and gone to heaven. I wish winter would come. Pierre spun round to make her skirt balloon out, investigated a huge iron soup kettle hanging in a corner of the hearth, then wandered out. Her domain was desolate. All the farm people were getting the late hay in. Maria had nothing to say. Auntie was asleep, the Count was asleep, the governess was off on her holiday. It was too dull to stay indoors and too hot to go outdoors, and she could not go to see Laura because Itali was leaving tomorrow, leaving all at once for the city, forever. She wandered to the front room with its drawn blinds, marble fireplace with more marble cupids, its long, shiny, empty floor and sparse, stiff furniture. The floor looked cool. She knew it was cool, and was tempted to lie down on it flat on her stomach, as she used to do on hot afternoons. But she was too old in her garnet skirt and linen blouse to go crawling on the floor. She curled up on the window seat and peered out between the shutter and the frame at the empty, shady side-yard. The whole trouble was that there was nobody to talk to, nobody to understand what she did not understand, nothing to do with the life that filled her, nothing to do. Piera sat still, her feet tucked under her, her hand holding aside the corner of the linen blind, so that she could see the same dull bit of the yard and the foothills building up towards Sinvia Mountain. And she was sad. Sad. Sad with the dull, deep, immense sadness of August, of a hot, eternal afternoon of August. The Sorde house was also silent, but under the summer trance, there was some coming and going, now and then the sound of voices. Itale's bedroom was hot. He had opened the window to get air, indifferent to the bar of fiery sunshine that lay across the floor. He was in shirt-sleeves, and his hair, wet with sweat, stuck up in tangles above his forehead. He was sorting through papers, putting most of them back in a tin box, leaving out a few to take with him. Soon done with the task, he shoved the box back under the table and stood up. The first breath of wind broke the day's great stillness. A cat's paw streaked the lake near shore, taking long to disappear, and the topmost paper of the little pile on the desk stirred. He put his hand on it mechanically, then looked down. Not this time a dream, O oh Liberty. It was a poem on the revolution of Naples he had written last winter. His friends in Amictia had thought it very fine. He began to stuff the papers into the valise open on the bed. Metastasio's words to his mistress, sung in the streets of Naples by a people briefly free, went on in his head. I am not dreaming this time. Non sogno questa volta. Non sogno libertà. Over and over, like the cricket chant, till he stopped listening. The breath of wind had passed. The bar of sunlight lay across the bare floor, intolerably bright. A knock. Laura came in at his word. Here's the linens. Mother's finishing a shirt for you to wear tomorrow. All right, thanks. Can I help? All done except for these. He began stuffing the clean shirts into the valise, needing something to occupy him in Laura's presence. Each felt oppressed, unnatural, and aware of the others feeling so. Let me. You're folding them all wrong. Oh, well. He let Laura pack the shirts. Piera said she had a book of yours. The Eston Scar. Get it from her when she's done with it. You ought to read it. Don't post it to me. It's a contraband edition. He stood looking out the window again. It's going to be a real storm tonight. I hope so. 
Laura straightened up and watched with him the slow, faint massing of clouds in the southwest behind the hunter. Ten to one, Count Orland hasn't got his hay in from Arley's field. Every year I can remember he's raced a storm for that hay. I hope it's a huge storm. Why? There was no one but Itale who could ask her why and smile because he knew the answer. There was no other man to whom she could talk as an equal, whom she could trust absolutely. There were beloved parents, relatives, friends, but one brother only. I wish I could go too. He went on looking at her and finally asked, Why? In a different tone, a voice full not of unconscious, but conscious regretful love. Why are you going? I'm obliged to, Laura. I'm obliged not to. Neither was able to put that fact in question. Among women, all of whom he desired, all of whom baffled and frightened him, among them all there was one sister only. Will you go to Ivalde, Laura? Until he went to college, he and she had gone every year at dawn of the spring equinox across the lake to the gulf of Ivalde, where a river broke from caverns in a high cascade to the lake. On the shore there was a high rock, curiously marked, called the Hermit's Rock. Count Orlan described the markings to druids. Others, dubious of druids, said it marked the place where St. Italus, the missionary, had preached to the heathen tribes of Val Malafrena. The spirit it roused in the brother and sister was heathen enough. To them in adolescence the true year began with that silent course before dawn across the lake, and arrival on that shore, a solitary celebration of rock and mist and light above the waters. Yes, I will. In Falcone? She nodded. And you'll write? Of course. But will you, real letters... You wrote such stupid letters before you came home. I couldn't explain about being under house arrest. Everything got so complicated. Laura was at last getting the whole story of Müller, von Haller, and Gentz when her mother came in. She and Itale had been laughing. They felt ashamed of laughing on the day before Itale left, knowing that their mother had wept for his going. Laura escaped, and Eleonora showed him the shirt she had ironed herself. To wear tomorrow, she said. She was used to the inadequacies of life, to the shirt iron because the words cannot be said or will do no good. He was not. Mother, you do understand. He stopped. I think so, dear. I only wish you were happier about it yourself. She looked into his valise. Will you wear your blue coat? How can I be happy if father... You mustn't hold anger against him, dear. I don't. Only if he... Itale stammered slightly when he was keyed up. If he'd try to understand that I'm trying to do right. Eleonora was silent. Then she said, mild and tenacious, You mustn't hold anger against him, Itale. Believe me, I try not to, he said with his passionate candor and seriousness so that she turned to him, smiling. But if we could only talk to each other, if I could explain to him... I don't know if people can ever really explain, she said. Not in words, anyway. She saw he did not believe her. That was all right. She, too, had once believed that people could be entirely honest with one another. She did not consider herself better for having lost that faith. If she were to be entirely honest with her son right now, she would beg him to stay home, not to go, for if he went he would never come home again. So she repeated, Will you wear your blue coat? It'll be cold on the coach in the morning. He nodded unhappily. I want to put up a lunch for you. Ava saved some roast beef, she said. And at that, the reality of the roast beef, the coach wheels turning, the dust of the road that led away from home, the silence of the dining room where she and Guide and Laura would sit down tomorrow without him, all this threatened her all over again, and she left him hastily so that she could struggle with it alone. He went on down to the boathouse, having time to reset Falcone's tiller, a job he had promised himself to do before he left. The long light was intense on the road and the green hollow lawn above the boathouse. Behind the hunter now clouds banked heavy. There was a greenish cast to the air over the lake. 
When the steering was mended, he set to waxing the seats and rail of the boat, wanting to be busy. It was hot and dim in the boathouse, smelling of wax, soaked wood, water weeds. The raw pine roof trembled with webbed, moving reflections of the sunlit water. Men were coming back from haying. He heard their voices on the road above. One went by after the others, singing a song that rose and fell on a few notes in the minor. Red are the berries on the autumn bough. Sleep, my love, and sleep thee well. The gray dove sings in the forest now. Sleep till thou wilt waken. He finished his job, went up the grassy slope, and threw a line of poplars to the road. The men from haying in the north field had all gone by, done in good time, for Guide was seldom caught racing a storm for his hay. No one was on the road but old Brown and David Angele returning from the vineyards, and with them Marta, Astolfe's wife. The men wore somber, shapeless work clothes. Only on feast days would there be any color about their dress, and the vivid white of the heavy embroidered shirt. Brown strode along, long-legged, unhurried, self-contained, like an old animal, taciturn. His strength was that of old age, economical, a wisdom of movement. David Angele, a young man, looked entirely insignificant beside him. On his left, Marta, in garnet-red skirt and embroidered blouse, took two steps to his one. She had been a beauty ten years ago, when she was twenty. The smile that creased her cheeks and showed her bad teeth was still radiant, as she said to her landlord's son, "'And you're off again, Domital!' "'Tomorrow, Marta.' They all knew, of course, that Dom Guide and Domital had quarreled. David Angele glanced slyly at Itale. Brown was silent. Only Marta knew how to continue the dangerous subject with tact. "'And it's the king's city you're going to this time.' So David Angel says. So Dom Guide told young Cass, David Angele put in hastily, exculpating himself. What a grand place it must be, Marta went on, evidently without the least desire to see it. People thick as flies on sugar, they say. But you're not to call it the King's City now, Marta, said the young vintner, again with a sly glance. You know there's no king in these days. There's the foreign duchess, lady. You needn't teach me, lad. But I like the sound of the old name. It's how my mother always called it. Ain't I right, uncle? Aye, said old Brown, striding along. Itale asked Marta about her three little daughters, which made her laugh. She laughed about them, since, as she explained, they couldn't yet give her cause to cry. With Brown, he discussed the state of the grapes and the new planting of Oria vines. He had been Brown's student and disciple in the vineyards all his life. But they were already at the Dower House Road, and Marta said, You must turn off here. Then I wish you a safe journey and Godspeed, Domital. Worn and solid, gap toothed, she gave him her radiant smile. Itale shook hands with David Angele with a warmth that rose from bad conscience at disliking him, and turned last to Brown. When I come back, Brown, I, you will. Their eyes met. It seemed to Itale, because he so much desired it to be so, that the old man understood all he meant, knew more than he himself knew, and found no need to say it. So they parted, and he went to the house for supper. They ate early, because they must be up early. They did not linger over the meal. When Ava came in from the kitchen to change the blue-ringed plates, her slippers creaking, they looked up at her with relief but her old face was as gloomy as any of theirs. Guide went out to the stables after supper. The women sat with their sewing in the front room. Itale stood at the windows that looked over the terrace to the lake. The light was strange, the water nearly black, but above the Valde the long forested ridge unearthly bright against a somber sky. A strong wind blew from the southwest now, breaking the water into netted streaks. Air and lake darkened fast, with the night and storm coming on together. Itale turned round and looked at his mother and sister. So they would sit together here, their faces bent to their work when he was gone, those who kept the house. His mother glanced up at him, as she always did from sewing, with a grave, peaceable look, then said, It's going to be very pretty, I think. See? Shaking out the goods she was working on, a drift of white stuff. 
It's her first real evening dress. Aye, he said, staring at it. I'll go see the Valtor scars, I think. The Count should be in by now. It's going to storm any minute, isn't it? I won't stay. Any messages for them? He went up to his room three steps at a time. He had been twelve when he got tall enough to take the stairs three at a time, he recalled for a moment as he went, and looked over his bookcase hastily, and took out a small book bound in whitish leather, well worn, a translation of Dante's Vita Nova, which he had bought in Solary. He sat down with it at his desk, and there in the dusk wrote on the fly-leaf a few words, his name, the date, then slipped it in his pocket and went out. No one was about. The sound of his steps on the path was the only sound. Crickets were silent, birds had left the air. The wind was down and the sky dark except for a green streak over San Givan, the last of daylight. As he brought his boat out and set off westward skirting the shore, it was so quiet that he heard across the breadth of the lake the remote music of the waterfall at Evalde. Then a mutter of thunder. Then the first huge whisper of rain on the slopes across the lake. The sail went slack. The twilight seemed all at once to give place to black night. The noise grew and grew. He felt rain on his hands, on his face. And then the storm was on him, dark and stiff as all the trees of the forest. A roar of rain, a wall of wind, lightning, thunder echoing redoubled off the water. The boom swept right across as Falcone jibbed like mad and ran in towards shore. It took all his strength to hold the wet sail on which the wind pushed with demented violence. He could not bring the boat back against the wind, and now she bucked and heeled till the sail touched the water. In a half lull he got the sail down and got out the oars. His clothes clung to him like silk, his hands were so cold with rain and so stiff from fighting the sail that he could hardly feel their grip on the oars. He rowed into the storm, getting through it if he could not harness it. Defeated, immensely happy. On the marble steps of El Torsa he took off his hat, poured the water off the brim, got his breath for a minute, and knocked. The Valtorskar's old servant opened the door and stared in wonder. "'Are you drooned, Domital?' he said at last. "'Come in, come in!' Count Orlant was shouting from the front room in his unexpectedly strong voice. "'Hoy, who's there? That you, Rodane? What the devil sent you out in this storm?' He came into the hall. Itale would not come in, saying he was too wet and had to get back home, so Count Orlant wished him good luck and good-bye there beside the coat-racks, earnestly shaking his wet hand while Itale clutched the Vita Nova in the other. He had turned to take his leave when Piera appeared. "'You're going, Itale?' she said. Her voice was bright and startled. The old servant drew back, and she came to the doorway where Itale stood with the rain and wind behind him. I wanted to give you this. He held out the book. I wanted to give you something. She took the book, did not look at it, but at him. Did you come in Falcone? I nearly turned her over. He smiled, self-deriding, exulting. The wind blew in past him, making Piera hug her arms to her sides. I must say good-bye, Piera. Will you never come back? I'll come back. She put out her hand. He took it. Their eyes met. She smiled. Goodbye, Itale. Goodbye. She did not move to close the door, but stood within the doorway, looking at the rain and flashing darkness where he had gone, till old Jivan bumbled up and shut the door. Look there. That rain. Not stopped yet. Crazy to take a boat out in such a storm. Piera went down the hall, looked in the living room. Her father and auntie were ensconced there, with yarn skein and astronomical chart. She slipped upstairs to her own room. Curtains hid the darkness. The candlelight was golden and serene. But she heard the sound of the rain, the sound of Itale's voice. He had been wet with rain, wet through, his hand strong and cold. Had he actually come? She shivered. The little book in her hand was cold and slightly damp. She looked down at it and read the title, The New Life. 
She turned a few pages and saw prose, full of there as muches and wherefores and verse, of love so sweetly speaking that all my will is his. The book opened of itself to the fly-leaf, and she held it closer to the candle to read what was written there. Here begins the new life. Piera Valtorskar, from Itale Sorde, August 5, 1825. She sat looking at the words, written clear and black, the capital S blurred from hasty blotting or the rain. She smiled at last as she had smiled at him, and bent her head, and kissed his name. Part 2. Exiles 1. The mountains lay far behind, lost long since beyond the hills and rivers and plains of the southwest, the clouds and weathers of the journey. The southwestern post was climbing into the hills of the Molson province, uncultivated, dull gold under a blue-gray August sky. Five more miles to Fontanus for I, said the handsome swag-bellied driver. The Grand Duchess comes to Fontanus for I every August to take the waters. How far is it from the city? asked the young provincial gentleman on the box. Sixteen miles, eight with the brakes on. We won't see Westgate much before nightfall. The horses, heavy gleaming greys, pulled effortlessly. A slow mile went by. Itale pulled his hat over his eyes against the warm morning sun and dozed. The horses pulled, the high coach creaked and swayed. Village of Colpera, the coachman pointed out. Colpera was a humble cluster of huts off the road on a high slope. Looks like sheep country, Itale said. I wouldn't know, the coachman replied with disdain. I am from the city. I know nothing and care nothing about sheep, said his manner. And Itale, rebuked, stretched out his legs and gazed at the great lonely hills where, sure enough, far away and like a cloud shadow on the tawny slope, he made out a flock of sheep. Fontanusferai was a cool, rich town high up in the hills. The inside passengers took lunch in the park restaurant. Itale, who had refused to borrow money from his uncle or to take more than twenty kruner from the estate cash box, and that as a loan, bought a roll at a bakery and ate it by himself in the park in the shade of the elms, watching the fancy rigs go by on Gulhelm Street. He finished his roll and was hungry. Through summery leaf-dappled light he saw a low foreign chaise coming, drawn by matched bays. In the chaise was a parasol, and in the warm white shadow of the parasol a face was turned towards him, a long, bored face with heavy lips and tired eyes, so familiar that Itali expected her to speak to him. Which cousin was she? The chaise passed. The parasol became a white blot down the dappled street. Itale brushed crumbs off his waistcoat. Well, so that's the Grand Duchess, he said to himself, and felt unspeakably mournful and insignificant. The coach set off with new horses and several new passengers. One of these Itale had seen on Gulhelm Street, bowing to the Grand Duchess's chaise, a young man elegantly dressed with a pale, handsome, heavy face. He sat up outside with Itale and made conversation chattering along so amiably that Itale soon forgot to act sophisticated and began to enjoy himself. A little cautious, for he was not used to talking with strangers, he listened more than he spoke. This pleased his companion, who was not much in demand as a talker among his own associates. In their mutual appreciation they introduced themselves. Sorde, Paludiscar. As soon as the names were spoken each must perform a little silent guesswork and assessment, Itale, wondering which rank of the nobility his new friend might belong to, Paludiscar, deciding that although the young provincial was a commoner and had a hat which looked as though he had gone fishing with it, he was quite safely a gentleman. And it was very pleasant to talk to someone who knew so little about everything and never set him straight. He talked on, and Itale listened, and each was grateful to the other. The coach came at five o'clock to the summit of the hills, and Itale saw for the first time the broad sweep of the river valley to the distant eastern range, the shining curve of the Molson through it, and, hazy and glimmering in the low warm light, the city on the river's bend. They were some miles from its outskirts. The pale hills behind them were silent, 
a pale sky arched overhead. The city slept in its wide valley in the afternoon sunlight, indistinct, beautiful, unutterably calm. Polutiscar smiled with proprietary pleasure, glancing at Itale's intent gazing face. Is that the Ruch? He pointed to a building that bulked large in bluish shadow over the vague surrounding streets in the southwest quarter of the city. Right. There's the Sinalia at the edge of that green bit. That must be the park, the Elena Prada. The Sinalia Palace was the residence of the reigning Grand Ducal family. The kings of Orsinia had lived in the Ruch Palace. That must be the cathedral, Itale said and his voice caught, for the spires rising above the golden mass and shadow of the city were its center, both in place and in the passage of centuries. Right, said Paludiscar. And south of it there, that's river quarter. Nobody lives there. North of it, the old quarter, that's where everybody lives. Is that my house? Can't be sure. There's the opera house. See the dome by the river? But the coach, descending, entered a pass between high hills, and the view was lost. It reappeared at intervals, each time nearer and more complex as the road wound down. Their last sight of the city as a whole was when the valley was vague, the eastern hills had dimmed away, and lights were beginning to glimmer through the gray haze. They changed horses at Colonna Mana, supped there, and in the warm dusk set off again, rolling easily on a smooth road the glow of the city under its haze brightening always in the sky before them. Exalted by the darkness and warmth, the wind and movement of the ride, the great presence of the city awaiting them, the two young men talked from their souls. The important thing, Itale said, is a force inside you that belongs to you alone. It's yourself, actually, all that makes you a self, a man. Once you've found it, that force or will or need, whatever it is, then all you have to do is obey it. Stay on the road it takes you. But if you can't find the road, you can if you want to. How many people really want to? To find their destiny? To be themselves? Surely everyone does. Takes work, said Paludiscar. Well, it does, and it's true most people don't even seem to try. They do what comes next, or what's expected of them, and get lost in a meaningless tangle of, of desires, frivolities, contingencies, said Itale, with an abolishing wave of his hand. Why don't they simply do what's necessary? Easier not to. But how stupid it is! Even if you sit in a chair for ten years, still the years go by, so why not get up and walk, make it a journey? I used to envy adults when I was a boy. I thought they were all going somewhere. But now I see most of them not really going anywhere, never getting home, lost in eating and sleeping and talking and visiting and meaningless work. Not the poor, of course. I mean, people free to do as they please. They do nothing. They lose their souls out of sheer carelessness. Civilizations wasted on humanity, said Paludiscar. If I had it to hand out, I'd give it to the bees. Industrious little bastards. I don't know if it's wasted on us, but most of us seem to waste it. I used to think I'd like to add my bit. But I don't know. I suppose I really haven't anything to add. You do, Itale said. And Paludiscar replied with equal simplicity. I know, but it's getting away from me. I'm not religious, you know, and all that, but I'm going to be twenty-five in November. I'd like to... You know, to think that I was going to do something worth doing before the end. That's it. That's it, Itale said. Come and stay the night. I want to talk more about this, Paludiscar said earnestly, and Itale agreed. The coach was among the suburbs of Krasnoy, and in ten minutes more it came to a halt inside the west gate. Stiff, bemused, disjointed, its passengers descended into the coachyard of Tiponti Street under the dark, looming inn buildings. Glare and shadow, neighing of horses, and clatter of iron-shod hoofs on stone, clatter of voices, moths swarming at smoking lamps, smells of leather, horse-dung, sweat, hot stone, the streets of stone. In the cab both regretted the invitation which had seemed so natural on the coach. They said no more about destiny and civilization. Each looked out his window. 
The cab stopped before a handsome house on a wide, quiet street. As Paludaskar took him up the steps, Itale heard a great bell striking the hour across the dark roofs and streets, a deep, quiet voice in the restless air of the city night. He was handed over to a servant, taken up imposing stairs and down a long passage to a room with a curtained bed, marble fireplace, Turkish carpet, red draped windows, and a very large painting of a racehorse with a fat round body and tiny head and feet. As the one servant departed, a second one arrived, carrying his valise. Thank you, Itale said, relieved to see the familiar object and anchor in a sea of strangeness. His effort to get the valise away from the man was foiled with skill, courtesy, and ease. After that defeat there was no hope of making the man go away. He was French and middle-aged. As he unpacked Itale's valise, he intimated that his name was Robert, that he was Monsieur Le Baron's man, that Itale must change into his other coat, that a clean shirt was also desirable, that a gentleman did not put on his own shirt, that Robert was perfectly aware that Itale was young, poor, provincial, and possessed no articles of toilet besides a hairbrush, but did not hold it against him. Some of this in words, some by other means. If monsieur will permit, he said, circling behind Itale at the looking-glass, and in five hypnotic motions transformed Itale's cravat into a model of austere symmetry. It is the best knot, but not every man can wear it so. It requires a long face, he said, admiring his handiwork so honestly that Itale warmed to him at last and let him help him into his coat without a struggle. Then he had to go downstairs alone. The long, bright drawing-room was a confusion of people, light-coated men, light-gowned women. He did not see Paludaskar anywhere. A tall, fair woman glanced at him, frowning. He dared not move farther forward, he dared not go back. There he stood, like a rock. Near him a group broke out laughing at the end of a story, and he smiled, too, until he found he was smiling. Another tall, fair woman in violet was approaching him, or was it the same one? She was coming straight at him. He looked away. He began to edge backwards towards the hall. Mr. Sorde, he bowed. I am Louisa Paludiscar, he bowed. She looked at him coolly, made up her mind, and took him to present him to her mother. The young baroness was robust and handsome like her brother. The old baroness, sitting near a gold-encrusted arar piano with two other ladies, looked pinched, sick, and sour. She said, How do you do, to Itale, and had no more to say to him. Baroness Luisa took him on to a side room, where, to his relief, he found Paludaskar, devouring cold chicken and champagne, and was invited to do the same. While he ate, he managed to shake off the paralysis of total self-consciousness and make some observations of other people. He found that nobody was wearing trousers at all like his, and that conversation with these people was very difficult, as they all spoke quickly and bounced on from one subject to the next like rabbits. "'Will you be long in Krasnoy, Mr. Sorde? asked a man to whom he had just been introduced and whose name he had instantly mislaid, and before he had decided how to answer, the other bounced on. "'Absolutely dead just now. Few remaining fragments of civilization are gathered in this room, and the opera is not opening until November.' "'I hope to see the opera,' said Itale, and was able to take a deep breath, having produced a comprehensible, if not dazzling, sentence. "'Your musical?' asked the other man. Was his name Hachaskar? Haraskar? It's not precisely Paris, as you can imagine. An old Montini lost his high A last season, but it does very well. Paulina, Itale brought out, the name of a local diva whom he had heard praised at Solary. Aha, said Heliskar. That was it, Heliskar. But Baron, Count, Prince? Have you heard Paulina? Is it she that brings you here? Itale stared at him. What was he to say? No, I'm here to subvert the government? He said flatly, No. Heliskar smiled. He was pale, like Paludaskar, but his figure was slight and his face fine-drawn. I'm sorry, I'm always boring people with music, he said, and though Itale appreciated that good-natured courtesy, he was unable to respond to it. Luisa, said Heliskar, a little later in the other room, who is your brother's new friend? I have no idea, George. Literary, Heliskar proposed. 
Luisa Paludasgar shrugged. Epic poems. Or no, I know. He is planning to found a clandestine journal full of long quotations from Schiller. No idea at all. He was simply found on the coach like someone else's hat. He might be a spy for Gents. He might steal the silver. I had no idea Enrique was so rash. But then no spy could possibly tie his cravat that well, at least not a spy for Austria. It must be Schiller after all. Introduce him to Amade, then. Is he here? How is he? Wretched, of course. I don't know why he doesn't leave that woman. There's your friend. Take him over to Amade. Mr. Sorde. Itale startled, looked around. His eyes met Luisa Paludascar's, and for an instant she too looked startled, taken off guard. Then her face closed and looked bored, even rancorous. Count Heliscar has been speculating that your propensities are literary, she said, drawling. And Heliscar broke in. I leave speculation to bankers, Baronina. I never go further than entertaining fancies. I have a bad habit of deciding what people ought to do without consulting them. I had rather decided you ought to publish. Defend yourself, Mr. Sorde. Is it an accusation? Itale asked naively. Heliscar laughed. We'll have to consult Estenscar. Is literature a crime, a fault, or merely a misfortune? The Estenscar? Amade Estenscar? You stand self-accused, Mr. Sorde, Heliscar said. He's here tonight. May I introduce you? He has no... that is, there's no... I don't... Come along, the Count said and Itale meekly came, obeying Heliscar's flawless self-assurance. But halfway across the room his protest became audible again. Count, he said earnestly, I can't intrude on Mr. Estenscar. You set him higher than the rest of us, Heliscar said, with his ironic smile. Quite right. Come on. He led on. He'll be in here, no doubt, the mausoleum. Library, I mean. Refurbished catacomb. There he is. And bringing Itale to a wiry, red-haired, white-faced man who stood reading in a corner of the bookcases, he introduced them. A fellow exile, Amade, he said. Estenscar had gained his fame with the publication of The Torrents of Caratia when he was nineteen. His odes and a novel had confirmed his reputation. At the age of twenty-four he was the best-known writer in his country, passionately reviled and praised a storm-bringer, one of those after whose passing things are not the same. Very glad, he said in a dry voice. There was a pause. You're from my part of the country? From the Montana. I see. What are you reading, Amade? Herde? They ist mir. Literature is a vast slew of German poets. Estenskar shrugged. Itale observed the shrug with awe, and burned to go re-read Herder as soon as possible. But as Hellesgar continued to make conversation and Estenskar to cut it short, the talk did not grow more interesting. Of course there was no reason why a genius should converse with a flippant worldling like Count Hellesgar. The genius's manners were disagreeable, but that was because he was so far above his company. All these people did was gossip. Itale had listened now to a dozen conversations of gossip. As a matter of fact, Estenscar was now embarked on some gossip and apparently enjoying it. A year in Paris couldn't civilize that ass. He was ending his tale with an artificial, unpleasant tenor laugh. Nothing could. And Hellescar laughed and said, Civilization is wasted on humanity. And Itale struggled desperately to swallow a yawn. He looked up from the struggle to find Estenskar's cold gaze on him. Did you know about Adenskar's new literary magazine, Amade, to which only noblemen may contribute? Estenskar laughed his high, loud, Ha, ha, ha! What next? The name, that's the beauty of it. He discussed it with me at length. Pegasus, Aurora, all nine muses. Couldn't use them. Greek, low connotations. Tried French. Revue du au monde. Uh -huh. I say, that'll put that new Revue des deux mondes in its place. No, no, can't have that. Low connotations again. 
Then the divine afflatus swept into him before my very eyes, and he said, I shall call it the Journal of Nobility and Genius. My God, what a fool the man is. He'll do it, too, you know. You must contribute. I do it in order to lose him his censor's permit. It's not that bad, surely, Hellescar said, with a very slight change of tone. Estenscar shrugged and was silent. You still haven't got the printing permit for the new book, Hellescar said, and again Estenscar shrugged. He stuck Herder back on the bookshelf, looked at his fingernails, turned away, then swung back and burst out shrilly, I've been trying to get it for six weeks now. They want changes. One of the poems cannot to be published at all. Why? Why not? It's about listening to music. What in the name of God is political about that? Because it's music, does it have to be the Marseillaise? Oh, no, Mr. Estenscar, you don't understand. I don't understand my own work, but they do. It's not the subject of the poem that's undesirable, but the meter. The meter. The meter by the bowels of Christ. What is radical about iambic tetrameter? Do you know? Can you imagine what he said? It's a national meter, common in songs, popular, dangerous. And then my ode, the bad one, you know, to the youth of my country, you know, it was, by God, it's in iambic tetrameter, and I can't go around reminding people of it. So this poem can't be published. The book can't have the censor's permit so long as it's there. And my friend at the bureau, my good friend, Censor Goine, who can't spell recommend, Goine takes the trouble to recommend improvements. All I have to do is add an extra foot to each line, just a word or two. He showed me how to do it. Really very simple, he said. They banned what I've written. Now they rewrite what I write. The eyes in the white face were round, yellowish, glaring. Itale thought of the half-grown hawks he had tamed, their rage and resistance that only exhaustion could control. And even in defeat they would cry out in their shrill, terrible voices, defeated, not tamed. You have endured six years of this, Hellescar said. How do you have the courage to go through it all again? I don't. When I get this book in press, I'm done going home. I can't fight to try to get it distributed. It won't be. I will stay just long enough to be sure the text isn't changed, to keep Goine's improvements out of it. I don't know why I bother even with that. What difference will it make? A great deal, Mr. Estenscar, Itale said, stammering. Because the book will be printed by the clandestine press. I've never seen your books but in the clandestine editions. Victory without profit, the poet said dryly. No man, not even a genius, can win this kind of battle unsupported. If there were a group, a real group with a publication, a journal ready to come up against the Bureau of Censorship every day, for every word, a steady united pressure, and if the estates are convened, censorship will be an issue. I see it's true you've only been here two hours, Estenscar said, turning back to the bookcase. He scanned it as if seeking a title while he spoke. A group... Literary men are afraid of jail as a rule. As for getting help from the politicians, I suppose you're joking. Itale was paralyzed. Hellescar said as easily as ever, Why so, Amade? If the estates meet, there will be some new men in town. You're in an optimistic fit tonight. I am an optimistic man. I merely keep it to myself so that I won't get laughed at. As to the youth of my country got laughed at, for example and rightly. It's the stupidest thing I ever wrote. I suppose Mr. Sorde disagrees. Perhaps it was invitation, but Itale took it as reproof, understanding only that his enthusiasm had been gall to Estenscar. How can I argue with you? he said almost inaudibly. Hellescar frowned. You wrote it. Let us read it, Amade. Allow us our little privileges. They don't encroach on yours. I believe we need a change of muse. Louisa's in a vile mood tonight. She always plays well in a vile mood. Shall we go to Mansa Mozart? Though enmeshed in self-castigation, Itale was vaguely aware that Hellescar had come to his defense, and in an equally vague persuasion of obligation followed the two back into the salon, though what he wanted was to get away from Estenscar before he antagonized his hero any further. Luisa Paludascar agreed to play. 
he stood with the group around the piano. It was past midnight. He was worn out. The radiant music passed him by as so much noise. Heliskar and Baron Paludaskar talked beside him. He did not listen, and he would not open his mouth again, not if he were damned for it. Why am I here, he thought. What am I doing here? Why did I leave home? When she had played what was asked of her, Louisa Paludaskar sat on at the piano, listening to the others talk. Every now and then she glanced up at the tall, stiff, speechless young man. There he stood with his chin stuck into his collar, the epitome of boorish provincial male complacency. She would have liked to kick him. Who is that fellow, Baronina? Enrique found it on the coach. I don't plan to keep it around long. Estenscar smiled disagreeably. He hardly seemed to partake of the ton, he said. He was on the attack again. Luisa, who loved battles, rose to the challenge and performed a rapid outflanking maneuver. She smiled straight at him and said, You're not really going off east, are you, Amade? I haven't decided. What is there to decide? Is there anything in the Polana besides the east wind and sheep? Will the sheep listen to you? I know we're sheep to you, but we are attentive sheep, adoring sheep, your own woolly flock, sheep's clothing. That's you, the wolf, the Polana wolf. Don't run away, Amade. Not now. I'm not running away. I'm going home. Home! She played a light, derisive arpeggio. We have a home, too, you know, up in the Sovena. I know all about rain and wind and mud and sheep and the neighbors' visits. They tell you hunting stories, how they shot the wolf, how they bagged three poets in the marsh last winter. I'll come back for your wedding. Oh, indeed! My wedding with whom? George, of course. How silly you are. I can't marry an old shoe. If the shoe fits, always twist the knife a little before you remove it. No, I think I shall marry a total stranger, someone found on a coach. Why? Because there would be a few weeks before he knew how to hurt me very much, before he learned where the nerves are. Unless he was a poet, of course. But you mustn't leave Krisnoi, Amade. What shall I do without you, without my daily anti-opium? I wish I had fallen in love with you, Louisa. Yes. But you didn't. She looked up into the man's unhappy face and smiled again. When he got to bed at two-thirty, Itale could not sleep. The Mozart sonata to which he had not listened rang note for note in his head. The red-curtained bed swayed like a coach at the trot. His ears were full of voices and his eyes of faces. He lay and twitched and turned. The deep, soft bell told the quarters and the hours. Three o'clock, four o'clock, over the dark roofs, the dark streets, the endless houses where two hundred thousand people slept, and he among them awake, a prisoner. Two. Robert, the manservant, waked him late in the morning. He could not elude assistance in getting dressed. He found his way through the huge cold house to the breakfast room. The baron was already there, and the sister soon arrived. The two young men were stiff and shy with each other. Itale remarked that it was hot, Enrique that it was damned foggy, and they got no further. Luisa, dressed very plainly in brown, seemed to have set aside her arrogant manner with her evening dress. She was pleasant and gracious, without affectations, and within a few minutes Itale found himself almost at ease talking with her. But she was beautiful, more beautiful than he had realized last night, more beautiful than any woman he had ever spoken to. And he realized as they talked that she was younger than he, twenty at most, which by adding youth to her opulence of beauty, wealth, and wit cowed him, making him feel a hopeless clod, and the brother glowered across the table. It was a relief when the meal was done at last. Freynan had been living in the city for a month and had sent Itale his address. Itale asked Enrique where the street was. What? Never heard of it, the baron growled. Going off, are you? Can't stay? No. Well, glad, very glad. When Itale had escaped, the baron followed his sister up to the music room. 
You hear that, Lulu? He's going to some damned street in the river, somebody's tears street. Now what the devil, coming all the way from the damned mountains? I thought he was a gentleman yesterday. He is. Don't be stupid, Harry. But nobody lives in a place like that. Students? Students, exactly. She knew what was upsetting her brother. Through boredom and a dim sense of shame at his uselessness, Enrique was trying to secure a minor diplomatic post. He had decided that his new acquaintance was politically suspect, therefore not to be cultivated. But he was ashamed of his own motives and preferred to act the snob. All this was clear to Luisa. Her boredom was far more drastic than her brother's, her ambitions clearer, and she set herself up as a conscious enemy of hypocrisy in all its forms. "'You are afraid you've entertained Robespierre unawares,' she said. "'Poor Harry. "'But you can see that I can't afford to associate with these patriot fellows. "'I made a mistake. I own up to it. "'So all I'm asking is that you don't take him up, "'make a pet of him out of curiosity the way you do.' "'Make a pet of him? "'A bit like making a pet of a cart horse. "'Yes, well, exactly. He's just not quite our sort. "'It seemed all right on the coach, but he doesn't belong here.' So that's all right. We just won't see him again. But, of course, I asked him to dinner tonight. Enrique breathed heavily, defeated once again. He hasn't anywhere to stay, and if he stays here, of course we have to feed him. But I'm sure it will do no harm. No one is coming except for Skynaskar. Oh, my God, Enrique cried. You can't, you can't have him here with Skynaskar, Luisa. But he knew as he spoke that she would do just as she pleased, just as she always did, and that whether he fretted or shouted it would make no difference at all. Meanwhile, Itale had set off at random into the warm morning. Sunlight, breaking through the mist of the river valley, gilded the house fronts, the roofs, the double spire of the cathedral of St. Theodora only a few streets away. He made for the cathedral. It was not as easy to get to as it looked. Though rarely losing sight of the spires, he involved himself in the crisscross of broad, similar avenues of the old quarter, took a wrong turning into Sordon Street, and wandered down it between palaces of the seventeenth and sixteenth centuries, rearing their elegant, arrogant facades one against the other. From that sunless, silent grandeur he emerged into the glare and bustle of the great market. Men bent double-hauling carts yelled at him to make way. Heavy-shouldered horses pulled their wagons across his path. Women selling leeks and cabbages shouted at him to buy leeks and cabbages. Young women lugging sacks of gleaming vegetables jostled him with the sacks. Old women lunged past him to make a bargain. Fishmongers waved eels in his face, and to avoid the eels he backed into beef carcasses hung round the butcher's stalls amidst shrilling swarms of flies. Porta Chaca's weekly market would not have filled a corner of it, it went on for blocks, sprawling, displaying, hauling, carrying, bargaining, arguing, selling, buying, stinking, shining, shouting in the young heat of the August sun. And over it all, against the large, quiet morning sky, rose the dun spires of the cathedral. He made it safe to Cathedral Square at last. A few old people sat on benches on the west side under plane trees thick with summer dust. He stopped in the middle of the square, letting desultory cabs and purposeful walkers pass round him, and gawped at the Cathedral of Krasnoy, the heavy, complex towers, the leap of the spires, the triple portal of carven saints and kings, the great bulk, buoyant and serene as a ship under sail. He stood and looked, and the old men on the benches looked at him. They had seen the cathedral before. At last he went forward and entered the church under the north portal, under St. Rock, auxiliary patron of the city of Krasnoy, smiling in the ogive shadow his stiff, kind, four-hundred-year-old smile. As soon as he came inside the cathedral he felt himself at home. It was home. His family, his people, had lived there for eight or nine centuries. Like the churches of the Montana, the cathedral was dark, bare, its high barrel vaults leaving a great deal of room for God. It was as simple and purposeful as a fort. Low mass was in progress. Lost in the airy darkness of the nave, a few people, faceless, separate, similar, knelt on the bare patterned pavement. Itale joined them. The priest droned on like the old priest of St. Anthony of Malafrena. 
Credo in unum Deum. And the little old women in black shawls whispered, Omnipotentem. And like an unheeding angel or thunder among mountains, the organ whispered on above them, rehearsing the high mass to be sung on St. Rock's Day. Itale did not stay long. Reassured yet restless, he went back out into the sun's heat and brightness as the great bell struck ten, vibrating in the stone and in the blood. There was the city, the traffic, the faces of strangers, the streets of stone. He put on his hat and set off, striding into River Quarter, without the least idea where he was going. Few cities in 1825 had much of a sewer system. This oldest quarter of Krasnoy had none at all, beyond paved or unpaved trenches in the middle of the narrow streets that wound down towards the river. The stench of River Quarter was a mighty presence in itself, more impressive even than the steep darkness of the streets between houses toppling their upper stories across the way, as if in conspiracy against the sky, and the noise of voices and the constant press and passage of people around the tenements. Out of these choked alleys shot up the fragile towers of old churches. From the noisy crowding at a ragged street market one came suddenly into a silent square, to a covered fountain brimming with cool water and typhoid fever, and looked up to see on one hand the cathedral spires, on the other the pointed windows of the university on its hill, another world. In such a square Itale stopped. He was frightened. He was lost had lost himself in the streets, the crowding houses, the dank archways leading to brawling courtyards, the voices, the smells, the swarms of children, women, men, all nameless, so that he was nameless, knowing none of them, lost. He stood there holding on to his left wrist with his right hand, combating panic. He sat down on the stone seat by the wellhead and gazed persistently at the pavement at his feet. On one stone was a smear and curl of human excrement. He gazed at it, at the stones beneath and around it, square bluish cobbles grained and glazed with dirt, at the thread of water gleaming in the jointure between two of them. That is all here, he thought. I am here. I cannot be lost. At last he looked up, looking slowly round him, and discovered that he shared the bench with another man. This one wore broken shoes without stockings, and some kind of coat or cape, shapeless and colorless, wrapped carefully around him, despite the warmth. He was old, the skull showing in his face. Out of webbed sockets his eyes stared straight at Itale, a terrible stare, until Itale realized he was blind. "'Hello, Grandad,' he said huskily. The old man munched and stared. Abruptly he spoke. Itale did not understand the wheezing voice and the strong dialect. A long way from home, he seemed to have said. That's true. Do you know of a street called Magdalene's Tears, Grandad? The old man went on staring, muttering, eh, 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 eh. He stood up, gathering the decrepit coat around him. Come on, he said. Is it nearby? Melena Strada, how can I tell you? Come on. Wheezing and muttering, but moving fairly quickly, he set off down an alley, and Itali followed. Children screamed, playing or fighting in a courtyard as they passed. The old man cursed at them and waved his hand, muttering, Had a stick, had a stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evidently he had some sight, for he picked his way without hesitation and kept closer to Itale's side than was agreeable to Itale, for he stank. He talked as they went, and Itale understood about half of it. He had been a tailor till his eyes went bad, and they turned him out of the shop. There was a brother-in-law who had done him wrong, a story about costs rising and shop rents. His voice cracked and grated. He chopped his rigid hands in the air and screamed, "'Dirty Jews! Dirty Jews!' He felt or saw Itale shearing off from him and hurried his gait pathetically. Almost there, young sir, almost there. That big church, that saint Stefan, the basilisk. Now this way, young sir. They were at the base of the hill of the university. Streets shot up the hill in crazy angles and flights of steps. 
Thought I was blind, eh? Thought I was blind, eh? The hobbling guide stopped. This is it. Malena Strada, this is it. The street name Freynan had sent was the Street of the Tears of St. Magdalene. Itale could see no sign or token along the narrow way or at the corner, but he was ready to get free of the old man. He gave him a quarter crooner, putting it into the rigid hand. Trying to get it into some pocket or hiding place in his ragged coat, the old man dropped it, and Itale picked it up for him, for he stood blind and groping, unable to bend down to the pavement, and his hand was too arthritic to close on the little coin. Number nine, opposite the pawn shop, Freynan had written. There were no numbers, but there were two pawn shops. He tried across the way from the first one. A fat woman met him in the dark hall, which had a rich, sharp, feral stink of its own. She sent him up the stairs, which were alive with thin, scabby cats, all of them more or less white. He knocked on the door of the first landing, and Freynan opened it. The square, hard face, the familiar voice saying his name, were a tremendous relief and pleasure. They embraced like brothers. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, Jivan. Come on in! Freynan began to repress his own pleasure. Don't let those damn cats in. Why didn't you write you were coming? I came on the same coach the letter would have come on, last night. Where are you staying? Fellow I met on the coach, Paludascar. In Roche Street? The Rutabaga Baron? I don't know. Well, you're certainly coming in at the top. I don't really know who they are. On the coach. They're in Brelevi's scandal sheet every issue. Brelevi's what? Freynan's manner irritated Itali a little. Like everybody here, he seemed to know everything. He's working for a weekly society tattler, the Krasnoy Skirility, he calls it. Money, mistress. Our Tomas is doing well. Freynan's tone was unpleasant. Big place you have here, Itale said. The room was low but long, and the almost complete lack of furniture made it seem vast. Four of these rooms. Dirt cheap even for the river. It's too big. I'm getting out into the month. Try this chair. The back falls off that one. What are you doing? Odd jobs for a Catholic monthly and reading proof for Rochoy, the publishers. I get by. What are your plans? Find work first. Work? What for? It seemed to Itale, perhaps unfairly, that Freynan's question was disingenuous. What does one generally work for? Depends who one is. I have twenty-two crooner. That's who I am. He felt himself to be disingenuous. But it was not easy to talk about not having money. He got up and wandered around the shabby room, looking out the windows. Your windows could use a wash. No help from home, eh? No. Freynan, the son of a wealthy Solari merchant, was as used to having cash in his pocket as Itale was, but he was also used to talking about money, both the having and the wanting, and that gave him now the advantage he always sought over his friend and seldom gained. Your father doesn't approve of your coming here, I take it. Right. Is he an Austrianizer? Not in the least. Family quarrel, eh? It's immaterial, Jeevan. Twenty-two crooner, eh? About two weeks' worth. Well, what can you do? What anybody else can do. How do I know? Itale said. His anger satisfied Freynan, who dropped his cool superiority of manner and said with a grin, All right, all right. Are you looking for a place to live, or have you settled down with a rutabaga queen? I don't know. My bag's there. I don't want to stay there. Why not? It's free. I can't. Itale waved his hands. Footman at breakfast. How's the young baroness at breakfast? I don't know. Very polite. It's... He waved his hands again. I shouldn't be there. Freynan grinned again. Well, come here if you like. It's not Roche Street or an estate on Lake Malafrena, but then it only costs fifteen kroon or a quarter. We can share for a bit. That is very good of you, Jeevan, Itale said with warmth and gratitude. His deafness to Freynan's jibes exasperated the latter and at the same time disarmed him. He had never succeeded in establishing between Itale and himself the social barrier that his jealousy asserted to be there. 
At the same time, a barrier did exist between them, despite all Freynan's efforts to break through it. That of Itale's careless, impervious personal reserve. Itale would not allow him to humiliate either of them. His flashes of anger were not followed by any grudge or punishment. He offered a simple, steady friendship. Freynan wanted more of him, though he did not know what more. What good was friendship? He wanted to get at this defenseless man, understand him, change him, and could not do it. It was perhaps for Itale's sake, to keep in touch with Itale, that Freynan had conceived the plan of coming to Krisnoi. We'll settle it with the Catwoman. She was downstairs, wasn't she? Mrs. Rosa, she calls herself. Listen, Itale, I've been here two months and nothing has happened. Nothing is happening. There is no radical movement here. Itale sat down at the table, which with three decrepit chairs constituted the furniture of the room. There has to be, he said. I haven't found it. But the Café Illyrica, old men and fifth-rate poets, and Austrian agents. There are secret societies. There were. They're dead, years dead. The Friends of the Constitution, yes, that's still going. A lot of retired army men in the East, in the Casena and Savena. But not here. Nothing here. Unless you count Amictia. Well, then it's up to us. A publication. What we talked about in Solary. What's the good? A literary monthly. Who won our bet concerning the power of the written word? Who got put under house arrest? Look here. 1789 didn't rise unpremeditated from the breast of the people. It was the writers. All right. But we haven't got any Rousseaus here. How do we know? Besides, we do have Rousseau and Desmoulins and all the French and English and American writing of the last hundred years to draw on. Why else is the government so afraid of print? Listen, I found something Ghent said recently. I've taken it for my guide, my inspiration. He said, as a preventive measure against the abuses of the press, absolutely nothing should be printed for years. With this maxim as a rule, we should soon get back to God and the truth. God and the truth, Freynan repeated softly in awed disgust, and they were both silent a minute. The opinion of the chief of the Austrian Imperial Police was undeniably impressive. All right, said Freynan, assume a journal is the thing. How do we finance it, first, and who'll dare to print it, second? That's what we're here to find out. All right, let's go meet some people. Itale got back to the Paludiscar house at six, having spent the afternoon with Freynan at the Café Illyrica, which, despite Freynan's strictures, was still, and would be for twenty-five years more, a meeting place for radicals of all degrees. There they had met their friend Veyascar from Solary, a dark young man named Carantai who wrote stories, a pair of Greek refugees, a ranting alcoholic old poet who talked of his mistress Liberty, a group of students. The talk had been of Greece. As Itale walked up Roche Street, he was telling himself that if nothing could be done here, he would go to Greece, as Lord Byron had gone, to the plains of Marathon, where they still laid down their lives for freedom. He was drunk with Greece and strong coffee and strong ideas, and was not sobered even by entering the large, rich, cold house. He strode up the marble staircase as if he owned the place and hearing music in the room at the top of the stairs, stopped a moment to listen, as if the music was for him. "'Mr. Sorday,' said Louisa Paludiscar at the piano, another splendid piece of gold and rosewood like the one downstairs, the evening sunlight striking gold through the long windows across her hair, music rippling under her long hands. "'Baronina,' he said with untroubled resolution, "'I must be leaving.' May I thank you for your kindness, and hope that I will have the privilege of making some return for it. The formal, provincial turns of speech came ready to his tongue, and he never wondered what conceivable return of hospitality he could make from a cat-haunted tenement in the river quarter. He still spoke with his feet planted on the shores of Malafrena. But you're not leaving, Mr. Sorday. We thought you would make our house yours for a few days at least. She seemed dismayed disappointed. He grew embarrassed. It's very good of you, Baronina. An old friend of mine is here. He wants to put me up. 
But you can't always desert new friends for old ones, and Enrique will be very disappointed. It's very good of you. We know people, quantities of people. I had thought we really might be of some use to you. It's very... He had said it was very good of her twice already. You are very kind, Baronina, but I... He did not know what to say. His resolution dissolved like wet sugar. At least you will dine with us tonight? I do claim that much. Of course, with great pleasure. Damn the woman. As he went down the hall, the house resounded to the abrupt, brilliant harmonies played very deftly of a Mozart presto. After her talk of quantities of people, he had expected another large party, and was surprised when he went down to dinner in his black coat well brushed by Robert, to find a parti carré, himself, Luisa, and Enrique Paludiscar, and a Count Roskiniscar. Baroness Paludiscar, a lady-in-waiting to the Grand Duchess, was dining at the palace. This dinner was presumably in Luisa's style, intimate, elegant. The four French doors of the dining-room stood open to the August night. Stars hung thick in the black sky. An intermittent wind moved in the shrubbery of the walled garden. The murmur of a fountain, the stir of leaves, the smell of damp earth and roses, the unease and subtle darkness of a summer night all entered and mixed strangely with the conversation at the candle-lit table. Louisa, at the head of the table, was so beautiful, so much more beautiful even than she had appeared last night or in the morning, that Itali was afraid of her. He vaguely felt himself to be in the presence of a dangerous force of nature, a forest fire or a maelstrom. It occurred to him that when poets called a woman a goddess, sometimes they meant exactly what they said. Enrique wore an anxious, surly look and said very little, and Luisa and Raskinaskar ignored him. Raskina was one of the great holdings in Val Altesma, thirty miles southwest from Malafrena. Itale knew the name well. He knew nothing about the landholder, and it was evident that if Raskinaskar had ever visited his estate, it had been as no more than a visitor. He was entirely urbane. He was a well-kept man of forty or so, with long, liver-colored lips, a high forehead, and fine, dark eyes. So, he said, leaning back a little when they had come to the sweet wines, it's quite certain the estates will meet. A lot of talk, Enrique growled. Not at all, unless you're referring to the meetings themselves, in which case I agree with you. But they will be convened. Cornelius will announce it next month, I fancy, and the great event will come off in the autumn of twenty-seven. <laughs> Do you know what the Emperor said about these diets and assemblies? It rather puts them into perspective. He said, I have my estates, and if they go too far, I snap my fingers at them and send them home. Just as Louis the Sixteenth did, said Itale to his plate. Oh, come, the Count said, genial. The estates general of France are one thing. Our little assembly is quite another. Its convention is merely an act of courtesy on the Emperor's part. If the assembly is rude to him, will he snap his fingers? Louisa asked. Yes, of course. That is, Cornelius will do it for him. He needn't be bothered himself. Has Cornelius that authority? asked Itale. As the prime minister of the head of the state, the Grand Duchess, I should think so. Possibly she'd have to do it herself. Under the charter of 1412, the assembly is subject only to the king. There's nothing that subjects them to the orders of a duchess or her minister. Nothing but the Austrian army, Raskinaskar said mildly. If the Grand Duchess called in the Austrian army to close the National Assembly, that would constitute invasion. We are an ally and protectorate of the Empire. We are not an Austrian province. Paper truths, Mr. Sorde. The Austrian army is here now, controlling our provincial militias. No assembly is going to try to lead us into a revolt, or a war, if you prefer, against the most powerful state in Europe. The idea is laughable. That depends on one's sense of humor, Louisa observed. True, very true, said Raskinaskar, who never contradicted directly, but went at it round about. When the balance of peace is so delicate, when there is the possibility of intervention by one of the great states, Russia perhaps, it's not so much laughable as terrifying. The war year's all over again. One can only respect Metternich for having in these past ten years made such a chance remote, a fantasy, rather than an imminent threat. 
An incredible man, Metternich. He bears the weight of Europe on his shoulders. If he put it down, it might turn out to be able to walk by itself, Itale said, with a slight tremor in his voice, but clearly. Enrique, whose sense of humor was simple, gave a snort of laughter, and then shut his eyes and turned red. To walk straight into war, I fear, Raskineskar said. I'd prefer to walk into war than to be carried into slavery. My dear young man, said Raskineskar, who had no desire to quarrel at Luisa Paludiskar's table, I don't think you know much about war, and I fear slavery has become a fashionable word and so lost its significance. I suppose a black African on a plantation in the Carolinas is a slave, poor brute, but his situation has very little in common with yours or mine. I don't know, Itale said innocently. The American slave can't vote, has no representative in the government, and must get his owner's permission to learn to read or write or publish or speak in public, doesn't he? If he does any of that without permission, he can be locked up for life without trial. I'm not sure how far our situations differ in those respects. Of course, we are allowed to wear frock coats. There was only the slightest pause before Count Raskineskar added, and to read Jean-Jacques Rousseau, if we can find a clandestine edition. The Count laughed indulgently, the laugh of a statesman addressing enthusiastic youth. Enrique shut his eyes again. Luisa laughed very softly, watching Itale. Then she turned to Raskineskar and said with all the manner of a hostess easing over a difficult moment, Which reminds me, Count, I am relying upon you for the Paris journals. You must not let me down. To which Raskineskar replied courteously as ever with a somewhat pinched smile. He cared nothing at all for Ritale's opinions, but he cared a good deal for Luisa's opinion, and he knew now that he had lost a battle that he had not thought worth fighting. The next day he told a fellow bureaucrat in the Ministry of Finance that the convocation of the estates was not entirely an empty gesture, since certain fashionable salons were openly cultivating patriotic sentiments. Silly fads, the colleague said. But Raskineskar, pinching his long lips together significantly, murmured, National Pride, as if it were the name of a horse he thought of backing. Itale left the Paluda Skars as early as he could decently do so, and found his way past the cathedral, around the hill of the university, behind the Basilica of St. Stephen, through the frightening crowds and more frightening emptinesses of the river quarter, to the narrow street where he was to live. He went to bed and lay there on the pallet they had fixed up, his eyes on a crack of light under the door. Freynan was up writing in the front room. The night was warm and filled with voices and inexplicable sounds, the swarming city atmosphere. There was no silence. Itale thought of the garden of the Paludiskar house, roses in the dark, the fountain, the golden light on Luisa's throat, and these images changed to yet more tormenting ones, vivid, unbearable, the roofs of Porta Checa, the neat mountain-shadowed yard of Emmanuel's house, the lake the window of his room above the lake. Never had he felt such anguish of homesickness, and among those glimpses of the lost beloved there were faces, all the faces he had seen in the streets, the sweating carriers, old women praying, the endless faces of the city, of the poor, and a red-nosed, gray-haired man crying, My Mistress Liberty! and the bony, swollen, bare legs of the old blind man who had guided him. 3. By the assistance of the dog, man was enabled, enabled, enabled to hunt such animals as were necessary to preserve his own existence, 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 and to destroy those which were no-shows and the greatest enemies of his race. Noxious. Very good, Vastin. Go on, please. Itale stood leaning his arms on the lectern, watching the three copies of Buffon pass from hand to hand, the fifteen serious faces. The youngest pupil was twelve. The eldest, Isabert, the pupil teacher, was sixteen. As each boy read, Isabert looked at him with fierce and pleading eyes. The bell of a nearby church struck noon. 
Little Paroy gabbled through his reading, and Itale dismissed them. As the others left, Isabert came up to him. Don't look so worried, Augustine. They're doing very well. It's fasting, sir. He won't apply himself. Itale watched the boy with patient affection, his long, thin throat in which the Adam's apple bobbed up and down as he spoke, his big red hands and clear eyes. Isabert never laughed and smiled only when he thought Itale wanted him to smile. Another teacher looked in. Hold on, Brunoy, I'm coming, Itale said, and soon joined them. Poor Isabert, what a conscience the boy has. Come on, I'm hungry. Oh, God, how I am coming to hate the noble Buffon, as translated by the noble Prudavan, as executed by aspiring youth. They left the gloomy halls of the derelict grain storehouse, now occupied by the Erinan school, where Itale had been employed as a teacher for six weeks. Someone at the Café Illyrica had mentioned the place. He had investigated and found himself hired to teach reading, composition, and history five mornings a week, before he had ever heard of the Lancaster system or Pestalozzi's works on education. Erinan, a philanthropical grain speculator, had founded the school. Fifty boys, sons of day laborers and artisans, were enrolled in it, some paying a low tuition, some none. It was the only lay school in the city where a poor man's son might learn to read and write. In hiring Itale, Erinan had given him a three-hour lecture on education, but that was the last anyone had seen of him. The rumor was that he had found a new hobby horse to ride. So far, by nagging Erinan's secretary, the three teachers had managed to draw their salary, but there was no money for books, chalk, coal, and so forth. Brunoy, who taught the younger boys, was philosophical. It's lasted over a year, he said. I never thought it would last so long. As they came out into the sweet air of the October noon, Brunoy coughed and laughed. You like Isabert, do you? Of course. He worships you. That's his age. You have to make a hero out of somebody at sixteen. If there's any purpose in this education business, it's enlarging their world enough so that they can find proper heroes, real ones instead of makeshift and tinsel. Why shouldn't you be his hero? Because my heroism consists first in my educated accent. He thinks it's educated. You think it's provincial. And second in the fact that I stand six feet tall. Discrimination, Itale said, waving his arm. Discrimination is the purpose of education. Brunoy smiled. They walked on a little way, and Itale broke out afresh. I admire your patience so much, Jane. I get cross with them. How do you stay patient? I have nothing but patience to fill the gap between my old ideals and my actual achievement. That gap. That gap between what we want to do and what we do. You call it patience. I call it waiting for God. It's in that gap, that gulf, that creation occurs. But I haven't the strength to wait. I leap in and try to play God and spoil everything. Eleven. Brunoy said to a short, dark, spectacled man walking briskly past them. Thirteen, Itale added. The man nodded, said seventeen, and went on past. When he was around the corner, Itale released a stifled snort and said, This life is crazy. The short man in spectacles was the third teacher in the Orinan school, a mathematician who believed that the secret of human destiny was written code-like in the sequence of the prime numbers. An atheist, he was offended by Brunois and Itale's inert Catholicism, and did his best to convert them to the mystery of the primes. The salutation they had just exchanged gave him a good deal of pleasure. You don't belong in it, Brunois said gently. He was a thin, brown-haired man in his early thirties with a look of ill health and a mild manner. At first, Itali had seen in him the signs of disillusion, enthusiasm soured, which he had learnt to expect from men of the generation before his, who had given themselves to hopeless efforts of reform or innovation in education, economics, or politics in the century's first two decades. Old liberals, old radicals still haunting the Illyrica, still breaking out with gusts of defeated passion, honest, ineffectual ghosts. Very soon he realized that Brunoy was not this sort at all. 
a watchmaker's son who had gone through the university on scholarship, unmarried, solitary, poor. Brunoy had not turned sour or cynical. He had merely accepted silence as his lot, silence until the end. Yet he had let Itale break that silence. Nor do you, Itale said as they went into the workman's tavern where they took their midday dinner. All I ever wanted was to teach. Itale brought their mugs of beer to the table. Listen, you said you'd written something once, a theory of education. Brunoy nodded. Can I see it? I burned it. Burned it? Itale said, shocked. Years ago. It was unpublishable. The censors would never have let it pass. And the ideas are mostly current now in other men's works. You shouldn't, you shouldn't burn your ideas. Could you rewrite it? No. The ideas are common now. And anyhow, why? There's nowhere to publish anything of that kind. Yes, there is. Will be. Brunoy cocked his head. I am asking you for a contribution to the first issue of Novesma Verba. Still, Brunoy said nothing. How do you like the name? The newest word. I like it very much. But whose word? Ours. Me, Brelevi, Freinen, you, the country, Europe, mankind. I'll tell you, the name is my idea. The others like it. It sounds right. But I'll tell you what it means to me. We have something to say, and we haven't said it yet. We stammer. We try to learn to speak like infants. We don't know how. We say a little of what we have to say sometimes in different languages, in a painting, in a prayer, in an act of knowledge. Every so often we learn a new bit of it, a new word. The newest word is the word freedom. Maybe it's no more than a new way of saying one of the old words. I don't think so. It's new. Still, we're a long way from being able to say the whole thing yet. But we must learn the new words, all of us. We must be able to speak them. They're no good if you don't say them aloud. Oh, Prometheus, Brunoy said very softly. All right, that's all my notions. The point is, it is now possible that we may actually publish this journal, and I'm asking you to contribute to the first number. Since the first number will very likely be the last, my request gains urgency. Brunoy raised his beer mug, gestured to Itale to do the same, and touched mugs in salute. To Novesma Verba, long life. They drained their mugs. So, said Itale, triumphant, setting down his mug. Brunoy shook his head. Why not, Ejane? The older man looked down, was silent for a minute. Their food was served. Itali began to eat, shoveling it in, though he continued to watch Brunoy in puzzlement and hope. Brunoy looked at his plate, did not eat, and said finally, Fear. I don't believe you. Not fear of the censor, fear of the police. If that was all I had to fear. He made some pretense of eating, set his fork down again. In order to do what you're doing, Itale, one must believe in it entirely, passionately. One must believe in the importance, the necessity of it. That belief is wealth, strength, health. I don't know that we're doing the right thing, Jane, or doing it the right way. I am doing all I know how to do, all I can find to do. It may all be useless, worse than useless. You know it is not. I hope it is not. And you, too. I do not hope. I do not have time for hope. I am a poorer man than you know, than you're able to know. You have no idea what poverty is, Itale. He spoke with open affection, tenderly, so that Itale, confused between what he had said and how he said it, did not know what to reply. I gave up all I had, he said at last, painfully. You gave up all you could. It's not your fault you're rich. What I care about, what I care about most in the world, it's no use talking about it here. I didn't know it myself until I gave it up. That's what's so stupid. I keep going ahead, working for the time to come. That's what I care about, you say. But what I know is that my home is behind me, that I've lost it. Let it go. Your home? My home, no metaphor. I mean the land, the place, the house I was born in, the dirt, the stupid dirt. 
I am tied to that land like an ox tied to a stake. If you don't know where your home is, how shall you be a pilgrim? You're a hypocrite, Itali. You wouldn't trade your homesickness for all the freedom in the world. But I am ashamed of it. Shame is the conscience of the rich. Oh, come on, Jane, write for us. Brunoy coughed, smiled, shook his head. You are not afraid. But his friend only smiled, luminous, elusive. When he left Brunoy, Itale set off to see Brelevai, going some blocks out of his way to walk through the Alina Prada. It was a sunny, hazy autumn day, the city gray and golden. Leaves drifted underfoot in the walks of the great park. Itale liked the chestnut alleys and long lawns of old Queen Helen's fields, but the new English edition with ruins, grotto, and so-called waterfall struck him as contemptible. He thought of the caverns of Ivalde over Malafrena, caves where sensation was drowned in the enormous ceaseless thunder of an imprisoned stream, plunging through darkness till it broke out torrential into sunlight and leaped to the lake a hundred feet below. What price plaster grottoes! He crossed the river on Old Bridge and headed out towards the boulevard Prussia. All this section of the Trasfuve had been built up in the last twenty years, long straight streets of row houses, row after row after row. Because they were all alike, there seemed no reason for any one of them to be there, and there also seemed no reason why they should ever cease. They might run on forever, house after house, row after row. But if one walked on far enough, they ceased, stopped being and with them the city ceased to exist, giving place to a field of burdock and mullen and shards. A dirt road going nowhere, perhaps a decaying shack or warehouse, and the hazy eastern hills. Walking those long dreary streets gave Itale the feeling of being caught in a stupid dream, and as befitted the dream, when he got where he was going, Brelevi was out. He left a note and started back. Crossing Old Bridge, he leaned a while on the parapet to watch the silky bluish water running quietly to the south, reflecting the lindens of the Molson Boulevard on the west bank. At the end of the parapet stood a stone figure of St. Christopher, his large, stiff hand with fingers all the same length raised in benediction over all pilgrims and traffic of the bridge. River quarters stank, shrieked, loomed, swarmed as ever, and in the doorway of nine Malena Strada, sat the landlady, Mrs. Rosa, her seamed dark face glowering over the cat, one or another of all her mangy cats that sat in her lap. But she smiled tightly at Itale. She liked having a gentleman in her first floor back, though he paid no more rent than the weaver's family in the first floor front. When Freynan moved out, she had divided the four rooms into two flats, which meant Itale had to go through his neighbor's rooms to reach his own, a small inconvenience for a ten kruna rent. The weaver, Kune, was at his loom when Itale came through. He was at his loom fourteen or fifteen hours a day. He worked on the putting-out system. The factory issued him thread he worked at home and returned the cloth to the factory for finishing and cutting, a system very popular among owners since the workmen competed in isolation instead of cooperating in union. The smell of dye, the rhythmic thump and rattle of the loom, were ground texture to all Itale's hours in his rooms. The loom filled half that bare room where he had first talked with Freynan. The family were thin, fair, white-faced people, cautious and wary in their ways, subdued. Itale could not get much response, even from the five-year-old, and almost none from Kune. They were, he thought, afraid of him, afraid of everyone except one another. He slipped past the great complex loom on which the white band of cloth grew, relentlessly slow, faultlessly even, like some inhuman process of the world, the movement of the shadow on a dial, the progress of a glacier. Kune nodded. The baby was crying thinly in the other room. Itale sat down at his table to write. But his conversation with Brunoy and his fruitless errand into the Trasfuve had left him depressed and he lay down on the cot in the closet that served him as a bedroom, intending to read Montesquieu and forget his troubles. Within ten minutes he had forgotten them and Montesquieu as well, the book on his chest, his hands on the book, fast asleep. He was waked by a knock, 
and staggered into the other room which was full of hot red sunset light, expecting Brillevi. He did not recognize the red-haired man in the doorway. Estenskar. We met at the Paludaskars in August. It was Estenskar, all right, the poet, the great poet. Itale stood staring, utterly floored. Sorry to disturb you, Estenskar said in his high, hard voice. Not at all. Not at all. Please sit down. Not that chair. The back falls off. Estenskar tested the back of Freynan's chair, found that it did indeed come off the seat, removed it, laid it aside, and sat down on the seat as on a stool. I came to make an apology, Mr. Sorday. An apo An apology? I had no right to be rude to you that night. Every right, Itale said, waving his hands. I'm sorry about it. It's absolutely unnecessary, Mr. S. Itale's throat dried up in the middle of the name. No, it was necessary. If I wanted to talk with you again... And Estenskar smiled. A brief, unjoyful, youthful smile. There are a lot of stupid people at the Paludaskars, and I have got into a habit of being rude to them since they expected of me. But to be rude to you was a mistake, and I knew it at the time. Are you really trying to found a review, a journal? Yes. Please, this chair's all right. I like this one. How far have you got? Enough money for a couple of issues and enough promised for several more. A printer who knows what he's in for. A letter from Stefan Oragon in Rakava. That could be more a liability than an asset. If the estates meet, it could be a real asset. What about the censor? My friend Brillevi thinks he's getting somewhere with the, the man you mentioned, Goine. Estenskar gave his short, artificial-sounding laugh. How many of you are there? Four of us from Solary, six or seven from Krasnoy now. Jeevan Karantai is one of them. Perhaps you know him. Yes, a splendid talent and a good man, virtuous. Jeevan Karantai is a virtuous man. You are lucky to have him. Is it to be a literary journal, then? At first. The Bureau seems more approachable if we keep to literature. Yes, Estenskar said harshly, but with real amusement. You can always get around them in the long run, because they don't really believe words can do anything. They don't really listen to Metternich. He knows better. If Metternich could have his heart's desire, every poet in the Empire would be locked up in the Spielberg prison for the rest of his life. I admire Metternich. He is an enemy, an equal. He has the wits and the enlightenment to fear the power of ideas, the power of the word. He's of the breed of eighty-nine, not one of these nouveau, these genses with their turncoat opportunism and illiterate mysticism, these worthy servants of the Habsburg, Bourbon, Romanov, Cretans, who wouldn't recognize an idea if it was pointing a gun at their empty heads. Thank God Metternich is off in Vienna, and all we have to fight here is nineteenth-century stupidity not eighteenth-century intelligence. All barriers fell under that onslaught. We're calling it Novesma Verba, Itale said. And they were off, interrupting each other, excited, ardent, gesticulating, pacing, while the red light flared and sank in the room, and the loom rattled next door, and the bells of St. Stephen's, the University Chapel, and the Cathedral struck six, and all the quarters, and then seven and the roofs and chimney-pots across the courtyard dimmed in brown autumnal dusk and grew dark and hard against the sky. Itale thought to light a candle at last. As he stood by the table, tinderbox in hand, making sure the wick had caught, he looked up, and in the smoky light his eyes and Estenskar's met. "'You see why I had to come,' the poet said. "'I am glad you did,' Itale said in his quiet voice. I recognized you that night. Estenskar continued to watch Itale with his peculiar yellowish, immobile gaze. I don't know if you know what I mean by that. One comes to certain places, certain persons to which one must come. To fail to recognize them, to turn aside from them, is to fail one's destiny. Do you know what I mean? I think so. But one's destiny isn't always good, you know. I think you haven't considered that yet. Are you Catholic? Yes, as I eat with a knife and fork and wear a hat instead of feathers. So was I. I took off the hat. 
Forms are unimportant, Itale said broadly. Not to a poet, but never mind. I like... I want to tell you about myself, Sorde. He spoke with intensity, turning away from the light of the candle. Then his voice hardened as he said, I suppose you know all about it from the Paluda scars. I've never been back there. You haven't. Louisa has spoken of you several times. I thought you went there often. But I'm surprised they said nothing that evening. Discretion's not their virtue. They love gossip. The more sordid, the better. The stupider, the better. Love affairs, they're called. The old word for it is adultery. If you know me, you'll know this. I'd rather tell you myself. Two years ago I performed an action known as falling in love. I became a lover. The object of my love is a married woman who is rather stupid, very greedy, very cruel, not particularly beautiful. As soon as I saw her, she slipped her hands under my skin and took hold of me on the raw flesh and nerve, and I've been her puppet ever since. I dance when she raises a finger. I am her possession. If she called for me now, I would crawl to her house on all fours. I have stood on the doorstep and begged the footman to let me in. I have gone to her husband and asked him in tears. Excuse me, Sorde, I'm, I'm going. Not fit. He had stood up, neat and abrupt in his well-cut coat and fine linen, his voice still clear, and he was blundering towards the door. Itale, with no consideration of his act, blocked his way. You can't go now he said fiercely. Estenskar felt for the backless chair, sat down, sat hunched up for a minute, crying. He got out his pocket handkerchief and wiped his eyes and nose. No good, he said in a soft, boyish voice. And then, shoving back his red hair and speaking in his usual tone, or very near it, What's your name? Itale. Amade. What? What sort of cheese is that? Portacheca. Did you bring it with you? It was about a yard across. My aunt sent it. God knows how she bribed the carrier. He brought it to the door here. Are you hungry? They were soon sitting at the table, the huge cheese, looking more prosperous in its blue coat than its owner did in his, sat between them, with a knife, a half loaf, and a jug of rather stale water. There was one plate. I don't do much entertaining, Itale observed. I like to keep to the old country ways, you know, nothing ostentatious, no plates, no forks, no manners. An aunt sent this, you said? What other family have you got up there? Aunt and uncle, sister, parents. Hardly counts as a family in the Montana. More than I have. One brother never leaves the estate. You are the heir, then. You left something to come here. It seemed the thing to do. The thing to do. Estenskar looked at Itale, at the cheese, at the candle flame. How easily you say that. And I can guess pretty well at how much you had to give to earn the right to say it. To do the thing one has to do. That's the way. The right road, of course. And I've lost it. But you're writing. I haven't written a word for months. Of course, that's my road, but when it leads to a wall or a hole in the ground, the end. You can't start a book with the end, can you? He spoke without excitement and went on munching his bread and cheese contentedly. This is first-rate cheese, he said. There was a knocking on the hall door, the sound of voices in the weaver's room, a rap on Itale's door, and in burst Brillevi. He now sported a brocade vest and silk hat, but looked just as he had looked in college, thin, buoyant, and ironic. Victory! Triumph! he proclaimed, and then noticed the stranger. Sorry. Am I in the way? No, of course not. Thomas Brelevi, Amade Estenskar. What's up? Do you want some cheese? Very honored indeed, Mr. Estenskar, said Brillevi, taken aback and so looking ironic to the point of being diabolical. I... this is a real privilege. No, I, I don't want any cheese, for God's sake. This is no time for cheese. What is it for? Go on with your cheese, please. Don't let me disturb you. Will this chair hold together if I sit down carefully? I've got the trick one, Estenskar said, still munching. Did you talk with Goine? 
I did, late this afternoon, and I don't want to hear any more talk about old Brillavi. He's a jolly sort, but he never does anything. I know the kind of talk that goes on among these damn seditious radical groups, especially since you haven't got the manners to wait until my back's turned. Do you want to hear what I said to Goyne, and then what Goyne said to me, and then what I said to Goyne with infinite tact and diplomacy, und so weiter, und so weiter, or shall I... Come on, Tomas. Entire sanction and license for the publication of... No, by God, you got it! Itale shouted, jumping up, and Brillavi, only less excited, because he was so pleased with himself, said, Let me tell you about it, will you? They continued to talk more or less simultaneously for some while. Amade Estensgar watched them. He was envious of their old friendship, envious of their jubilation, and dubious of it. What did it amount to, this little crack in the immense wall of indifference, this glimmer in the dead, endless night of intellect? And yet this was what he had come here for, driven, exactly this, hope. And it caught at him as he watched them, so that exultation began to grow in him, and brought him, too, to his feet. Come on, he said. Where do you fellows meet, the Illyrica? This calls for the open air. Exactly. Come on, Itale. All right, I'm coming. Just let me get my hat. They ran down the black stairs, out of the house, into the streets, full of early night and a gusty, dry, autumnal wind blowing from the east. Come on, Itale urged, when the others slowed their pace in the pressure of talk, and he went ahead, full of that same exultation and certainty, letting the dark wind of October blow by him, and singing out loud the band hymn, Beyond this darkness is the light, O liberty, of thine eternal day, so that passing whores and locked-out children turned and laughed or looked at him. 4. The same dry east wind was singing next day in the pines of the mountainsides and lashing up whitecaps on Malafrena, bright and wild in the morning sun. Piera Valtorskar came wandering down the lane that led through the valley from the pass. To her right lay the stubble fields and orchards of Valtorsa, to her left the orchards and stubble fields of the Sorde estate. All things, trees, apples on the trees, clods, mountains, were distinct in the acute autumn light. Piera's hair blew loose and her red skirt flashed in gusts of wind. In her left hand she carried an apple with a bite out of it. In her right, a bunch of wild grass and flowers. Down from a side path along the Sorde apple orchard came a mounted horse with a neat, quick gait. Recognizing the fat mare and thin rider, Piera waved her wildflowers in the sunshine. Guide raised his hand in salute and came riding up to her. I thought, whose lass is that in her Sunday dress? But it's no one but thee in common clothes. Sometimes he called her by her title, Sometimes he still used thou to her as to a child. She called him you and Mr. Sorde, but that was the extent of her formality with him. At times she pondered the questions, did she love Mr. Sorde as much as she loved her father? Ought she to? And why did she? She found no answers, no scales for weighing love, no reasons. She loved him because he loved her, that she knew better perhaps than he did. Not being responsible for her, he was free to show his feelings to her, as he was not free with his own daughter and son. He could play with Piera long years after he had ceased to tease and praise and play with Laura. He looked down at her now, smiling, seeing the flash of her red skirt, her blown hair, her clear, bright eyes, seeing her a frail, wild bit of the bright day of wind. His look was praise. I stole one of your apples, see? Should I put it back? Eat it, eat it, said he. It's got a worm right through it. That's the serpent that tempted the Eve. She looked up at him and laughed. May I feed it to Bruna? Are you in a hurry, Mr. Sorde? She stood at the mare's head, offering the apple. Bruna tossed her head and mouthed her bit, and Guide had to slap the bit out so she could eat Piera's apple. He did not mind humoring the girl and the willful old mare. The beauty of the morning put him in a patient mood, a mood that fit the season. He liked the autumn above all seasons, because it brought him that quietness. "'You're going into Porticheca, Mr. Sorde?' Piera asked in a ladylike tone. 
She was always changing that way from country eve to proper miss, in a breath, for no reason. Aye. Guide shifted in the saddle and added the explanation, The post comes in today. Oh, of course. Piera scrubbed her horse-slobbered hand with Bruna's long mane, quite as a child would do, while remarking, with womanly tact, And it's a lovely morning for a ride. And for escaping lessons, eh? He teased her a little heavily. Oh, Miss Elizabeth never gets up till eight. I have hours and hours before lessons. She was twining the one bright flower of her October nosegay, a last cornflower, into the mare's mane. When Guide had left her and was riding on towards town, his gaze fell on the blue nodding flower, and he felt a curious tenderness, an ache as he looked at it. They passed on the road, she at sixteen and he at fifty-six, and she left him a blue cornflower twined in his horse's mane. It was queer, he thought, how you met and passed souls thus, and a few of them left sweetness with you. You passed one another and parted, it might as well be forever, and yet there remained the touch of sweetness and of pain. Piera wandered on towards Valtorsa, murmuring a French irregular verb. As she murmured, her mind also wandered. The post came in today. It would stop, high, dusty, swaying at the Golden Lion. On it, in one of the two or three mail sacks containing the fortnight's correspondence to all the people of the lakes, would be a letter to the Sordes, a square envelope of heavy, cheap paper addressed in black ink, the corners bent and dirty from the long trip. These letters were thoroughly familiar to Piera. Eleonora and Laura read them alone, read them together, read them with Piera, read them to each other, quoted them, misquoted them, especially Eleonora, interpreted them, dreamed about them, and twice a month awaited them with a longing that made the post-coaches delay a disaster, its arrival a festivity. Till now one or both of the women had driven in to meet the post, and Piera wondered why this time Guide had gone. They were expecting something unusual, perhaps. That afternoon, when her lessons were over for the day, she told Miss Elizabeth that she was going to visit with Laura, and came straight along the lakeside path to the Sordes, without any wanderings off to the side. By now she was certain that Itale was coming home. In fact, he had probably been on the coach. Laura was seeing out the old tutor, Mr. Chiovai of Porto Ceca, who came once a week to read French with her, as he came to Valtorsa to improve Piera's spoken French. He had improved the French of every young lady in Val Malafrena for forty years, and the French spoken there did not resemble that spoken anywhere else on earth, being to a considerable extent Mr. Chiovai's own invention. He had taught Eleonora, now he taught her daughter, whom he liked because she was quiet, but he dreaded Piera. He quailed as she came up the path beside the Mandevilla. Que je vas, she cried aloud at them. Que tu vas, qu'il va. She had mastered the past subjunctive of venir. Mais viens donc, said Laura. Viens-tu, said Pierre. Mr. Chiovai escaped while the girls went into the house. There was a letter, wasn't there? Mama has it, I'll get it. They're going to have a journal. Itale is going to be an editor. But he's not. Piera did not finish. He was not coming home, of course. Whatever had possessed her to think he was. Laura prized the letter away from her mother, promising not to damage it or lose it, and went with Piera down to their favorite haunt on sunny afternoons, the lawn by the boathouse, now a sweep of golden green in the mellow light. Sitting there, Piera read and Laura re-read Itale's letter. It was, as always, rather stiff, bookish, impersonal. He talked about plans for the journal. He attempted to describe Amade Estenskar, but on this subject his language became stuffier than ever, probably because he was self-conscious or over-conscious of his readers as he wrote. There was a good deal of detail about the complexities of dealing with the bureaucrats at the censor's office, which was hard to follow. But the dry, stiff letter was permeated, penetrated, shot through and through with joy. A great work to do the friendship of great spirits, the road open before him, the world to be renewed and the strength to renew it. What became of that baron and baroness that he wrote about at first? Piera inquired, gazing out over the dark, bright lake. 
He hasn't mentioned them again, said Laura, folding the letter carefully. Oh, dear. I wish... what? That I weren't envious of him. Piera brooded over this for a while. It did not make much sense to her at first. Laura was Laura and was here. Itale was Itale and was there. Piera's mind did not easily mix the absent with the present. Her imagination did not move lightly in and out of possibilities, so she was seldom envious and seldom discontented. She was cautious about entering the realm of the possible, for when she did her will came with her. "'It really isn't fair,' she said at last, "'him getting all the excitement and you none. "'It isn't the excitement, it's just that he's doing something, being someone. "'I don't get bored. It isn't that. "'I'm so dreadfully bored,' Piera said nasally, "'imitating the eldest Sorrentai daughter, and she and Laura both giggled. "'I never get bored. I just feel unnecessary. "'It's what Itale says here about Mr. Estenscar. That's what I mean.' She already knew the sentence by heart. He seeks with all his strength to find the way that he and only he can, and hence must follow. So is Itale trying to do that? And he will do it. But anybody in the world could do everything I do. Nobody else could be Laura Sorde, though. What's the use being me if I don't do anything? If you weren't you, what would I do? Who would I talk to? How could I even be me? Anybody can run around doing things, but nobody can be you except you, and I hope you never change. I won't change in what I love, Laura said. Her face was turned to the western sunlight and the dark reflecting bulk of San Lorenz Mountain above the lake. But you see, you're already in love. You've started on your way. I haven't. I have no way. I just wait, and time goes by and by and by, and life goes by. Surely I was made for more. Piera did not answer for a while. She felt more than the three years' age difference between herself and Laura, the very great difference between sixteen and nineteen years old. She felt an inferiority of character that had nothing to do with age. She was in love, Laura said. And indeed, six weeks ago, she and Alexander Sorrentai had become secretly engaged, and she had rushed to tell Laura the secret, and show her Alexander's carnelian ring on a chain around her neck. That was so, that was true. But as Laura spoke, Piera blushed as if she had been caught stealing jam. She was engaged to be married, but she did not, in her deep heart, take it seriously. Laura did. It would never occur to Laura that one might experiment with betrothal or play at love, that one could even speak of being in love without having given one's whole heart. The little girl felt Alexander's carnelian ring a cold lump against her breastbone and thought, I'm a pig, I'm a pig, I'm a pig. When you fall in love, she said, it will be with a tremendous man, a king, nobody around here, a man from far away, a man like a lion, and you'll go away with him and see, oh, I don't know, Vienna and all the cities and do wonderful things and write letters home, and I'll be envious. Silly, said Laura. What would I leave Malafrena for? Let's go to Vespers at St. Anthony's, Perry. Oh, Miss Elizabeth wanted to, I forgot. Come on. Piera jumped up like a branch suddenly released. Laura uncurled and followed her. They left the letter with Eleonora, went by Valtorsa for the pony cart and the governess, and got to St. Anthony's barely in time for the service. There, at the base of San Lorenz, the sunlight was long gone. The granite chapel looked like a toy set down between the forested ridge and the deep curve of the lake. Inside the chapel smelled of stone, whitewash, balsam, pine. The two girls, the fat, quiet governess, a young peasant couple, and three old women were all that evening's congregation. They heard vespers in the silence of the lonely place, in the growing cold of the mountain evening. When they came out, the far reaches of the lake were gray with dusk, and the water in the shadow of St. Lorenz was streaked with the cold, strong, silent wind rising. Laura and the priest, Father Clement of Sinvia, old friends, fell to talking, and there was a matter of arranging to have some firewood brought to the cottage of one of the old women, 
and then the priest came back with them in the pony cart for supper at the Sordes, so that Piera and Miss Elizabeth got home rather late, delaying supper at Valtorsa by a few minutes. After supper, Count Orlant, Miss Elizabeth, neighbor Rodin, and the Count's new overseer played whist. Vist, it was called in the Montana, and many autumn and winter evenings were given up to Vist. Auntie sat in her straight-backed chair, a bowl of red yarn on her lap. Piera sat by the marble fireplace with her lesson book. She was supposed to write a composition on the duties of the young female. She hated to write compositions, or letters, or notes, or anything. They were always very dull, and then Miss Elizabeth made red circles around the misspellings. She had composed one sentence so far. Young girls should be obedient. Auntie, would you like me to read to you? No, my dear, said Auntie, slowly, slowly rewinding the red yarn. Young girls should be obedient. Piera thought and thought. They should not argue or talk very much loudly. There are numerous things young girls should not do, but these are not duties. Her pen made a row of dots on the paper, then of its own accord drew three profiles of young men with large eyes and noses facing left, and a lion with a curly mane facing right. Young girls should get M and have B, she wrote very small, and then crossed it out very black. It is important for them to learn their lessons, but less important than for young gentlemen to learn theirses, as they will find them more useful in life. They should be neat and orderly. The pen drew three maidens with Grecian noses all facing left. Pierre gave it up and began to watch the card players. Her father had his cards up under his nose, not because he was suspicious, but because he was nearsighted. Neighbor Rodin had a good hand and looked smug. He was a small landowner. Vist and hunting were his passions, and he had never married, stating that a wife would keep him from Vist and hunting. Miss Elizabeth looked, as usual, contented. She was a placid soul. Nothing stirred her. She praised God with a mild heart. Next to her, the new overseer, Gavray, looked thin and sharp as a knife blade. He was a Val Altesma man, and had been with Count Orlant only a month. Piera had not paid much attention to him, as he was always busy with papers and account books, speaking to her father, but not to her, and missing dinner more often than not, because he was working in the office or the orchards or the fields. He was sitting quiet now, alert, studying the other players' faces. So Piera studied his. He was a good-looking man, thin-lipped, dark-eyed, with a ruddy brown complexion. The best thing about being engaged to Alexander, Piera thought, was that it gave her a safe refuge, a lookout tower from which to look at other men. Since she was twelve, she'd been trying to fall in love. It was hard work falling in love with pictures, strangers glimpsed in Porta Cheka, heroes of romantic novels, and the few boys she met who were not put out of the running by warts or stupidity. It was hard work and unrewarding, but she kept at it. She practiced, as a musician practices on his violin, not cold-bloodedly, yet methodically, not for present profit or enjoyment, not because he longs to play each scale ten times over, but because to play the violin well is his gift, his need, his job. So Piera practiced at the art of love. She had known Alexander Sorrentai all her life. No social event took place along the northern lakeshore without representatives from the Sorrentai, Sorde, and Valtorskar families. In the last generation the latter two had got few in numbers, even to the point where the Valtorskar name would die with Piera. But the Sorrentais abounded. There were never less than fifteen of them under the dynastic roof, northwest of Valtorsa, in a flank valley of Sinvia Mountain. The senior family of the estate had six children, three girls and three boys, all tall and boisterous, except the eldest, Alexander, who was short and quiet. He was Laura's age, and when they were both sixteen he had written her a long love letter embellished with quotations from the new Eloise, which his mother had borrowed from Eleonora the year before and forgotten to return. Laura had shown the letter almost at once to her mother, who counseled inaction. Nothing had come of it except a lasting embarrassment for both Laura and Alexander. 
At every party, the memory of the letter lay like a tombstone between them. For three years they danced together at every dancing party in stony and tormented silence. It was a great relief to Laura when she could hand Piera over to Alexander and do her dancing with Papa Sorrentai, the uncles, the cousins, the brother-in-law, and the rest of the inexhaustible fund of Sorrentai's. This handing over took place at the August Ball, the ball they had discussed one July evening by the lake the ball to which Piero wore a white gown with gold flowers embroidered down the bodice, her first evening gown. Alexander gawped at her as if he had never seen her. Indeed, he never had. In her first evening gown, Piero was new as the newborn, her childhood left behind, her womanhood fresh from the hands of God and the seamstress. By midnight, Alexander had decided that if she would not marry him, life was meaningless. Three weeks later, in the evening of a long, loud picnic day in the pine forest across the lake, he climaxed a spasmodic but earnest wooing with the offer of marriage. Piera accepted at once. Yes, she said. She was sitting on a fallen log near a stream. Alexander hovered about her, not daring either to kneel or sit down. May I speak to your father? he said. Perhaps we should wait a while, she said. She gave no reason why, and he asked none. They agreed without discussion that the engagement should be kept secret, neither thought to ask why. They were in perfectly good faith. Alexander, experiencing real desire, never questioned that he was in love. Piero was more aware that they were playing a game, yet it was not a game to her. What she was playing was the moto perpetuo, or the tarantella that follows the well-practiced scales, a beginner's piece but music. She did not know why he said he would marry her. She said she would marry him because she needed to practice her art. She scarcely thought about their getting married. They were engaged to be married, betrothed. That was enough for the present. They deceived each other. Piera deceived him more than he did her, and they deceived themselves. He deceived himself more than Piera did herself, but they were quite happy. Piera looked up into Alexander's blocky, callow face, and he looked down at her sitting on the log and said, My bride. Later on, he said, Our properties touch, you know, at Galia's Hill. He was the principal heir to the Sorrentai property. Piera was the only heir to Valtorsa. The joined estates would be an excellent holding. Piera found it very interesting that he had seen this and thought about it. She admired him for doing so. Her father was an impractical man, inept at the management of his property, and miserable when he had to deal with money matters. Guide Sorde was always trying to set him straight, but Guide, though a good farmer and manager, was not a practical man either. He loved the work, not the profit from it. Alexander saw the work neither as a punishment nor an end in itself, but as a means to an end. He preferred work in the estate office to the fields, and had been his father's accountant for two years. All his talk of loss and profit, income and outlay was quite new to Fiera, and she listened with deep interest to all he told her. That intelligent interest and her honest and unqualified admiration of his talents soon won Alexander to her with a bond stronger, perhaps, than his desire. The sweetest moment of it all for Fiera was when she told Laura that she was betrothed. She felt triumph. Laura felt envy. But those were mere emotions, twinges, straw on the current of their friendship. Piera's love affair brightened Laura's life, a life that ran too quiet and too solitary. While without Laura, Piera would not have enjoyed her betrothal very much at all. Indeed, she preferred talking about Alexander with Laura to being with Alexander himself. She did not see him often, as he could not call on her openly. She had requested secrecy, and a call from a young man on a young woman in that small, watchful society was as good as a proposal. They met in secret, and Laura's connivance was needed to arrange the meetings. She was as drunk with the romance of it all as Piera and Alexander. She waited on guard on the lawn beneath the stars, tense and ecstatic, while they whispered in the shadow of the boathouse. She was perhaps happier than they. They had kissed once the first evening. Given abruptly and received awkwardly, the kiss had landed near Piera's ear. 
After it, neither had dared move. They had held still so long, their necks began to ache. Piera had tried with all her heart to feel delighted, but not even when she was alone could she manage it, and she did not mention the kiss to Laura. Alexander did not offer to repeat it. At most he held her hand, and when he did, his was wet. She did not much like that soft, nervous touch, and as they talked would contrive to withdraw her own hand, and he would not notice. Once in one of the endless conversations that were their chief pleasure, Laura had said, You know, Perry, I can tell you something now. What, what, what? Nothing, really. I used to wonder what it would be like if you and Itale fell in love. You know how you think things like that? just arranging the world to suit yourself? Piera nodded. It wouldn't have done at all, really. Why not? Oh, his politics, and both your tempers, and anyhow, he isn't Alexander. As she sat by the fire, her composition on the duties of the young female on her knee, Piera thought again of that brief conversation, of Laura's wistful, teasing, loving look, and the same chill of fear ran through her. Fall in love with Itale. Marry him. No, that was something altogether different from Alexander Sorrentai and being engaged and holding hands. That was no game she could play, nothing she could manage. It was not to be thought of, nor was he to be thought of. The scent of Mandevilia and the roar of summer rain and the door open and he standing there. She had not read the book he had given her, The New Life, it stood in her bookshelf in her room, and she never took it out. And she had believed this morning that he was coming back. That was nonsense. He was not coming back. He was gone. Auntie's eyes had closed. Her fingers lay motionless on the red yarn. Young girls should be obedient. They should be neat and orderly. Pierre yawned, and neighbor Rodin said, grinning from the card table, don't swallow the fireplace, Contesina. Voices and steps outside. Piera bounced up. Visitors, thank God. It was Father Clement wanting a word with Count Orlant about the next meeting of the Catholic men's sodality of Valmalafrena, and the Sordes came along with him for the walk. Eleonora had brought some new silks for Auntie. Is your rheumatism any better, Auntie dear? she asked and the old lady, raising her clear gray eyes from sleep without the least surprise, said, No. Guide and neighbor Rodin fell to talking hounds. Piera went off to the kitchen to stir up the cook, for Count Orlant never let a guest leave unfed. The new overseer rose from the interrupted vist game to stretch his legs and warm his back at the fire. Laura, who had seen him only a few times before, asked politely, Are you liking it here at Malafrena, Mr. Gavray? I miss, he answered. She blushed, as she always did when talking to a stranger. That was all their conversation. As the Sordes went home by the lakeshore path, Laura asked, What sort of man is Count Orlant's new overseer, father? A considerable improvement. He may get the estate run something like properly if he keeps at it. I can't find out much about him, said Eleonora. Of course, he's not one of the Gavries from Coulme. It's Gavray. His father's a farmer, freeholder, near Moraltesma. He's the second son. He's very close-mouthed. None of the women at Valtorsa know a thing about him. I hope he's honest. How can you trust a close-mouthed man? You can trust him not to blabber, Guide said with dry good humor. He was still in the good mood of the early morning. He breathed the night air of autumn as they walked, felt his body as straight and lithe as ever, and held his wife's arm in his own. Fifty-six wasn't the worst time of life. It was pleasant to walk home in the darkness of October under pines and stars between two well-beloved women. When Laura bade him good night before going upstairs, he kissed her and sketched the cross on her hair, as he did rarely since she was grown. Eleonora watched and thought, You have your daughter, but I do not have my son. But the flicker of bitterness was lost as she looked at Laura's face. All evening long, as always when she was tense or troubled, Laura's likeness to her brother had been very strong. Itale had been in the turn of her head, in the tone of her voice. On whose head had Guide set his blessing? 
His eyes, his hands, were kinder than his head, and wiser. She followed Laura upstairs after a little. As she passed the empty bedroom, something moved, a figure between the doorway and the gray starlit window. I thought you were in bed. I wanted to look at the lake. In her white nightgown, Laura was very tall and thin, a white crane startled from the reeds at night. You are barefoot. Come to bed before you catch a pleurisy. She followed Laura to her bedroom, which looked out onto the valley, the orchards, Sanjeevan, dark against the stars. The window was half open, letting in the sweet, dry odors of an autumn night in farmlands. Laura curled up in bed. Her mother sat down by her. Her long, thin hand lay on the coverlet, and the girl looked at it and at the wedding ring of soft gold worn thin. Mama, when you fell in love first with your father, not the cavalry lieutenant, Eleonora laughed, and her underlip drew in, demure and sly. Oh, no, that was just mustaches and the boots. Can people fall in love intentionally? Eleonora considered. I really don't know. It sounds very odd, but I believe... Well, so much of love comes after marriage, at least for us. She meant for women. I don't believe one can force an inclination... But if it is there, one can certainly improve upon it. They sat in peaceable silence for a minute, the girl thinking forward, the woman thinking back. Wasn't Father Claimant funny about the soup? They both laughed. I never see him, said Eleonora, but I think of the gray hen Ava was so fond of. Do you remember it? It had such a peculiar way of clucking when it laid an egg. He sounds very like it. They both laughed again. Guide's step was on the stairs, coming up. Eleonora rose. She looked at her daughter with her head a little to one side. You're sad, she said. Oh, no. The mother said nothing, but continued to gaze. I miss Itale on letter nights. It's high time we answered Matilda's letter. Eleonora's brother, Angele Drew, and his wife, Matilda, in Solari, had invited Laura to stay with them over the winter. I'd rather go in spring, Laura said imploringly. The winter down there would be good for your chest. And some new faces at Christmas. Well, we really must think about it, dear. Put your feet under the covers. Do you breathe through your toes? Good night, my darling. Eleonora blew out the candle on the chest of drawers and went out, a little round figure in the darkness. Laura did not lie down, but put her feet obediently under the covers. With her arms around her knees, she sat for a long time, looking out at the mountain and the hazy stars beside and above it, flaring in the gulfs of night and autumn and the wind. Part 3 Choices 1. In the autumn of 1826, Piera set off for Esnar, some forty miles north of her home, to complete her education. Her father went with her, and Miss Elizabeth, who was a native of Esnar, and cousin Beta Berachoy of Portacheca, who wanted to visit friends there, and was of course invited to share the Valtorska carriage, and Count Orlant's man, and old Godin, who had been the Valtorska coachman for fifty years. They set off from Valtorsa on a morning of late September, in the immense, creaking, luggage-laden family carriage, older even than the coachman. Piera's face, pressed to the window to bid farewell to her friends and Malafrena, looked small and pale. Laura burst into tears, and Alexander Sorrentai trotted his horse beside the carriage all the way to Porta Cheka, though he could not talk to Piera since the window was stuck shut. There had been some coolness between him and Piera that summer. As the secret engagement wore on into its second year, he had begun to question the necessity of its secrecy and Piera had at once begun a quarrel with him. It did not get very far, because he would not quarrel. He went into a flat panic at the thought of losing her. He promptly revived the new Eloise and the meetings at the boathouse after dark. But Piera had played all those scales a hundred times and was getting bored. She would have much preferred a good quarrel and either a reconciliation with tears or no reconciliation and a broken heart. But Alexander would not quarrel. 
He was staunch, he was tender, he was patient, he was faithful. He said, Every hour you are gone I'll think of you. I will never change, Piera. She had wept at their last parting. Now, as the carriage came to the wide gates of Portacheca, Alexander reined in his horse and raised his hand in farewell. She looked back at him as long as she could through the yellowish eyes and glass of the rear window of the carriage. She pressed her hand against the carnelian ring beneath her bodice. She saw the young figure on the motionless horse dwindle away, dwindle away down the street, as if she saw her own childhood, the years spent amongst dreams and mountains in the stillness of Malafrena Valley, dwindle away behind her and be lost to sight. Yet her eyes were dry now. Discreet young fellow, that Sandre Sorrentai, Count Orlan said with a chuckle, that was for him sly. I wondered if he'd have the face to escort us straight through town. Through Portacheca and out through its northern gate, past the ruined tower-keep of Vermare, down into the golden lands. Towards evening a fine rain fell, veiling the hills. Concerted efforts had got the window unstuck, and Piera leaned out head and shoulders into the grey, wet freshness. Count Orlant was not one for long stages, and old Godin was protective of the fat horses. They spent the night a little less than halfway at the inn of Bovira village. Next day they came down out of the hills onto the long, faintly rolling plain of the western marches, a quiet sea of earth. In the evening they came to Esnar and drove up Fontermana Street beneath plane trees already touched with gold, beside fountains between grave high houses to left and right. Piera had visited Esnar when she was eight. All she remembered of it was Fontermana Street, the fountains, the overarching trees. Now she saw the houses, row after row, the elegant equipages at the round fountain, well-dressed women walking in a way no woman in the Montana knew how to walk. She was wild with silent excitement. The city, she thought, the city, the city. It was a very quiet city. The loudest voice in Esnar was the voice of water, the fountains. There were no still-covered wells. The water leapt up into light and air and fell back with a silver rush at every corner and courtyard. From the dormitory of the convent school two fountains could be heard, the bright thin jet down in the court and the ring fountain on the triangular place in front of the school, a dialogue without pauses, sweet and serene, like a colloquy of blessed souls who have been so long together in heaven that they can talk and listen at the same time. That was Pierre's fancy her first nights in the dormitory. Her mind ran more than usual on images of the blessed, since she had not before lived among nuns and worn a nun-gray uniform and walked by twos on the street. Nun, little girls, middle-sized girls, big girls, nun, and knelt with fifty other girls and women at dawn on bare stone in a bare chapel for hour-long devotions. None of the customs of this new life fretted her, even after her father had gone and silent excitement had turned into silent and miserable homesickness. She liked the city, the school, the new friends, and willingly changed her garnet-red skirt for the gray uniform, not pining for the long liberty of her childhood. She did not pine for her father, Laura, the familiar beloved faces of home. It was her home itself she missed, Valtorsa the high, cool rooms, the orchards and vineyards and fields, the line of the mountains on the sky, the lake, the stones of the lake shore. Piero was one to whom the thing, not its use nor its meaning, but the thing itself mattered. She knew the thing only, as a lark knows the sun or a wolf the rain. What was given her she accepted willingly, but what was taken from her she missed, and did not cease to miss. All round Esnar stretched calm, soft-colored fields. On clear days Piera looked southwards from the windows of the convent school to see the bluish drift or massing of clouds, the clouds behind which lay the mountains and the lake. She was seventeen. She had grown an inch since April. The conventual fashion of her hair revealed a broad forehead, gentle and stubborn, like the forehead of a little bull. In the gray school dress she looked cleanly and novice-like, and she moved and spoke more quietly than she had used to do, 
for she was in love now with the French teacher, Sister Andrea Teresa, a frail woman of infinite restraint, and all that was restrained, delicate, modest, gracious, was now holy to Piera. All her thoughts that autumn were devotional. At the height of her love for Sister Andrea Teresa, and in the spirit of Christian sacrifice, she wrote Alexander Sorrentai, returning him his carnelian ring. The letter was sincere and tender, written in an ecstasy of renunciation. But for the rest of her life she never thought of it, and of the grubby little packet containing his ring, without a deep, hard stab of shame. Came Christmas. She did not go home for the holidays, for the Montana roads were deep in snow and rain and mud. She would have liked to stay on at the school with the nuns, as did a few other girls. But obedient to her father's wish, she went to stay with the relatives they had stopped with in September, cousins on her mother's side, the Belinans. The house was on the new side in Prince Wilhelm Square, four blocks from the Roman fountain. It was about a hundred years old, built of the yellow Esnar sandstone. In its walled garden was a little fountain. Inside and out the house was plain and elegant, more shabby than shiny. The aristocrats of Esnar did not polish. Silver needs polishing. Gold does best left alone. That was their attitude. Emerging from their walled gardens and high-ceiling privacies, they could be formidable. But they were not arrogant. They were too peaceable. Their manners were reserved and gentle. They had been civilized for a long time here in the west of the country. Piera, who, unlike Laura and Itale, was seldom at the mercy of overpowering emotions, felt at ease amongst these people. Her feelings were slow-moving, obscure and mute, beneath a surface play of vivacity. In the convent and with the gentlefolk of Esnar, the vivacity was subdued, the reserve refined. She behaved with the pleasant sedateness of seventeen. The Belinans had already become very fond of her. He was a handsome, short man of sixty with a slight stammer. She, born Countess Rochanaskar, was a delicate, grey-gold lady of fifty. Their two daughters, long since married, lived one in bry le the other around the corner. Life in the house in Gulhelm Square was ordered, serene, a little desolate. Since it was Christmas time and they had a young guest, the Belinans did more entertaining than usual, yet the days passed very quietly. Piera fitted in so well that she might always have lived there, might have been their late daughter, and have played away a solitary childhood in the golden-walled garden on the lawn, between the pear tree and the fountain. Very much the same people were at all the holiday dinner parties and evenings of the Belinan circle. Most of them, to Piera's eyes, were old. She did not mind, she was used to being the youngest, and knew how to enjoy the position and among the elderly she did not feel threatened. Young men were frightened and frightening. Things always went awkwardly with them. It was much easier to talk to men of forty. There was nothing serious about it. It was like meeting an interesting foreigner. The New Year's Eve party was at the house of a close friend of the Belinan's son-in-law, a widower named Coste. His sister was hostess, and his young son was allowed to stay with the guests for an hour before being taken off to bed. Piera and four-year-old Batiste had met before and had taken a fancy to each other. She had not been with little children very much, and she found the little boy's conversation wonderfully funny and touching. He was as handsome and well-bred as his father and his maiden aunt, but had not yet achieved their deep reserve. He prattled to Piera, admired her artlessly, and pleased her by giving her a trust and affection she had done very little to win. It was a pleasant task to attempt to deserve them. When the father, a shy, grave man, reproved Batiste for bothering her, she defended the child warmly. That earned her Batiste's gratitude, also perhaps the father's. When Batiste's hour was up, she went with his nurse to see him to bed and got warmly kissed, and returned to the salon thinking what an extraordinary thing a child was, and how pleasant it would be to have children around just as it was pleasant to have men around, to hear the bass notes of the human voice, not always the tweedle-tweedle-tweedle of the convent. She sat down near the fireplace. The party was cheerful and quiet. Talk flowed as clear and unhurried as the water of the fountains of Esnar. 
There were some faces Piera had not seen before, but their owners behaved like all the rest. The quarter hours slipped by quickly, marked by the tiny ping of the French clock on the mantel. Piera sat mostly in silence, enjoying her silence, her decorum, the knowledge that by it she pleased the others. At ten a few last guests entered. Baron Orioskar and his wife and sister and brother-in-law, and their visitor from Krasnoy. The visitor was a young woman. Perhaps in deference to provincial sobriety she wore no jewels at all, but her violet dress was magnificent and her bearing was superb. A woman who could walk like that did not even need to be beautiful. Piera sat and gaped at her. She could not keep her eyes off her. All her standards of the admirable shook to their foundation. What was Sister Teresa beside this? Mild, tenuous, sterile. This was not the brittle beauty of restraint, but the splendor of a woman's strength and freedom. She is wonderful, Piera thought. That's what people ought to look like. She is wonderful. They were introduced. Countess Valtorskar, Baroness Paludaskar. The lady from the capital acknowledged the introduction in a cool, distinct contralto, and prepared to be led on to the next introduction. But Piera spoke, utterly without premeditation. I believe we both know a mutual friend, Baroness, she said, terrified at what she was saying and how stupidly she said it. The beautiful Baroness smiled inquiringly. Mr. Sorday of Malafrena? Sorday. Baroness Paludaskar's onward movement definitely ceased, and her eyes for the first time definitely looked for an instant, at Piera. Really? Do you know him? she asked indulgently. We're neighbors of the Sordes, my family, in Val Malafrena. Then you've known Italy a long time. All my life, Piera said and blushed. No becoming rosy flush, but a hot red blush. Her cheeks stung, her ears sang. She stood rigid and could think nothing but... Oh, please, stop, stop, stop. If the beautiful Baroness would just go away, go on, then this stupid embarrassment would pass off. She would never say anything to a stranger again. The Baroness smiled at her escort, relinquishing further introductions, and sat down in the gilt chair by the hassock on which Piera had been sitting. In despair, Piera sat down and folded her hands in her lap. My dear cousins have walked me clear around Esnar twice today, I think, the Baroness said, and smiled a mischievous, friendly smile. I have been longing to sit down. But what a pleasure to meet someone who knows Itale. I'm very fond of him, you know. We've known him since he first came. What is it, over a year now? How he's changed. Yes, he... has he... how... Oh, well, when he first came he was funny, you know, very stiff, disapproving, altogether suspicious of everyone. It was inexperience. He cuts a quite impressive figure now, without intending to, I should add. Her voice was beautifully modulated. Piera listened to it with fascination and smiled stiffly in response to the lingering, mocking, friendly smile, which deepened now. Tell me, tell me the Baroness said, leaning forward, ready for confidences. Tell me what the father's like, the ogre. Itale's father? Yes, I want to know, I really want to know what sort of creature disinherits his son because the son wants to live like a civilized human being in the city for a while. What does the man want? What are they like up there among the mountains? I've never met a woman from the Montana, you see, that's the trouble. Men never can explain things. You explain it to me. Are you all very passionate souls? The beautiful woman was not teasing her. She was friendly and kindly. She did not mean to tease. It was just that Piera was a stupid provincial schoolgirl who didn't know anything and couldn't talk. I don't know, she whispered. I think Itale is the most passionate man I have ever known. Baroness Paludaskar said, her voice now soft and thoughtful. It's the secret of his success, of course. If he had been a saint in the old days, he would have converted whole nations of the heathen. You know that he is becoming very well known in Krasnoy these days. No, I didn't. I don't. 
One can never believe it of someone one played with as a child. I know you're thinking, what, him? But he used to have warts and pull his sister's hair. He can't be famous. I've known little boys who I'm now asked to believe are counselors and judges and radicals, and I don't know what all. And one must take them seriously, you know, Countess. It's up to women to take men seriously. If we didn't, society might quite crumble away. The men would be left taking each other seriously while the rest of us laughed. Well, that's all nonsense, but it is true that our friend is taken almost too seriously by some important people. But you don't believe me. Oh, yes, yes, I, I do, Piera mumbled wretchedly. If only she didn't have to say anything, but could just watch the Baroness and listen to her and try to understand the things she said. If only she didn't keep talking about Itale. That confused Piera. When she looked down, she saw the Baroness's slim foot in a silver sandal. She tucked her own feet under her dress. She had to say something. I suppose it's the, the paper? What, the paper? The Baroness said brusquely. Oh, his journal. Yes, quite popular, I believe. It isn't that sort of thing that matters, you know. The fact is, Itale is in fashion. His ideas, I should say. Although I wonder. But now we're all patriots, you see. Oh, yes, I see, said Piera in despair. She was completely lost. The Baroness went on, smiling so charmingly and telling a story about Itale and somebody named Heliscar and some general and something about Austria, and it was funny at the end, so that she should have laughed, but she only smiled and nodded. Her throat was so contracted that she no longer trusted herself to say yes, to show she was listening. When their host came over to them, she looked at him as if across a chasm, gazing wistfully at his quiet face. The Baroness had not been introduced to the Belinans, and he took her over to them. Presently he returned and sat down where the Baroness had been sitting. "'I am sorry to have interrupted your chat,' he said in his shy, grave way. Piera thought he knew she had been miserable and had saved her, and was now saving her pride. Full of gratitude to him for his simple kindness, she said, "'Oh, I couldn't say a word to her. She's too beautiful.' "'Oh, yes,' Mr. Coste said, "'wonderfully fashionable.' with the mild, deadly judgment of the provincial on his own ground. He looked at Piera, not smiling, but with unquestioning acceptance of her, a simple confidence in her that went far to restore her self-respect. He brought up some indifferent subject, and they talked. As they talked, Piera saw that somehow her ill-matched conversation with the Baroness had been a battle, and that she had lost it. But why a battle? Over what? And why could not one just talk easily and trustfully as she and Mr. Coste were talking now? "'Are there any patriots in Esnar, Mr. Coste?' she asked him. He looked a little surprised, paused, and answered with seriousness, "'Patriots. You mean, I imagine, in the sense of nationalists? Yes, certainly. The liberal tradition here is very old, you know.' It goes back to the struggle of the western provinces against the authority of the Krasnoy monarchy, I suppose. A habit of independence remained. But the patriots, the nationalists, they want to have the monarchy restored, don't they? Yes. Duke Matthias's accession would signify the end of Austrian domination. Then they don't like the Grand Duchess Maria because she's an Austrian. Is that all? That's the essence of it. I thought perhaps they didn't want any more kings at all, Piera said, looking disappointed. That hardly seems enough of a change to bother about. Oh, quite enough. If Duke Matthias became king, he would take his crown from the people, swearing obedience to a constitution drawn up by the assembly of the estates general. He would not be the source, but merely the vehicle or channel of authority. He explained this without the least shade of condescension. Are you interested in the nationalist movement, Contesina? I don't know. I never understood it before. It is a very complex matter. I doubt that anyone truly understands what nationalism is, why those whose word is liberty seek the national, the particular destiny, while those who deny the old barriers of language and custom and kind 
often would sacrifice all liberty in the name of peace. Are you a radical, Mr. Coste? I, no, Contesina. Shouldn't the country be independent again, though? I mean, why should the Austrians rule us? They can't even speak our language. Why can't they let us rule ourselves? Well, because none of us is alone. This peace since Napoleon is a fragile one. Even a minor ally of the empire like us or the North Italian duchies might shatter it if we were free to change allegiance. But is it worth while if it's so very fragile? Perhaps not, Coste said slowly, with an intense inward look. But is any war worth while? Surely not, Pierre said, as intense as he was. But actually the radicals don't want a war, do they? They just want not to have the Austrians here, and free elections, and the king, don't they? Coste nodded. Independence, free elections, representation, the reform of corrupt institutions, great matters. But even if they can be achieved without either revolution or war, they are like revolution and war in this. They are matters too great for any individual. They override the individual man and all that may be good in his life as it is. Where men are very poor, a movement of reform that might carry them upward with it is their only hope. So in Rakova or in Foranoi, the radical movement grows every year in strength. But here in the West we have little real poverty. People here are mostly free to make of their lives what they choose to make of them. We have attained something here in Esnar. Nothing very large, but it took many centuries in the making. It will be lost in half a decade if it's jumbled in with the needs and wants of other classes and kinds of people. I prize this life and these people. They are dear to me. So I cannot give my sympathy to those who, in reforming the face of the earth, will destroy my little harmless corner of it. Pierre listened carefully as he spoke and understood him. To know what attainments he wanted preserved, she had only to look at him, his child, his house, and his city, the quiet city, full of the sound of fountains. To them, to him, all change was loss. And because she was talking with him and liked him very much, she agreed with him. Reform was all right elsewhere, where they needed it. She was aware that in adopting this attitude she was turning against Itale's beliefs, and the consciousness of it gave her pleasure. Very well, let him be a radical, and let everybody in Krasnoy talk about him, and let Baroness Paludaskar talk about him all she liked. She did not care what they did in Krasnoy. She lived in Esnar and was her own woman. Her decorum and schoolgirl self-consciousness dropped away, and gaiety flashed out in her like the flash of a garnet. Other people joined them. She was at the center of the group. The orchestra of three was tuning up. It was customary in Esnar to dance the New Year in. Pierre had danced. She had a new gown, gray silk, the skirt caught up on one side with a rose of cloth of gold. She was slender and held her head back proudly. Her dark, rosy face looked ready to break out into a laugh at what her partner, himself, smiling as he handed her up the row, was saying to her. Jivan Coste watched her. She and Baroness Paludaskar advanced to meet, curtsied in a mingling shimmer of violet and gray, retreated to the facing rows. Coste watched the prompt and yielding grace with which she let her partner sweep her off for their figure. He watched her eat a vanilla ice after the dance. She ate every drop of it. He crossed the room to where she sat and asked her for the dance about to begin. She looked up in surprise. A widower of barely two years, he did not dance. She met his eyes. Yes, she said, rising to take his hands as she spoke. And the piano and fiddle and bass began the sweet, insistent rhythm of a polonaise. The music stopped before the dance was done, drying off in mid-chord. The little French clock was pinging out midnight. It's the new year, Coste said. We ended the old one together. Shall we begin the new one? He gave the musicians the signal. The music began. Piera took her position for the dance without replying. A charming girl, your little Montina countess, said Luisa to Coste's sister. Yes, she's a sweet child, said Miss Coste. 
Do you see her about? I wanted to say a word to her, but I haven't seen her for the last few minutes. Since last year, I should say. She laughed softly at her little joke. She spent the year so far dancing with your brother. With my brother? Miss Coste repeated without expression, and looked at the dancers for a long minute. It is pleasant to see my brother dancing again, she said. After so long. He has been unwell? Louisa asked, struggling with a yawn. He lost his dear wife two years ago next month. I'm so glad to see him forget himself a moment in his kindness to the child. Kindness indeed. Child indeed. Louisa stared at Miss Coste. Her mouth was set, her fingers laced tight together. She might well spend the morning of the new year in tears in her neat bedroom upstairs where no man but her father and her brother had ever been. But nothing would escape her downstairs in company. She was too shy, too proud. There was nothing to be got from these Esnar people, shot in their little world, inexorably and intolerably polite. Louisa gave up struggling and yawned. Yes, indeed, she said. She looked at Jivan Coste's face, dark and bright as a live coal, and at the silken whirl of Piera Valtorskar's skirts, and yawned again, openly, vindictively. She spoke to Piera again as the evening ended. It was a pleasure to talk with you of our mutual friend, Contesina. Perhaps we can all have a good chat together when he comes. When he comes? Hasn't he mentioned it to you? He may come here with my brother in March for a week or two. Oh, I hope so, said Piera. Good night, Baroness. I'm so happy to know you. Off she went, happy, yes, seventeen years old and drunk with dancing. Louisa, leaving, heard her long, sweet laugh. Piera returned to her convent school, put on her uniform, walked sedate behind a nun on Thursday afternoons, knelt an hour every morning in the cold chapel. But the piety she had striven for and enjoyed for three months had evaporated overnight, leaving scarcely an odor of sanctity behind, a faint perfume. She waited for weekends now, not because of Sunday high mass, but because of Saturday night, which from four to eleven she was permitted to spend with the Belinans. She knew all that would happen there, tea in the parlor, quiet talk, dress for dinner, dine with a guest or two from among old friends or kinfolk, then coffee, perhaps a little music, then Mr. Belinan would walk her back to the convent. That was all. But these tranquil evenings centered upon her, were for her. They were lessons, the happiest kind of lessons in the subtlest of subjects. She was an apt pupil. After a few weeks any stranger would have taken her for an Esnar girl, born and bred, a bright and gentle daughter of that aristocracy. The reward of her docility was the appreciation of all around her, their kindness to her, their acceptance of her as one of themselves. The reward might not have been quite enough, but for two added elements. One was that they asked only outward conformity of her, leaving her feelings her own, untouched. Reserve was the keystone of the delicate arch. They taught Piera a coherent system of behavior, but did not meddle with the spirit in her. And the other inducement to the Belinan Saturday evenings was Jivan Coste, the man of sorrows, the widower twice her age, the faithful visitor. "'What a joy it is to see Jivan himself again,' said Mrs. Belinan over coffee, only the three of them present, and her husband assented with his slight stutter. "'Well, though there is balm in Gilead,' They both smiled, and the smile somehow referred itself to Piera, so that she too smiled, feeling herself important, valued, loved. How nice they all were to her! It was delightful, and it must go on and on, exactly the same. Nothing must change. On the first Saturday of March she walked through the rain to her cousin's house at four o'clock, and entering found Jivan Coste there. He often came in the evening, but no one came Saturday afternoons. Mrs. Belinan was distrait. She talked more than usual, Coste less. She poured tea, then rose, saying, I believe I must go look for Albrecht myself. He must be in his study, and left Piera and Coste together alone. Instinct, training, two months' preparation, 
mere guess. Any of them could tell Piera what was coming, and did so. But she turned away and shut her mind. She opened her mouth and said to Givan Coste, "'Have you seen Baroness Paludiscar lately?' "'Not lately. I haven't seen her since New Year's Eve at your party, except on the street just to nod to. She is so beautiful. She's so completely elegant. Sometimes I feel like the animals in Noah's Ark when I have to go by her with all the girls, two by two. He mustered up a smile, but no words. She and I both know we have a mutual friend. Isn't that strange, since we come from so far apart? He lives in Krasnoy now, of course. The Baron has said he might visit Esnar this spring. It's so odd to meet a person you don't know that knows a person you do know, isn't it? It would not do. It would not do at all. Her teeth were chattering. She looked at him, imploring him to speak and make her stop talking, to let the axe fall. He proposed marriage to her. She accepted him. She looked down at their clasped hands. He had taken off the gold wedding ring. When, she wondered, today or earlier. She had never thought to look. His hand was dark, strong, well kept. She liked the look of it, the warmth of it. She bent her head and kissed his hand. Piera, oh, my God, he whispered. And she felt between alarm and pleasure the tremor that ran through his whole body. He drew away from her and walked up and down the room a couple of times. I shall write your father, he said, as if threatening. Of course, so shall I. There is the child. I know the child. I am nearly forty, he said, rounding on her. Thirty-eight, she said. That threw him off. It may not please Count Valtorskar, he said less fiercely. You are only seventeen. My mother was seventeen when they married. He was thirty-three. Anyway, Papa is usually pleased by what I do. He cannot be pleased to lose you, Pierre. But we'll go home sometimes, won't we, to Malafrena? This time she was disconcerted. Certainly. Then that's all right, she said, her distress vanishing. The word lose had gone through her like a knife for an instant. To lose her father, to lose the lake, the house, the fat Cupid Newell post. But they would go home often. She need not live down here forever. She thought no more about it. Jivan Coste had stopped his pacing and was working himself up to say something. To suggest, no doubt, a new obstacle to his heart's desire. She smiled at him. She felt so sorry for him, and he was such a handsome man with his poised body and grave dark face. He turned, saw her smiling at him, and swallowed without speaking, hit amidships. I thought, perhaps next Christmas time, he brought out. Next Christmas time? Your father will want you to complete your year at St. Ursula's, and a year is customary, something less than a year, in fact. Ten months, she said dreamily, looking down at her hands. Is it too soon? Oh, no. Must we announce it directly? Not until you choose, he said, with a gratitude she did not understand. I do want to tell the Belinans and Papa, of course, and Laura. Oh, you'll like Laura, Mr. Coste. My name is Jeevan, he said politely. They both heard the politeness, and they both laughed. Their eyes met. He looked like a boy, embarrassed. It was a wonderful relief to laugh. Who is Laura? he asked. My friend Laura Sorde. Saying the name, she grew shy again suddenly. She's very nice. She looked down. Inept, a schoolgirl. Coste was most at ease with her when she was shy, not offering him unconstrained the fulfillment he could not yet believe in. He came to her and took her hand lightly. His face and voice were warm with feeling. I want you to talk with your cousins, Piera. I want you to have time, to be certain. I feel that I... Loving you is privilege enough. I should go now. I'll come back when you say I should. Tonight? 
tonight, he said, with that smile that lit his face and left it unchanged. And he went out. She sat still. Four silver-mounted glasses full of cold tea reposed on the table beside her. She jumped up and went to find Mrs. Belinan. She did not want to be alone. They met on the stairs. "'Has he gone?' the older woman asked anxiously. "'Yes,' Pierre said, and burst into tears. "'Oh, my dear, my dear,' Mrs. Belinan murmured, hugging her there on the stair landing. "'There, there, it's all past. I'm so sorry.' "'I didn't know I was going to cry,' Piera sobbed, burying her face in the soft, sweet-smelling shoulder. "'Poor child, it's all our fault. How stupid I am. What a misery, what a misery!' "'But it isn't. I mean, we are to be married next Christmas. I didn't know I was going to cry.' "'Next Christmas? You are betrothed,' said Mrs. Belinan, who was in tears herself. Oh, dear me, I didn't understand. I thought we'd made a dreadful mistake. But you aren't happy, Piera? Is something wrong? She looked down at the broad, stubborn, childish brow, which was all she could see of Piera's face, and repeated the question still more tenderly. For her conscience was alert and sensitive, and neither of her own daughters, tranquil and self-possessed women by the age of seventeen, had ever clung to her thus in confused and passionate need. "'No, I'm very happy,' Piera sobbed, weeping so that Mrs. Belinan gave up all questions and led her upstairs to her room to comfort her. "'There, there,' she murmured. "'There, Piera, don't cry any more. It's past.'" Two. Itale stood at a window of a house on Fontermana Street, watching the moon rise over old gardens dim with evening, and hearing the lilt of the fountain below the window as the west wind sprang up and moved in the leaves in the dusk. He was dressed in a plum-colored coat, his mother's Christmas gift. His linen was fine and well-starched, his hair was orderly, his cravat and stick-pin were controlled, his face was quiet and a little forlorn. He was wondering if looking south from here on a clear day you could see the mountains. "'Never saw a chap look out the windows as much as you do,' said Enrique Paludiscar, entering the room after a feeble rap. "'What do you see out of them, Sorde? Roofs, trees, moon, nothing going on. Same view I've got. Are you ready?' "'Yes,' said Itale, turning his forlorn look to Enrique's heavy, well-shaven, good-natured face. "'How'd you like my rig? English fashion. Everything has to be English. I don't know why. Come on, Luisa's waiting.' What's the time? These damned trousers are so tight I can't get my watch out without performing a sort of dance. We mustn't be late. The old lady's a dragon. Itale looked at his watch, which said two-thirty. It had stopped running several weeks ago, and he kept meaning to have it fixed. Must be near six. We'd better drive, then. Louisa smiled up at them from the foot of the broad staircase. Don't be silly, Harry. It's only round the corner. "'Town's all squeezed up together,' Enrique grumbled. "'Hate arriving on foot.' But on foot they set off into the evening of early spring. The fountains sang, the budding branches of the plane trees interlaced above the street. The wind was soft and cool, the moon poised bright above the roofs. All things were poised, in balance. All things here, Itale thought, were in harmony." They were to dine with one of the inmost circle of Esnar society, the Martianus Feldescar Torm. Itale was well received. They knew who he was, a landowner's son of Val Malafrena, one of the western Dome. A house-guest of one of themselves, therefore temporarily one of themselves. Evidently they also knew what else he was, for after supper the Martianus, a small plain old woman, said pleasantly to him, well, Mr. Sorde, are you bringing the revolution to Esnar? I should have thought we were scarcely worth fomenting. There seemed no point in hedging. No, Marquesa, he said. I'm only trying to lure some of your young men away to Krasnoy. You city people always want the revolutions all to yourselves, the old lady said with a ghostly laugh. I've read many of your articles, Mr. Sorde. They are interesting, eloquent. He bowed in thanks. 
They remind me sometimes of what our Valtura used to write for the old Esnar Mercury, and of Costant Valoy in the Krasnoy Review. Then I think Valoy has been dead for twenty years. Valtura has been in prison in Austria for ten. I suppose he is dead, too. Four generations of radicals I've seen, Mr. Sorday, but I haven't seen the revolution. The challenge was direct, and he answered it directly. I believe you will see it, Marquesa. You keep trying. I grant you that. I see you've won over our handsome baroness. She looked at Louisa, who was talking politics with Mr. Belinen, and a Feldescar Torm great-nephew. I doubt Valtura could have done that. If he'd had the chance. But he wouldn't have had the chance, she said, looking at him with shrewd, cold eyes. He left the pleasant dinner party somewhat depressed in spirit. The Marchioness had placed several darts in him with exquisite accuracy. She had reminded him that his cause had been defeated time and time again. She had reminded him that the Paludiscars were very curious companions for a revolutionary. She had reminded him of the ambiguity of his own position. And yet she had done all this, not, he admitted, in enmity to his cause, but in support of it. She had as good as asked, Where is our revolution? What are you doing about it? He walked restlessly about his room in the Arioscar house, then went to the window that overlooked the garden, opened it, and leaned out. The fountain lilted in its stone basin, a thin silvery sound in the night. A fountain at the street crossing a few doors down interwove a faint counterpoint. The wind was down. It was profoundly still. The stillness of the long fields that stretched on from the city on every side. A few stars burned humidly bright in the sky, washed blue with moonlight. Beauty, balance, harmony. Sick of himself, Vitale tried to lose himself in the moonlight, the quiet, but could not. In this germinant darkness, this moment between March and April, between sleep and wakening, he found only anger, uncertainty, and fear. Turned back upon himself, he tried to face himself, demanding the source of the trouble. When had his work become not an end, but a mere distraction from or means toward some different and obscurer end? What necessity was he shirking? With what angel must he wrestle? In asking the questions, it seemed to him that the trouble lay in his presence here, now, in this house. All his uncertainties of the last months might clarify themselves if he could simply answer the question, What am I doing here? His mind veered at once from the question, replacing it with a different one, the question others might ask of him. Enrique, for instance. Did he wonder occasionally why Itale was with him in Esnar? If so, he gave no sign of it. He had known Itale on and off for a year and a half now, at his own house and at the Heliscar house, and probably assumed that anyone he had known so long had to be a friend. Their brief warm flare of companionship on the coach was long forgotten. They had never had a conversation of any consequence whatever since. Enrique simply took Itale for granted. And his hosts here, the Arioscars. But this was no good. He came presented as the Paludiscars' friend and a gentleman, and naturally they accepted him as such. Why not admit that he felt at home with them, in this comfortable, quiet house, as he never felt at home in his two cold rooms in Krasnoy, eating bread and cheese by himself, and listening to the endless thud of Kune's loom. But that was no good either. The matter of comfort was irrelevant. The question of his right to be here, no question. The point was, what was he doing here? Was this one of the places to which he had come, as Krasnoy was? Again his mind sheared off from the matter, asking with self-pity if he might not have a little comfort in good company now and then, while he did what he had to do. But what it was he had to do he did not know. Leaning out the window, he gazed southward over the rooftops, straining his eyes as if he looked for something real and present beyond the moonlit wash of air. His mind was quite empty. He said aloud, Why am I wasting my time? He drew back, thinking he had seen a movement, someone looking up in the darkness under the trees. The air inside the room was close. He loosened his high stock, began to take off his coat, 
then shrugged it back on and with a cautious, decisive step left the room, went down the hall, down the stairs, through the music room, and out the side door of the house into the garden. There all was luminous and cool. The fountains sang, stars gleamed through budding branches. Rows of narcissus by the paths gleamed in the moonlight, and the warmer glow of the few lighted windows of the house. Itale walked to the fountain and stood watching the play of the water, then sat down on a bench near it, his hands in his pockets, his eyes still on the slender jet of water that seemed to hang suspended over the basin, catching the moonlight, falling and renewing in one motion, constant change in changelessness, alive. Itale? He got up quickly. It's hot in the house. I can't bear it. I can never sleep in spring. Her voice was no louder than the sound of the fountain. She had thrown a shawl over her light dress, and in the broken light and shade of the garden nothing of her was clear but her face, simplified by that mixed light into simple beauty. I wanted to talk to you ever since you came. There's never a moment... Are you content, Itale? Are you content with what you're doing? I wouldn't be doing anything else. But is your life what you want it to be? No, he said, and moved restlessly, clasping his hands behind his back. Louisa sat down on the bench, drawing the shawl around her shoulders. If you were free, no responsibilities, no duties, entirely free, what would you do? I can't imagine freedom without responsibility. Oh, bah, she said. How stuffy you can be. And how it helps you evade answering. If you were free to do exactly what you wanted to do, what would you do? In her voice was an impertinent tenderness, a note he had never heard before, and that struck him as her true note, herself speaking without defense, nervous, mocking, intent. I don't know, he said. I'd go home. Where is home? Malafrena. But the fact is, I am doing what I want to do. Your idea of freedom is a child's idea, Baronina. Probably. Women are all childlike, aren't they? And spiritual, too, of course. Perhaps my idea of freedom is spiritual. A bit ghostly. Choice without consequence. Well, I know what I would do if I were free, like a child or a ghost. I would do very nearly what I do now. Then you are happy. Very nearly happy. He had turned to face her, wanting to see her face, which was in shadow now. I imagine that only moral people like you are very happy or unhappy, she said. I am always both, and most of all on spring nights when I can't sleep and have to walk in the garden wondering what on earth would ever make me happy without making me unhappy. There is no reason why you should be unhappy. None at all, I know. I am young and rich and very well dressed, and in any case I am a woman, and it takes very little to make a woman happy, a toy or two, a necklace or a fan. I did not mean that, Itale said stiffly. What did you mean? He did not reply for a while. When he did, his tone was low and unwilling, without warmth. I meant, I don't want you to be unhappy. I know that. You want me to be happy. You want to think of me as happy because it is so much pleasanter and easier. If you think of me as unhappy, then you have to do something about it, find a toy to amuse me. If you are my friend, of course. You know I am your friend, Baronina. Don't call me Baronina, please. It's a stupid title. I suppose you believe all titles are stupid. Ours certainly is. I wish my grandfather had had the courage to appear as what he was, the best of his class. I should be proud to be an haute bourgeoise, nothing more and nothing less. But he had to buy us into the nobility and leave us clinging tooth and nail to the lowest rung of the rotten old ladder leading nowhere pretending that it isn't money that made us and makes us, and will take us wherever we do go. She looked up at Itale and laughed suddenly, a laugh of real amusement. Oh, God, Itale, you are infectious. Lectures in the moonlight. 
Do I lecture? Almost continually. I'm sorry, he said, chagrined. I don't mind. I like your lectures. At least they're serious. At least you talk seriously to me. Though whether you're talking to me, I often wonder. But at least you allow me to be present while you talk. Some day, perhaps, you will, in fact, talk to me. I don't... No, I know you don't. You never have. I don't know what you mean. I mean that under all the theories, the politics, the lectures, there is silence, a granite silence, unbroken. No, I take that back. I think you said something to me just a minute ago, and it took me so by surprise that I almost missed it. You said that you loved. But no, you didn't say it after all, now I think of it. I could simply hear in the way you said the name that you were finally talking about something to me. Something real. Not an idea. Not a theory. What name? Malafrena. He half turned away again towards the fountain, his hands deep in his pockets, and shrugged. I miss it sometimes, he said. She said nothing, watching him. It isn't far from here. He looked up as if he wanted to say more, but he did not say any more. She continued to watch him, the tall, hunched figure in front of her, the profile, big nose, mouth firmly closed, a portrait in charcoal, plain and strong. A few streets away the half-hour struck on the bells of Esnar Cathedral. A faint wind had come up, moving the leaves, making the air feel chill. In the house behind them a light went off silently, leaving the path they were on and the flowers beside it cold white. Though you don't talk to me, you talk to yourself sometimes. When? At your window a few minutes ago. You said, why am I wasting my time? That's why I asked you if you were happy, knowing that you weren't. She spoke very low in the silence after the bells. I don't know what I meant. It's almost frightening to hear someone say the very words you're thinking, but not say them to you. I wasn't talking about anything in particular. She stood up. I hate to watch men lie, she said, her voice a little more distinct. I hate anything done clumsily. But if you're not interested in the truth, why should I be? She turned to go. Her shawl had slipped from her shoulders and lay in a pool of silken white on the path. He picked it up. She had stopped at his movement. He set the shawl on her shoulders. As he did so, she turned towards him and reached up, taking his right hand, the delicate film of silk between their hands. They stood a moment, motionless. Louisa. Itale, she mocked him that discordant tenderness in her tone. He bent to kiss her mouth, the warm silk slipping beneath his hand, and she slipped away, broke from him, and turned to him again at a little distance. Her face was smooth as a bright mask. Her eyes were exultant and terrified. Good night, she whispered, and slipped away into the shadow, into the open door of the house. Itale stood there a while and then walked under the trees where he had seen her first. He came to the wall of the garden. He put his hands on it, then leaned against it, his forehead on his arm. For a minute he was intensely aware of himself, felt the rough brick against his palm, smelt the extreme sweetness of the narcissus blooming at his feet, saw the late serene night around him. Then it all slid away again and again returned, as if he were swimming in an invisible sea, warm, tumultuous, silent, from which he broke free long enough to breathe, feel his heart pounding, see the stars. Then he went under again. When the cathedral bell struck three, he turned slowly round and made his way to the house. He lay down on his bed fully dressed, and immediately, as if knocked out, went to sleep. Next day he went about the business that had brought him to Esnar, if it was business that had brought him to Esnar. He did not consider the question. He considered nothing that was not directly under his nose. As soon as one conference or conversation was over he forgot it and went on to the next. He was, if anything, more decisive and efficient than usual, 
but at any given hour he could not have said without an effort of thought what he had been doing an hour earlier, or perhaps what he was doing now. One person he met broke through his insulation, an Italian exile for his part in the Piedmont Revolt of 1820 who had spent a year in Esnar and was about to set off for England. Something in this man reached Itale, and afterwards he recalled vividly San Giusto's long face, high forehead, curly hair, his cordial voice as they sat at a café table in the leaf-dappled late sunlight on Fontermana Street. A liberal is a man who says the means justify the end, he said, and the words too stayed with Itale. The light got lower, dustier, more golden down the tree-arched street. A few carriages rolled by slowly. The wind smelled of ploughed fields, and the moon rose over the old houses. Itale went back to supper with his hosts. Luisa's cousin was a cold, shy woman, and Arioscar had little conversation in him. Enrique was dining elsewhere. Luisa, whose manners were as good as she wanted them to be, kept up just enough talk that no one felt awkward, to the evident gratitude of the Arioscars. Coffee was served upstairs at ten, and at ten-fifteen the evening ended. It was now Holy Week. There would be no more parties until Easter was passed. Back in his room, Itale did not open the window or look out of it. He took off his coat, sat down at the escritoire, and began going through a pile of local and foreign pamphlets and manuscripts he had gathered in the course of the day. He read steadily, annotating occasionally, never raising his head. The room was bright with candles, but chilly, as he had let the little fire go out. The bell of the cathedral, a soft, deliberate baritone, struck midnight. Itale hunched his shoulders and went on reading. "'There must be no confusion,' said the pamphlet, "'of such manifestations of radicalism as the secret societies of France, Italy, and the Germanies, nor such excesses of radical opinion as the revolutionary leagues of the last decade in England, with the liberal faction in our own country, which the government of Orsinia not only tolerates, but will indubitably come to favor as a benign and harmless indication of peaceful popular enlightenment. To forbid the publication of... Itali went back and crossed out the word faction, crossed out indubitably, scowled and crossed out the entire sentence, then put the thing aside and put his head in his hands. He got up, went about the room putting out the candles, took up his coat, went downstairs and out. The air was colder tonight. The moon, a night past full, was veiled by a slight mist. The jet of the fountain blew astray now and again in the slight breeze. Itale stood by the stone bench, looking at the narcissus blooming at his feet. He heard the latch of the house door. Luisa came to him, a long dark scarf wrapped about her over her light dress. I heard you she whispered with a laugh in her voice. I was listening for you. Baronina, Domital, she mocked. I cannot call you Luisa. She sat down on the stone bench, drawing the dark, voluminous scarf up about her neck, smoothing the fall of it across her skirt. And what else can you not do? You are unjust, he said. Am I? but then I'm only a woman. No one expects justice from a woman. As you can't call me by my name, so I can't treat you with justice. You are unjust to yourself. Am I? she said again, but without anger, thoughtfully. I wonder. You may be right. She looked up at him with so direct a gaze that he could not turn from it. You have the power to hurt me. How strange that is. I have no wish to hurt you. Don't you understand? No. I have no power to— You know what I am, he said desperately, and how I live and where I live. What of it? He could not answer. I am not asking you for manners. I am not asking you for mercy. I am asking you for the truth. To speak to me, just once, to speak to me. What can I say? The fountain, blown aside by the wind, rustled and pattered. "'What good would it do if I said it?' he asked in anguish. "'None,' Louisa whispered. "'None.' 
She rocked herself a little, holding her arms about her sides, drawn into herself. All we can do is hurt each other. It's no good. She rose suddenly, reaching out to him. His first response was startled and awkward, as her movement had been awkward. Then he held her to him more strongly. Their inept embrace became searching. Her tension melted into yielding, fused towards him till they clung together, pressed together in an insatiable kiss. From it she broke at last, twisting away blindly, he reaching blindly after her. With control, a reaction of momentary shock and sickness came into him, and he sank down on the bench and sat bowed forward, his head down. She stood nearby, her body trembled slightly from time to time. She watched him. When he looked up, he did not meet her eyes, but spoke to her arms in an angry, pleading whisper. Don't you see? Do you see now, at last? When he understood her, his expression began to change from dazed to dazzled. He stood up, and putting out his hands towards her in an uncertain gesture, said, incredulous and gentle, Louisa. Ah, she said. There. She took his hands and held them, standing facing him, separate, smiling, her face raised. I will be just, she whispered with that exulting smile. I will be merciful. He could say nothing coherent, but stammered praise and desire. She took his arm and walked with him up and down the path and across the lawn to the garden wall and back to the fountain. Most of his consciousness was centered upon the warmth of her arm and her side, and the warm, faint fragrance of her hair. He agreed without hesitation when she said, Now we can choose. What I can't bear, what I can't bear is falseness, dishonesty, the stupid rules made for stupid people, the rules of lying. What I want is the truth, and only the truth. I love you, he said. We are not children, and not fools, and not slaves. We can choose what we do. That is what I want, that's all I want, the freedom to choose. Do you understand, Itale? Yes, he said, because she was so eager and intense, because she wanted freedom, happiness, as he did, because the pressure of her arm on his made his head swim with happiness. If you judged me now, she continued in her intense whisper, I would despise you, but you won't. All you do, all your friends and their ideas, they're trivial, but you're above them, above all that. There's no freedom but what one makes oneself for oneself. He agreed. And that's why we must choose, Itale, this week. I go back to Krasnoy Wednesday. You'll come a week later. That's enough time. We must each choose, both choose, what we wish to do, no one and nothing forbidding us or compelling us. I will use my life and my love as I see fit to use it. We will set each other free, Itale. The tremor in her voice might be exultation or terror. He drew her to him and kissed her mouth. But as her lips softened against his, she began to draw away. He let her go. She whispered, Only a week. Before he realized she was going, she had gone, a glimmer between moonlight and darkness on the path. Louisa, he said, wait. The house door opened and shut quietly. He stood there by the fountain, bereft and confused. Why had she gone? Had he misunderstood again? Were they not lovers or to be lovers? He had understood her as she spoke, as she spoke of freedom, but now he did not know what she'd said. A light glimmered faintly behind curtains in a room upstairs, her candle, her bedroom. He sat down on the stone bench once more, shivering with cold and the aftershocks of frustrated desire, groping after the immense happiness he had felt only a minute before. A week, he repeated, finding the words a talisman, only a week. 3. 
On Saturday afternoon, Itale cut short a meeting with the author of what he thought of as the indubitably pamphlet, alleging another obligation. I have to see someone out in the country, he said abruptly. The author of the pamphlet, in awe of conspiracies, asked no questions. Itale left the house and walked straight down the street. He had no objective at all. Townhouses gave place to villas set back behind low walls. Villas gave place to farmhouses in open fields, and the paving blocks of the street to the red dirt of a country road. Overhead stretched a wide, changeable April sky, reflected underfoot in long puddles left from the morning's rain. Weeds bloomed coarse and timid by the fences. Grain and grass were bright green on the plowlands. The road, very long and straight, the Roman road that had crossed the western province to the garrison at Aque Nervi, was empty. The fields were empty, except for a lone plowman who silently answered Itale's silent salutation from the road. It was a gentle land, monotonous, noble in its coherent and unbroken vastness from horizon to horizon. Itale walked straight on, vaguely contented by the fresh wind and the rough road under his feet, noticing more clearly from time to time a wild iris, a cloud shadow fading across a field, a lark playing in the high air, a rain-washed stone. In four days he would go back to Krasnoy. His mind revolved perpetually about the end of that trip. What would he do? What should he do? He was sick of thinking about it, and never ceased to think about it. How had he let himself be involved in an unsuitable, an impossible affair like this? A marriageable heiress, a spectacular woman who could not possibly manage to have a lover without her brother, and probably half a dozen of her suitors finding out about it. And if they did not, she might very well tell them, for she was nervous, capricious, insanely willful, spoilt, a spoilt girl, a proud, sensitive, frightened girl, a woman risking herself, offering him everything and asking nothing in return, nothing but that his courage equal hers. It was freedom she wanted, liberty. What did all his work for liberty amount to? Two rooms on Molena Strada, an irregularly published journal of very uneven quality, a succession of jobs taken to keep the rent paid, a circle of feckless and unstable acquaintances all professing devotion to the cause but quarreling about it continually. And was this to be his life? Was this what he had left Malafrena for? For a liberal, the means justify the end. To attain freedom, one must live free. It was freedom she wanted, freedom she offered, and he was already so lost among contingencies, petty considerations, and conventional moralities, that he could consider rejecting that offer. Was he a man or not? Not yet, maybe. He had been a boy until now. He had come at last into his majority. He was and would be a man. But which man? A hand-to-mouth radical journalist or a baroness's lover? Why could he not be both? Was he supposed to live celibate for the cause of liberty? Was it a religion and he its holy hypocrite? He strode through the bright fields of afternoon in a rage, sometimes waving his right arm as he argued fiercely with himself. And all the while he knew in the center of his heart that he might or might not go to Luisa Paludiscar when he returned to Krasnoy, but that it was not reason that would or could make the choice. Reasons abounded, but within him something single, whole, indifferent, waited for a sign. The road led up and over one of the long low rises of land that made up the immense level of the plain. So gradual was the ascent that slope and summit were all one. Itale stopped and looked back. Esnar lay five or six miles away, made entire by distance. Tile roofs red in the declining light, the calm towers of the cathedral rising above blue shadow. Near where he stood was the ruin of a hut, a few stones and rain-rotted planks. He sat down there on what had been a doorstep or a hearthstone between the city and the sun. The blowing of the country wind had finally blown his thoughts away. For a long time he sat, hearing only the wind in the new grass. He sought stillness of heart, the void, the gap, the silence that had been his kingdom in the sunlit afternoons of the years at Malafrena. That was liberty, but it was gone. He had lost it. 
He turned to look southward. The same long plains ran varied and changeless as the sea to a soft haze on the horizon. What would you do if you had seven hundred years to live? There they were, Laura in a glimmering white dress, Piera and himself on the terrace in late midsummer dusk, the hunter standing dark across the blurred and shining lake. He said he would travel to China and America. Laura wanted volcanoes. And Piera. What was it she had wanted to do? But what the devil Piera was in Esnar. She was not there in a remembered dusk above the lake any more than he was. She was here, under one of those red-tiled roofs in some convent school. The Belinen he had met at the Marchioness's house was her cousin. Itale stood up, stretched, and started back to town. He could not stay in the same town with Piera Valtorskar for two weeks and leave without a sign to her. Things weren't that bad with him yet. At about five he was at the Belinen's front door. "'The Countess is not here today, sir,' said the old servant, polite but mistrustful of the dusty stranger. Itale asked where he might find her. "'The Countess lives in the Ursuline School, sir, on the old side, facing the Ring Fountain. The Countess, the Countess. Young Piera with freckles on her neck. Itale marched off across Fantarmana Street to the Ring Fountain. There was a big, tight-lipped building with barred windows. A porter opened to his knock and said there were no visiting hours on Easter Eve, come next Saturday. Itale pleaded the fact that he must leave on Wednesday, and his right hand put a small silver piece in the porter's, without his left hand knowing a thing about it. He was shown into an icy parlor containing four straight-back chairs and one nun. He pleaded with the nun. An older nun was called, and he pleaded with her, eloquently tactful. He was, as he had been since he got to his feet in the ruined hut on the hill, determined. The second nun went away, the first retired to a chair in the hall just outside the open door, and Piera came in. "'Oh, Itale!' she said, and they put their arms round each other and kissed each other on the mouth. "'Oh, my dear Itale!' she said, tears in her eyes, laughing, in the first great flash of joy that ran through them both. And then they dropped their arms and did not know what to do with them. "'My God, how did I even know you?' he said, still dazzled by the flash. And she laughed again. "'Don't swear here. I've grown two inches nearly. It's like coming home to see you, Piera. I know. To see you, too. And you still talk malafrain. Come and sit down. We don't have to stand. Her last words were conventionally gracious. Chill grew where the bright warmth had been. Itale sat down on one of the rigid chairs. I can't sit down, he said, standing up again at once. And Piera giggled. The last flare. It went out. It's very strange to see you here, he said, looking about the room, his hands behind his back. I know. Four walls, four chairs, two doors. He had to look back at her. How long have you been in Esnar? Ten days. I should have come before. I've been seeing a lot of people. Time gets away. Sorry I caused all this regulation breaking. Anything rather than not seeing you at all. Do you like it here? Yes, it's very nice. When will you go home? I'll leave here in June and stay with the Belinens for a while, she said. Her voice was hesitant. She stood hesitant, yet calm, in her sleek gray dress and white apron. Will you not tell anyone? I mean, write them, please, Itale, because there hasn't been time yet for Papa's letter to come. My letter went on the last post. I wanted to tell you... I won't be going home exactly, either. I'm going to live in Esnar. I'm engaged to be married, this coming winter, or perhaps after Easter next year. I see. I'm very glad for you, he said, with a prolonged stammer. Who is... Jivan Coste. He's a lawyer. Do you know the Belinens? They've been so kind to me. I'm so fond of them. He's a friend of theirs. It's all going to be as quiet as can be since he's a widower with a little boy. He did not remember her voice being so thin, or so sweetly modulated, a young lady voice. I'm very fond of him, of Batiste, she said. That was very nice. 
Everything was nice. Everyone was kind and fond. Why was she telling him all this? Let her get on with it and marry her damned widower. What was it to him? I suppose that's the end of it, he said. Of what, Itale? He waved his arm. Knowing each other. The part of life when we knew each other. It doesn't have to be, she said in that thin voice. If you come to Esnar, I hope you'd come see me. And we might be at Malafrena again, Summers. But we've left Malafrena, he said. It's taken me a while to learn that. Life's not a room, it's a road. What you leave, you leave, and it's lost. You can't turn back. That's how it is. We most likely won't meet again. Perhaps not, she said. There was a considerable pause. Are you happy in Krasnoy? she asked. Happy? No, not particularly, I suppose. I'm doing what I went to do there. I see your journal sometimes. They let you read seditious papers here? He looked about with a hard grin at the walls and doors. Not here. Your articles are very interesting. Why the situation of linen weavers in Krasnoy slums should be interesting to you, I don't know, but thanks. He had heard the valor in her tone. He heard the hypocrisy in his own. He could endure no more. I must go now, Piera, he said flatly. She turned towards him. Goodbye, he said, and she took his hand and said, Goodbye, Itale. That was that. Outside, by the double-tiered, silver-stranded ring fountain, he looked at his watch. It said two-thirty as usual, but the cathedral bell had just struck. It must be six. He was late for an appointment he had made with two likely contributors to Novesma Verba. He set off hastily to the café where they were to meet. Life's a road, he heard his voice saying, fatuously, fraudulently. Life's not a room, it's a road. Yes, yeah, sure enough, a road going nowhere, on and on, meaningless. No turning back, no stopping, no end, no goal. Best to go alone, allowing no claims. Let the dead bury their dead. The two men he met at the café were young, one an ex-seminarian, the other an unsuccessful candidate for representative to the National Assembly, which was to be convened this September in Krasnoy. Itale's unmoved familiarity with their hopes and questions left them impressed and admiring. He saw that and grew still more dry and hard in his replies, but they would not be discouraged. He left them as soon as he could and went to the hotel to which he had moved when the Paludiscars left. He had a chop sent up to his room and went through the last few days' notes and papers. His fortnight in Isnar was proving profitable. There was money here for the support of both journals. There were contributors of talent, and the prosperous middle class of the city followed the liberal tradition established in the last century. It was all very encouraging. Drearily he got his work in order, ate the dinner he had allowed to get cold, sat down again to work. One had to go alone. No use looking for anything one had left behind. Take what happiness might come, get the work done, and no complaining. It was the only way. Alone. To be free, one had to be alone. He was getting a headache, and to shake it off he went out around eleven to walk. As he went down Fontamana Street, all black dappled with shadows of branches cast by lighted windows, alive with the night wind and a quiet coming and going of people, someone hailed him from a café table. The Italian exile, San Giusto. Have a coffee with me, Sorde. Itale stopped by the table, but did not sit down. I was thinking of looking in the cathedral. Ah, it's Easter. I'll come, you don't mind. My bill, please. Five coffees. They went on together. Monday I leave to go to England, said San Justo. Now I don't want to go. I speak the language better, but I like your country. I like Kresnoy. I like this Esnar. I don't know why I go to England. He laughed, showing his strong white teeth. Only at times it's good to get out from the Empire, nay? Eh? But I shall come back, I think. I hope they'll let you in after we've published your articles from England. Oh, here I'm even more insignificant than in my country, and your police are not so good as those in the Piedmont. 
But I shall not stop in Vienna to obtain permission. What if we use a false name on your articles? Why not? I have been Carlo Franceschi in Turin already. You look tired, Sorde. I am. And I'm full of coffee like a ship that's sinking. Every night I drink coffee. What else to do? He laughed again. What a life! Look at the poor devils. They want to be home in their Bohemia or where they come from. They had passed a pair of militiamen imposing in the imperial uniform. Like all of us, Easter night, we would go to mass in the boat across the lake. What lake? Lago Dorta, San Giusto said, lingering on the name with conscious love, saying it with pleasure, tenderness. They approached the doors of the cathedral, which stood open, showing a glimpse of dusk and gold within. A little procession was crossing the cathedral square, coming from Old Side, nuns and girls, heavily shawled. Itale recognized the gray uniform Piera had worn. She was among the tall girls at the end of the line, no doubt, head bent submissively as she walked. She would not see him, nor could he tell which of the slender, shawled figures she might be. "'Pretty ducklings,' said San Justo. "'I see them take their walk in the afternoons, so neat, with bright eyes, seeing everything like telescopes. I like the girls of convent schools. They always know so much. Excuse me, you feel religious?' It made Itale laugh. "'No,' he said. "'I should like to see your mountains where you came from. As you spoke of them yesterday, I thought this sounds like my country.' I wish I could take you there, San Justo. Oh, well, the time will come. If you wait, the time comes, I find. To learn how to wait, that's the job of the exile, isn't it? I will remember your invitation, Sorde. Thank you. Come on, the Mass begins. They went into the church, into the grieving, the waiting, the fulfillment of Easter night. Christ is risen, the choir sang, the music like sunrise in the heart of night. Christ is risen in glory, and the joy washed over Itale's heart like rain on a stone of the roads, like sunlight over stone. 4. Country women, starting home from the great market of Krasnoy, where they had arrived at dawn to sell stuff from their suburban gardens and dairies, leeks, apples, eggs, cream cheese, were halted on this morning of early September as they straggled back towards Cathedral Square with their empty baskets, to meet up with the farm wagons going home. Foreign militia and a squad of the palace guard in their crimson uniforms were blocking one street, clearing another, shouting orders. Cockades nodded between horses nervously working ears. Gilt buttons flashed in the misty sunshine, already growing warm. Those people who had got nearly to the square before they were stopped in a crowd could see a whole battalion of guardsmen drawn up in rows before the doors of the cathedral. "'Don't they all stand there like red ten-pins?' said a broad good wife of Grasse to her neighbor. "'Let them stand all they like. I'm sick of standing,' said the tall and skinny neighbor, shifting her basket on her arm. "'I'd just as soon not be standing next to your goat cheeses, mother,' put in her neighbor on the other side, a man in a cobbler's apron with a smiling mouth, pursed and lopsided, from holding ready all the shoe-nails of all the years. "'Stick to your last, cobbler!' the skinny woman said smartly. "'Is it a parade?' shrilled the gap-toothed daughter of the woman from Grasse. "'Oh, dear little Jesus, remember the Holy Sacrament Parade in Grasse, Ma, and all the grand gold things? What's assembly, Ma?' "'How would I know?' said Ma. "'Do you know what all the crowding and the soldiers are about, cobbler?' "'City folk idling,' the skinny wife snarled. "'It's a great day, mother,' said the cobbler, his mouth doing its best to stretch back to normal. "'Didn't you know? We've all turned out to see the assembly go by.' "'Who'd have turned out?' said an irritated clerk, squeezed up against the cobbler by the growing throng behind, if the damned guards hadn't started pushing people around. I've been in the office now if they just let me alone with their damned horses.' It was ten o'clock. The people at Cathedral Square heard the bell of St. Stephen's under the hill, the bell of St. Rock's in Old Quarter, but not the great bell of the cathedral. It was silent until at nearly quarter past the hour the whole carillon gave a mighty hair-raising triumphant clash, and then settled into pealing tremendously treble down to bass, treble down to bass. 
"'What the devil's all that about?' the nervous clerk said, while the farm women crossed themselves. "'It means the benediction of the assembly is over,' said the knowledgeable cobbler. "'Now watch, old woman. You'll see him coming out and heading up Tiponti Street to the park.' "'What's the benediction of the assembly, ma?' the gap-toothed daughter squealed. "'Oh, look! Look! Oh, dear little body of Jesus! Look at em all!' The assembly of the three estates of the kingdom came forth from the cathedral of St. Theodora in the order prescribed by the revision of 1509. The archbishop and his college of canons and the deputies of the clergy of the ten provinces, in order of rank, in robes befitting the season of the ecclesiastical year. Following these, the deputies of the nobility of the ten provinces, in armor or suitable attire, in order of rank, each attended by a squire bearing visibly the arms of the house. Lastly, the deputies of the commons, in black gowns and hats of cloth or fur, though not of ermine or of sable. The whole to be attended and duly honored in their progress to the palace by the royal guard, and to be met and greeted there by the king, the rector of the royal university of the city of Krasnoy, the mayor of the city of Krasnoy, and the masters of the eight great guilds. They went by in their robes and top hats. Far off in the park a trumpet sounded sweetly. A few cheers went up for known faces among the commoners, the city's own deputies, and Oragon, the deputy from Rakova. As soon as the cordons were raised, the people scattered, a few following the procession across the park, the farm women across the square to meet their wagons, the clerks to their offices, the cobblers to their lasts. Inside the Sinalia Palace, in the large cold assembly room like a marble barn, the convocation proceeded in good order. The deputies sat, the officers of the guard stood armed at each door. Grand Duchess Maria pronounced in Latin the sovereign's address of welcome. Up in the gallery a kind of pigeon coat to the marble barn, twenty men stood gasping for air and jammed elbow to rib, trying to see out the four two-foot loopholes that gave on the assembly room below. The gallery had been built to accommodate a few court secretaries, not a score of eager reporters. "'And I asked to get into this hell-hole,' moaned Brillevi. "'Pressed goose!' He was there with a pass, stamped by six officials of the Bureau of Censorship, the militia, the palace, etc., and issued to the scandal-sheet of court confidences and city gossip that employed him. Freynan had got a similar pass for his Catholic monthly, which carried parish news and inspirational readings for priests. Itale had the pass for Novesma Verba. The rest were reporters for the government's organ, the Courier Mercury, or lookers-on with connections in the ducal court who had wangled themselves passes out of curiosity or self-importance. Jivan Karantai stood next to Itale and watched, fascinated, the chopping motions of the Grand Duchess's long chin as she read her Latin address. Karantai's novel, The Young Man Live, published in the spring, had made an unprecedented hit. He had become something of a national figure. The government in Vienna did not like national figures, but knew when not to meddle with them. Karantai had got a pass signed by Prime Minister Cornelius simply by asking for it. The Grand Duchess droned to a close. It must be four-thirty, Brelevi groaned. The rector of the university, dark-jowled and tremendous in his gold-faced doctor's gown, strode to the rostrum. Oh, miserere domine, Brelevi moaned to him. The rector laid a roll of papers down on the rostrum, placed his hands upon it, and began to deliver his speech extempore. One thin, clerkish reporter for the Courier Mercury was making notes. Itale tried to do the same, referring for help to Brelevi, who had been a Latin first prize in Solari. Brelevi moaned and recited Virgil. Mugitusque boom, he said. Why are you scribbling, Itale? It's only mugitus boom. Moo, moo, he bellowed inaudibly at the rector. The clerkish reporter, scribbling, hissed malevolently for silence in the gallery. After the rector's oratund half-hour, the mayor of Krasnoy rose and made a short Ciceronian address, of which he evidently understood not a word, reading it in bursts of syllables like random gunfire. Then, in place of the masters of the great guilds, which had been disbanded, as had all workingmen's associations, came the prime minister of the Grand Duchy, Johann Cornelius, 
who spoke pleasantly and fluently in good Germanic Latin for twenty minutes. The courier's prize scholar took it down in shorthand. Itale desperately made notes. Forget it, Brelavai whispered. That's not shorthand. He's trying to scare us. It's just hen tracks. What if somebody says something important? Itale protested. Nobody will, said Freynan. The speeches of welcome were over. The assembly was adjourned for lunch. At the Café Illyrica everybody was gathered, awaiting the four reporters, vociferous with questions about what had gone on in the assembly's first session. Mooing, Brelavai said. All the others shouted, argued, questioned, answered. The four who had been in the Sinalia were rather silent. They had known the assembly would speak in Latin, they had known it would begin with formalities, but the day had been a very long time coming and was half over already, and it had amounted to nothing, nothing at all. A pageant, a fraud. Itale got back in a corner of the turbulent restaurant with Carantai. The novelist's good-humored equanimity was a refuge to him from the indiscriminate and beery enthusiasm of the Illyrica crowd. Carantai combined passion and patience to an unusual degree. He was an ardent and reliable constitutionalist and republicanist, ready to risk his already brilliant career for the cause, but unwilling ever to close his intelligence to unwelcome fact. There was a toughness in him that was increasingly welcome to Itale, and it was an endearing quality, that toughness or pragmatism, because Carantai's novel was wildly, dramatically, wholeheartedly romantic, implausible and magnanimous. And yet, like its author, in no way was it dishonest. In the complexity of the likeness and unlikeness of the author in his work, Itale saw some adumbration of the complex relations of the real and the ideal, and he also saw a good deal that made him like Carantide better, the better he knew him. They drank their beer now and did not say very much, while the old Illyrican shouted as ever about his mistress liberty. Back in their chill, airless gallery they watched the deputies resume their seats, a member of each estate was to speak, thanking the Crown for convening the assembly. The Grand Duchess's seat was now empty. Sovereignty had made its gesture. Johann Cornelius, slender and grey-haired, with a benevolent smile, took his place to the right of the empty chair, and the ornate Latin speeches were addressed to him, since the Grand Duchess was absent. And since Metternich is also absent, said Freynan, we thank the puppet minister of a puppet duchess vassal to a puppet emperor controlled by a German chancellor for his kindness in letting us speak a dead language together for six hours a day, according to the ancient custom of our people. My God, why are we standing here watching a puppet show? The senior prelate of Orsinia, the archbishop of Esnar, opened the order of the day at last. Itale had seen him last in Esnar Cathedral on Easter night a stiff golden figure in a glory of lights and singing. In church Latin, in a thin voice, he opened the meeting and placed before the deputies the suggestion that they vote unanimous thanks to the Grand Duchess for the convocation. A speaker rose from the seats to the left. The archbishop conferred with assistants, and finally said cautiously in Latin, We recognize the deputy. My lord, bishop, my lords and gentlemen, my fellow deputies, the speaker said, sonorously, not in Latin, but in their own tongue. I propose this emendation of the motion before us. The assembly of the nation will vote thanks to the sovereign, the vote to be taken and the resolution stated in the vernacular language of the nation. There was silence, then an outbreak of voices. My lord bishop, please call for order. I still have the floor. My name is Oragon. Deputy to the Third Estate, elected by the Provincial Assembly of the Polana Province. I speak not for my province only, but for my country, to you who have met here in the name of that country. I speak of our rights and of our sacred duties. The powerful, assured voice rose, letting the words fill the cold, empty spaces of the assembly room. My country, my people, our rights, our responsibilities. Any word long unspoken, forbidden, gathers in it all the strength of silence. That strength, the strength of years, filled Oragon's speech, and he knew it and spoke on unhesitating, knowing also that his might be the first and last such speech made in that room. Up in the gallery they were all trying to get his words down verbatim. As fast as he spoke, Itale wrote, 
for he knew the speech already. He had learned it years ago in the quiet, dark library of the house at Malafrena, the speech that has used so many words in so many languages over the years, but can all be said in four. Live free or die. Oragon spoke for forty minutes, and when he finished his voice was hoarse, the audience was dazed, and Itale dropped the pencil he could not hold any more. Carantai retrieved it and the notebook, for the assembly was in a noteworthy state. Speakers arose on every side, the poor archbishop's eyes rolled. Cornelius had sat quietly through Oragon's speech. Like Itale, he had heard it before, and, unlike Itale, he believed its day was done. But as the debate went on in the vernacular, half out of control and increasingly tumultuous, the Prime Minister began to look grim. Enthusiasm and disorder were his enemies. During an incoherently martial and patriotic speech by a baron from the Sovena, Cornelius rose and consulted softly with the Archbishop. Oragon stood up again, his big, coarse voice used to addressing all kinds of meetings indoors and out, cut through the baron's speech. My Lord Bishop, I request that we return to the order of the assembly of the kingdom. Herr Cornelius, not being a deputy to any estate, is a guest in this assembly, without right to speak, unless permission be granted by a majority of the deputies present. Cornelius walked back to his seat through a cowed yet sardonic silence. I waive my opportunity to request permission to speak, he said, without raising his voice, heard only by the clergy in the front rows. Let discussion proceed, please. But the marshal baron was now tongue-tied. Somebody called out, Take the vote on Mr. Oragon's proposal. My lords and gentlemen, the archbishop said, further debate and the vote must be adjourned. It is past five o'clock. With the... A Kresnoy deputy was on his feet. Excuse me, excuse me, I think we vote on whether to adjourn session. The archbishop rubbed his forehead, setting his archiepiscopal hat askew, and said, I must implore your patience. I have not yet become entirely familiar with my duties as president of the assembly. I will now propose that the members of the assembly vote on closing this day's session. A clerk popped up next to him like a jack-in-the-box. Sick et non, he shouted. Sick? Hold on, somebody shouted from among the nobility. Finish the business on hand. I want to be recognized. After a long stretch of amputated orations and confusion, a vote on adjournment was taken and had to be counted. One hundred and forty voted to remain in session. One hundred and thirty-one voted to adjourn. Forty-seven abstained. The archbishop ruled that the session be suspended two hours for dinner, and this was accepted. That does it, said Brelevi. There goes stuff, come back sleepy, and vote to carry on further debates in Sanskrit. But when the proposal was finally put to the vote at eleven that night, there were less than a dozen voices in favor of Latin. A second proposal introduced by Oragon as connected to the first, which, by changing certain rules of procedure in the provincial diets, would give the third estate a majority in the assembly, was shelled by the archbishop who had evidently been crammed along with his dinner on how to spot subversive tactics and control them by using parliamentary procedures. On this note of obscure victory, the session was adjourned. Itale and Carantai left the others at the Illyrica and went to the old quarter, to the Heliscar house. They were greeted with champagne and cheers by George Heliscar, Luisa, Enrique, Estenscar, and others of the liberal circle. Well, did ye declare war on Austria? demanded the old count, George Heliscar's father. The old count, a colonel of the defunct National Army, had held his last command at Leipzig under the Grand Army of the French Empire. Itale first met him two years before, when he had yielded to George Heliscar's repeated invitation and come to his house for supper. The place was very much grander and austerer than the Paludiscars, and the occasion had been a fairly formal one. Itale and his most defiant had played the didactic Republican. George Heliscar had been too busy as host to rescue him from the morass of offended silence in which he had gradually and ineluctably foundered. As he sat in self-imposed exile in the farthest corner of the vast drawing-room, the old count had come over to him, walking slowly and heavily, and sat down. "'I knew your grandfather,' he said. "'Itale Sorde of Malafrena.' Itale had stared at him, 
too involved at first with detesting himself and everyone else there to understand. George has spoken of you, but I didn't place the name till I saw you, the old man went on. You look like him. Where? Where did you know him, sir? Paris. I was a young fellow. He was near forty. We came home about the same time. He back to the estate, I to take my commission. We wrote for some years. I suppose he's been dead these many years. He died in 1810. I never knew a man like him. The old man spoke gravely, his eyes fixed on Itale. What was he doing in Paris, sir? Living there as you're living here. There were a lot of us foreigners in Paris in the seventies. There always are. Polish exiles, best swordsmen I ever saw. Germans, us, and the French to keep us all talking. And we talked. A deal of blood and water is run under the bridges since young fellows used to sit about in coffee shops discussing the social contract in the shadow of the Bastille, eh, Mr. Sorde? Everything is changed. Everything. But we still have the social contract, said Itale, without defiance. Eh? Oh, aye, we do, and much good it's done us. That was another age, Mr. Sode, a golden age, milk and honey, before the milk went sour. I wasn't in Paris in ninety-three to see the butchers, but I was in Vienna in fifteen and saw the vultures. It was your grandfather that showed me that golden age and told me about the new world that was coming, and a grand world it was before it came. But what became of him? back to his vineyards, and dies there like any farmer on his land. And I to take my four hundred to be cut to pieces for Napoleon at Leipzig, and come home to sit here and watch the vultures gobble. Well, time hasn't run out yet, sir, Itale said, blowing his nose. Part of his ill temper at the beginning of the evening had been due to a severe cold. He was always getting cold since he lived in Melanestrada. It has for us here. Go to America, you young fellows, and find the new world there with the savages. But don't waste your time here. If there's a new world, it's here. Here or nowhere, always, Itale said. And the old man said equally fiercely, All right, it's your time and your right to say that. The good years of my life were those years in Paris before the Revolution. I don't forget that, Mr. Sorde, though I don't believe what Itale Sorde and I believe then, that all it takes to bring the golden age is hard work and good will. It takes more than that. But let me never say to a young man that it can't be done at all. He pounded his chair arm with a big fist, spotted brown with age, and glared around at Itale, his son George, who had joined them, and the receding perspectives of the salon, dotted with beautifully dressed amicably chattering guests. Since that night he and Itale had been friends, linked always in Itale's thought and the old Count's memory by that other Itale, who lay beside the chapel of St. Anthony under the pines of Malafrena. And Itale had first admitted a liking for George Hellescar when he saw the younger man's pride in and tenderness toward the irascible, frail old soldier. This night Count Hellescar recalled the last meeting of the estates in 1796. They were trying to choose a king then, and went all the pieces over it. Maybe they'll do better at getting rid of a grand duchess, eh? He laughed like a wolfhound barking. Among his son's radical friends, he enjoyed stating the most extreme opinions, outdoing the young men in attacking Austria, the Metternich system, censorship, the Senalia court, and so on. The emotion was real, but the opinions, if he tried to defend them rationally, disintegrated. At their root was only esteem for courage, scorn for opportunists, and the bitter pessimism of a nobleman who saw his class becoming obsolete, and an officer whose last battle had been lost. Estensgar joined them. Old Hellesgar did not like the poet, but was polite to him as to all guests of the house, a forced, fine courtesy that reminded Itale painfully of his own father. Others came over. Not Luisa, though she had signified with one glance as Itale entered that she wanted to see him tonight. 
The old count had some records of the 96th convocation and took the group to his study to look these up. Like everyone else, he had, after the day's unlooked-for triumph, begun to hope great things of the assembly. He and Estenskar talked vehemently. Itale listened. It had been a long day. George Heliskar looked in on them and had a bottle of brandy brought in with the message to restore the deputy from the fourth estate. Itale drank a little and fell fast asleep, deep in a leather armchair. The others left without disturbing him. An hour went by very quietly in the oak-paneled study, no sound but the tick of the clock and the crackle of the fire. Louisa came in, moving softly. She wore black. Her mother had died in July after cruel illness, through which Louisa had cared for her. It was a suspicion of that illness that had brought her back from Esnar before Easter. She had said nothing of it to Itale then, and as little as possible about it since. She spoke plainly of her mother's death as a release, and showed no grief. She had lost the robust, radiant quality of beauty she had had at twenty when Itale first saw her. She was thin, and looked thinner still in black, and rather pale. Her bearing was tense and proud. She stood beside the armchair for some little while, watching the face of the sleeping man, his hands that still laxly cupped the empty brandy glass on his lap. Her face showed no expression but watchfulness. At last she took the glass from his hands, and as he woke she said, Can you come tonight? He stared, shook his head, rubbed a hand over his face and hair, yawned, and said aloud, What? She set the glass down on the table, went over to the bookcases, and repeated, half turned from him, Can you come tonight? What time is it? He pulled out his watch. Two-thirty? About two. Did I fall asleep? Listen, has Karantai left? We have to get to the office tonight and write up the report. Verba goes to press Wednesday afternoon. That's tomorrow. Today now. Listen, tomorrow night, Louisa. He struggled out of the deep chair and went towards her. She did not turn to him, but moved on along the shelves, looking at the titles of books. I'll be at court tomorrow night, she said. Here he is, George, the sleeping beauty wakened by my kiss. Don't you wish you'd gone to sleep, too? No, said young Heliskar. You'd probably have bitten me. All the radical elements in the Salon are looking for you, Sorday. We have to get this issue set up so the censor can look it over. Last week they took fifty-six hours to pass it. Come on with us, Heliskar. These all-night bouts are entertaining. Refreshed and wide awake, Itale's vitality was as bright and warm as the fire on the hearth. And George Heliskar said, All right, if I won't be in the way. We'll put you to work, don't worry. Good night, Baronina, he said gaily, frankly using her title as he always did before other people. "'Will you forgive the absconding host?' George Heliskar asked her with his friendly effrontery. She smiled and said, "'I have been trying to make Enrique take me home this hour. Enjoy yourselves. Do you really think the censor will let you print anything now?' But Itale had met up with Carantai at the doorway and did not hear her, or pretended not to hear her. 5. From the first time she saw him, fresh off the Montana coach, bewildered and out of place in her salon, Louisa had been afraid of him. Everything about him frightened her. His height, his blue eyes, his big nose, his strong hands, his awkwardness, his vulnerability, his ideas, his masculinity, the spirit that she saw play in him as bright and dangerous as lightning in a heavy sky. He was completely strange to her, completely different from her. She shared nothing with him. His reality was a denial of hers. To touch him would be to destroy him, or to be destroyed. So extreme a reaction displeased her. She sought control over herself, both mind and body. Coolness, courage, self-possession were her own ideals. Itale's presence was a severe test of these qualities. But to avoid him, which would have been the simplest and most natural thing in the world, to send him off and not see him again would also be cowardice, admission of defeat. She had invited him back against Enrique's feeble protest. Heliskar and Estenskar had both taken him up, and now the whole group of radical journalists were people of some note in the city. She would have had to meet him in society anyhow, unless to escape him she had gone over the widening gap and joined the Viennese, the conservative and pro-imperial salons. She kept in touch with that portion of society by accepting the very minor position at court which had been her mother's. 
She was called to the palace once a week or once a fortnight while the Grand Duchess was in town. She enjoyed the contrast of the sad, stuffy, shabby court formalities with her own increasingly brilliant and animated circle. She enjoyed testing her own nerve and her power on these ambitious and argumentative men. For most of them she had a good deal of contempt, which she concealed most of the time. Towards Itale, no degree of self-control and self-mockery could dispel the attraction she felt, or the fear of that attraction, and the resentment of it, and the terror and pleasure of his presence which challenged all she was and all she thought she wanted. She had grown up not in Krasnoy, for the most part, but on the immense family property in the Sovena province, which her grandfather had accumulated. The parents mostly stayed in Krasnoy, for the court connection was the important thing in Baroness Poludiskar's life. The children were left in the country in the care of nursemaids and servants, until when he was eleven, Enrique was sent off to a military school for noblemen's sons, where he was unspeakably unhappy, and Luisa at eight was left alone among the servants. She had done pretty much as she pleased in those years of her childhood, in the big, bleak house, isolated on a knoll amidst the flat, fertile, windswept fields of her inheritance. Her playmates were the children of the estate overseer and of the tenant farmers, one step above the peasants, having had a year or two of schooling, shy, dark children, hard as nails, slaves to the baronina's whim, until, goaded too far, one of them would turn on her and call her a papist, their worst insult, and spit in her face, fight her, and often beat her. She could not get on with any of the girls. It led always to a fight. Her companions were boys, whom she could lead in exploits that lack of imagination or dour sense would have forbidden them. But they did not like being dominated either, and when she was ten she crept home with a broken wrist. She had teased the smith's son, Kass, into a rage, and he cracked her arm across his knee as he would crack a willow stick. When her mother arrived for her annual visit a week later, the story was that the baronina had had a fall from her horse. "'She's very wild, ma'am,' the nurse said weakly, sounding an alarm. The baroness gave orders that Louisa should stay in to study six hours a day with her tutor, the house priest, and should not be allowed to play with Protestant children. And these orders were more or less obeyed until the end of the month when the baroness left, and Louisa was off to the barns to find Cass before the carriage was out of sight on the long road across the windy plains. A year later she and Cass took to playing a game which they called the Wild Dancing. Father André's history lessons had included some confused accounts of heathen superstitions and rituals and Roman methods of divination. They could find out everything that was going to happen in the future, Louisa told Cass, if they danced the right way and killed a hen and read the messages inside her. They stole and killed a hen from the farmyard. Louisa was scared by the awful simplicity of the head twist. She had never liked to watch that, but the boy was excited by her fear and disgust, by theft, waste, gratuitous killing. He tore the bird open with his hands, plunged his hands into the entrails, and pushed her face into the bloody mess, jeering, Read it! Read it! She had fought down screams and vomit and said, I see it. I see the future. I see fire. Fire, a house on fire. He danced for her, naked on the threshing floor in a dark autumn evening of fog and fine rain. They were alone among the long, dreary fields. His thin, white child's body flashed before her, dancing, strong, wet with mist and sweat. She had not danced for him. After that night they had scarcely spoken to each other again. When she was thirteen, she began the relationship that finally got her sent back to Krasnoy. She had always been savagely rude and arrogant to the overseer's eldest son, jeering at him and inciting the other boys to bedevil his life. Now she suddenly made a friend of him, and very shortly the overgrown, overmothered boy of sixteen had achieved great power over her, cowing and fascinating her with his causeless rages, caresses, intimate talk, fits of laughter fits of tears, and threats of suicide. He told her how he had seduced a peasant girl, describing every word and act vividly, and how they had met again and again, and all they had done. Louisa listened, and at last, envious, jealous, a little incredulous, tried to match his stories, using her imagination freely. She told him that Koss had slept with her hundreds of times, 
The boy believed her, approached her, and began a fumbling attempt to undress her. She took her clothes off and stood still. He made her lie down and lay on her, but he was impotent. She began to hit at him, scratch at his face when he would not let her go, and she got away from him and scrambled into her shift and dress. The next day he talked her into trying it again, and the same thing happened. The boy went home and tried to shoot himself with his father's hunting piece. His mother came into the room as he was in the act, and he shot her instead, and blew her right hand off at the wrist. Some connection with Louisa was made out from his blubberings and wild talk. It was all kept quiet. Baron Paludiscar, then dying of cancer, never heard of it, and Louisa came back to Krasnoy to a convent school. Now, after ten years, all her Sylvana childhood seemed infinitely far away, another person than herself in another world. Yet sometimes she remembered the overseer's son in his soft, struggling, impotent body, or, remote, the brief vision of a boy dancing naked in dusk and rain. She did not like touching, the kisses women were expected to exchange, handshakes. She did not permit her maid to dress her or to brush her hair. When Itale first came to her in April in the room she had taken in a hotel near West Gate, she had been in unconcealable terror, trembling and stiff, silent, her eyes dry and wide. Yet she had been there waiting for him like an animal that has walked into a trap. Nothing could have set her free but the intensity and impersonality of his desire. His passion submerged her fear like a wave over a sandcastle, and all the fear turned to equal passion all the sand to the water of life, for a night. Sometimes, some nights, for a while, since then. When her mother's illness became severe, she was not able to come at all. During June and July she did not see Itale alone, and only twice briefly in company. Her time was given entirely to the dying woman. She nursed her through a nine weeks' agony, patient and competent. Her mother died clinging to her hand, after the funeral she stayed home, seeing no one for a week, and then had taken up her usual life in so far as the customs of mourning permitted. But she made no sign to Itale. He would not be turned away now, and she gave in to him. For the first time he made love to her in her own house. With some caution regarding Enrique and the servants, that had become their usual arrangement, her maid letting him in very late at night. Often she put off a planned meeting or made obstacles to setting a night. Often when he did come, she was at first passive and cold in manner. Never until the night at Heliscar's had he told her he could not come. She waited for him a night in mid-September. He was late. He was at the Illyrica or at the office of his journal or with Carantai or with Estenscar or some or any of the others, the other men, in their world, his world the political world. She looked about at her world with an ironical eye, the high-ceilinged blue and white painted bedroom. Yet she had been right that night about the journal. Will the censor let you print anything now? she had asked. And they had not listened, going off in high spirits and good fellowship to write up the events of the great day. The Bureau of Censorship had returned the proofs to them three days later with all reports on the Assembly's first session deleted, it was the day the journal went to press. All they could do was take out the type and run the first three pages through entirely blank, except for the heading Novesma Verba and the date. On the same day, the third day of debate in the Assembly, the President announced that the decision to use the vernacular had not received the Grand Duchess's sanction, and was thus invalidated. Oragon at once raised the question of the Grand Duchess's power of sanction and veto, since the Articles of the Assembly declared it to be subject only to the King, and there was no King. Since then debate had struggled on, the left trying to put the question of sovereign authority, and the right interrupting, mainly with demands from the Chair that the deputies speak in Latin. Itale and the others had written up a cautious report of these sessions. The censor stamped it out, and the journal appeared that week with one column on its news page, a hastily composed patriotic effusion by Carantai, and the rest of the sheet dead blank. The only news the public got of events in the assembly room was the brief summary of motions and votes on an inner page of the Courier Mercury. 
Prime Minister Cornelius saw no need for violence, which was abhorrent to the system. It was merely a matter of laying one's trump card down quietly at the last moment, game after game. And it was a game that he, as surely as his idealistic opponents, had staked his life on. Only he had the soldiers and the empire on his side, which made the contest somewhat uneven. She saw that. She did not think Itale or Estenskar or even Heliskar saw it clearly. She did not say much about it, but she continued to fulfill her duties at court, and she entertained men who could help Enrique in his modest diplomatic ambitions whenever he asked her to, or when she saw the opportunity herself. She saw no disloyalty in this. Why should she be loyal to a cause from which she was excluded? How could she be? She could not play the game. Therefore, she did not care who won it. Still, he did not come. It was past two. She had been sitting at her dressing table. She lay down with the magazine he had brought her, the Bellerophon, a monthly which took most of the literary stuffing out of Novesma Verba, which had become, frankly, political and philosophical. In this issue, Itale had a long review of A Dictionary and Historical Grammar of the Orsinian Language and Its Dialects by a professor at Solari, the leading article. Apparently, they were all excited by the dictionary and grammar. Patriotism. She tried to read it. Itale's written style was terse, logical, and didactic. Effective, but not seductive. Not for reading lying down. Louisa yawned and began skipping. Estenskar had contributed the second part of a long review of Carantai's novel. There weren't even enough of them to quarrel healthily. They all had to praise one another. It was small, their world. It was shabby, as mediocre as the dreary court of the Grand Duchess, as futile. They were not free, though they talked forever about freedom. Nobody was free. There's a nice picture, said Itale's quiet voice. She had gone to sleep. She opened her eyes, struggling for consciousness, but did not move. She knew from his voice that he was smiling. "'Fell asleep over my review, did you?' he said, bending over her, so that she smelt the night air on him and felt the warmth of his mouth brush her cheek. "'Novel reader!' "'You can read dictionaries if you like them,' she said, opening her eyes, and then shutting them again to stretch a long, supple stretch and yawn. "'Don't ask me to. I don't trust words. You're very late.' "'I know. I'm sorry.' He took off his coat and stock and sat down on the bed in waistcoat and shirt sleeves. His face looked grave and shadowed in the light of the single candle. She watched him, studied his face as she always did, as if by watching him she could find out what he was. At the Illyrica, she said, talk and talk and talk, words and words and words. No, I was with a friend. From that school I taught at for a while, he's out of work. You're all out of work, always. She knew he did not like to be teased about the erratic jobs he had taken to pay for his rent and bread until Novesma Verba, thriving, could pay him a tiny salary. She knew the subject of his relative poverty was one of the most dangerous ones that lay between them. It was precisely because it was dangerous that she began to edge near the crater, but no temper stirred in him now. He merely nodded and said, A Jane quit his job. He had a good one, tutoring a family, some grain merchant in the Trasfuve. He's consumptive, and a doctor told him that living with the children he put them at risk. So he moved out. They tried to make him stay. I don't know what to do for him, if he could just have a year or so to get his health back. Itale put his head in his hands. I don't know. I don't see how he can get free at all. But it can't. Yes, it can. It probably will. It generally does and there is nothing you can do about it. Why do you torment yourself? I don't. He's my friend. You do. None of your friends is worthy of you. They are all doomed, defeated in advance. Estenskar, he said with a kind of laugh. Estenskar most of all. He is in love with defeat. I don't want to talk about all that now, he said impatiently. I'm tired. He turned to her, but she swung off the bed with a lazy, evasive motion, gathering her silk dressing-gown about her, went to the dressing-table, sat down before the glass, and began to brush her hair. He lay back across the bed, his arms over his head. "'Don't forget to wind the clock and say your prayers,' Louisa said. 
What have I done wrong now? he asked in a dry tone, but good-humouredly enough. Marriage is not what I want. I know that. Do you? There was a pause before he answered. Louisa, there has to be a certain amount we take for granted, an area of trust between us, or we can't get on at all. We can't start over every time. Yes, we can. That is precisely what I want, what we should do. Nothing taken for granted, nothing settled, expectable, cut and dried. Each night the first night. But there's no use, so long as you come to it from where you do come from. What do you mean, where I come from? All the men you waste your breath on, all the second-rate people, the people you don't belong with. Let the weak lean on one another. You cannot share pain. That's the worst hypocrisy of all, the most degrading. Charity, humility, the vile Christian virtues. What are you doing in that cage? Her voice was light and mild. She continued to brush her hair with a long rhythmic stroke. You come to me from a cage and never know you've left it, and run back to it in the morning. He sat up on the bed and sat for a while, gazing off into the shadowed end of the room where long white draperies hid the windows. I come to you for, for what no one else ever gave me, ever offered me. It is trust, the greatest trust. I don't know how to handle it. I'm no good at it. I know I hurt you. All I can do is offer you what you give me, that trust, that care, that cage. He had stood up as he spoke, and she rose, turning to him, meeting him in the center of the room, her hair loose and her body warm and fresh in the flowered robe. The sleeves dropped back from her arms as she put them up to embrace him. I want to fly beside you like falcons, like eagles over the mountains, never looking down, never looking back. I love you, he whispered, gathering her against him, a much more expert lover now than he had been in the garden in Isnar but no less tender, responsive to her response, so that although she wanted to go on talking, wanted to tell him, I am your freedom, and what I see in you is freedom, she said nothing, feeling the words dissolve and the barriers go down, and the joy she feared so deeply pick her up and sweep her off like foam on the torrents of the thaw. He lay asleep beside her when she roused in early dawn. She lighted a candle. He did not stir. Again she studied his face, warm and heavy in sleep, undefended. To lie together all night naked, that was trust, yes. But she did not like the word, if there was only a way to get free of words altogether. But the servants would be getting up. He liked to leave while it was still dark. He had been bitterly resentful of the humiliation he had felt once when he slept in her bed till ten, and had to be spirited out by her and her maid in a comic opera scene, that she would have found very funny, if only he had found it funny. He was so naive and so provincial still. The disapproving schoolboy, the humorless Robespierre, the bumpkin pedant, self-righteous. So the fear hastily reinstating its rights and boundaries within her, rebuilding the barriers, denied gratitude, denied the yearning, brooding warmth of her body against his, her face watching his, and made her wake him sharply, saying his name. He started up, then lay back with some inarticulate word. Wake up, wake up. I am, he said, turning his face against her shoulder. What a nose you have, she murmured, sinking back for a moment into the warmth, like a ship's prow, ever onward. He was asleep again. It's getting light. I don't want to go, he groaned, and sleepily began kissing her throat and breast. She tensed, slipped away and out of the bed, and put the flowered gown about her, turning her back on him. I'll tell Agatha to watch the back stairs for you. Louisa, wait. She half turned, impatient. He sat up, scratching his head. I meant to talk about this last night, but it was late, and we... He pushed back his hair and looked at her through the dim sphere of the candlelight. His face still had the heavy, defenseless look in it, the innocence of sleep, the lips slightly swollen. I may be out of town for a while. Where? How long? She responded, without emotion. Amade has asked me to go home with him. I'd like to do that. And then go on to Rakava and do a series of articles on the situation there. 
or find a correspondent there who can do it for us. A few weeks in all, I suppose. She did not like the sensation of her long, heavy, fair hair loose and tangled on her head and over her shoulders. She had not braided it last night because they had had to make love. She went to the dressing table and brushed her hair back from her face with harsh, practiced strokes. When did Amade finally make up his mind? He asked me to come with him a couple of days ago. Well, he's been on the brink of going back to the Polana ever since I met him five years ago. He won't stay long. If Itale went, there would be a month, two months, that she could sleep alone, that her mind would not have to go through all the miseries of jealousy, anxiety, resentment, and terror that her body or her soul or some blind, stupid omnipotence forced upon her. She would be free. Don't stay too long, she said. I won't, no fear, he said, with naive gratitude. He got up and began dressing. In the mirror she watched him put on his shirt and button it, then his collar and stock, the stately mysteries of male clothes, the waistcoat, the tailed coat. I'll be back by mid-November at the latest, he said. He had obviously been afraid she would object to his going and was relieved that she did not. Perhaps I'll go to Vienna with Enrique while you're gone, she said. He'll never get up the energy to go by himself, and he's got to meet the ambassador if he's ever going to get any sort of position though I suppose if I went I'd have to stay through Christmas. What a bore. I don't know. Why don't you come to Vienna? It would broaden your mind a good deal more than Estenskar's sheep farm and dirty Rakova. We'll stay at the König von Ungarn, just behind the dome. Do, Itale. Sitting on the bed to put on his shoes, he looked up to meet her mocking, challenging glance over her shoulder. Oh, God, you are so beautiful. Even at five in the morning he said, muffled, bending down, then standing up again. I can't go to Vienna. Some day. A little sheepishly, but also ready to take offense if she went too far, for it was a question of money, of course. It was always a question of money. She nodded politely, dismissively, and went to put Agata on the alert. Most of the servants were reliable. She knew exactly whose servants they exchanged news with and did not care what they said. But Enrique had hired a footman away from Count Raskinus' car recently, and she did not want to be discussed by that lot. Raskinus' car was exactly the sort of man who got his gossip from his servants and then used it maliciously. Pierre's still asleep, ma'am, Agata murmured. She looked back into the room and said to Itale, All clear. He came up to her in the doorway, dressed, armored in the whole cloth of this age of respectability, formidable, a stranger. She shivered barefoot in her thin silk gown. I don't want to go, he said softly, not touching her. I don't want to go now. I don't want to go to Rakova. He leaned down, kissed her very lightly on the lips, and went out. She could not even hear his step on the stairs. She went back to bed and curled up in the place under the covers that was still warm. Now I can sleep. Now I'm alone, she thought. But instead of sleeping, she began to cry, hiding her face under the sheet, grinding her fists into her eyes like a child. Part 4 The Way to Radico 1. In the cool dawn of the equinox, the statue of St. Christopher of the Wayfarers stood distinct over Old Bridge, over the river, and the light mist on the surface of the water. A purity of light, a stillness of air and sky, effaced the boundaries between living and inanimate. The stone saint seemed to have paused there to look eastward, smiling and unseeing. There were no clouds. The sun rose over dark hills and sent its first rays straight in the eyes of two horsemen riding over Old Bridge, dazzling them, making them squint and smile. The bridge was crossed. The riders entered the shadow of a long street. Eight hooves clattered with a clipped, brisk noise on the cobbles of the Trasfuve between files of sleeping houses. One rider turned in the saddle to see the new light on the towers of the cathedral behind them, across the river. Look there, Amade, the light. Estenskar did not turn. He looked ahead down the long, straight street and said, Come on, this horse wants to run. The fretting bay, then the brown mare, broke into a trot. They were spirited, their riders good horsemen, a handsome sight as they rode from the city towards the first sunrise of the year's fall. 
By eight o'clock from the climbing streets of Grasse, Itale could look back and see all Krasnoi lying along its sunlit river, beautiful and smoky in the morning warmth. Then, leaving the little town, they crossed the crown of the ridge and lost the valley, its river, and city behind them on their way. Down all day among the hills, a faint warm wind in their faces bearing the smells of earth, hay, wood smoke. At dusk, a village ahead in the next fold of the hills, trees and thatched roofs and chimney smoke offering rest, firelight after the long day's ride. There will be an inn, Itale said. He began to sing, Red are the berries on the autumn bough, and his mare pricked her ears and stepped along towards hay and dinner. Dusk was heavy under old trees as they rode up into the village, and the sign of the golden lion creaked in the evening breeze. What a good place, Itale said, dismounting. There were no other travelers at the inn. They were served good beer before the fire, and a big old hen roasted crisp. They left nothing of her but bones. Then Itale stretched out his legs and, for the ritual and completeness of the thing, lighted the clay pipe provided by the host of the golden lion. Never saw you smoke before, said his friend. Never smoke, said Itali. How do you keep the damn thing going? Estenskar went on watching him, since Itale, extended in profound comfort and puffing hard on the pipe, was oblivious. I'm glad we're traveling together, he said. Of course. Estenskar smiled and turned his gaze back to the fire. It's good to get out of the city. You must take the mare tomorrow. She has a lovely gait. How long since I rode a horse, let alone a good one? This is a holiday, more than a holiday. Escape. Itale waved the pipe, which had gone out. I was full up, Amade, absolutely full up. Now I'm empty again, at last. Air, sunlight, silence, space. Estenskar got up and went to the door of the inn room, which gave directly on the village street without threshold between the hard earth outside and the hard earth of the inn floor. The darkness under the wide-armed oaks was cool and soft. Wind stirred now and then, the sign creaked. In the black foliage a few stars shone fitfully and eclipsed behind the restless leaves. "'Is it so easy?' he said after so long that Itale, befogged with exercise, fresh air, beer, and well-being, was not sure what he was talking about. "'You set out. You set out to make yourself, to make the world.' All the things you must do and see and learn and be, you must go through it all. You leave home, come to the city, travel, miss nothing, experience it all. You make yourself, you fill the world with yourself and your purposes, your ambitions, your desires, until there's no room left, no room to turn around. There is here, Itale put in. I told you, I'm as empty as that beer jug. Air, sunlight, silence, space, that won't last. It will. It's we who don't last. Estenskar leaned against the doorway, gazing out into the country darkness. Now that I know that I can't choose, he said, now that I finally learn that there are no choices, that I can't make my way and never could, that it was all deceit and conceit and waste, now that I've given up trying to make my way, I can't find it. I can't hear the voice. I'm lost. I went too far, and there's no way home. In later years, when Itale heard his friend's name spoken, what came to him always was this moment. The big, dirt-floored room, the candle and beer jug on an oaken table, the fire, the stir of autumn wind in dark branches, the silence that underlay and surrounded and closed over Estenskar's voice, so that the last word, softly spoken, seemed to fail and die away in the immense, unheeding quiet. But by going back to Eston, Itale began and stopped, knowing his words were stupid, but wanting to change Estenskar's mood. He had been happy that day, and was sorry to let happiness go. That's not my home. It's too late. One road goes east, another west, but there's no destination unless you're given it. Given it. You don't choose it. You only accept it when it's offered. If it's offered. Why am I going to Eston, then? I don't know. He spoke harshly, glancing around at Itale with a vindictive stare. But Itale had learned long ago that Estenskar's anger was never for him. 
It always makes a difference where you are, he said. Come back and sit down. We just got free. No point worrying about where we're going yet. Eston Scar obeyed him. He came back to the table and sat down, putting his elbows on the table and his head between his hands, ruffling up his coarse reddish hair. All I do is think about myself and talk about myself, he said miserably. It's a worthwhile subject, but I wish I, if it hadn't been for you this last year. They were both embarrassed, and there was a short silence between them. That dream of yours, are you chasing it? Estenskar shook his head. Was Esten a part of it? I don't know. I only know that since it I've known I had to get out of Krasnoy, get away. You knew that the first time we talked together at my place, and ate that cheese two years ago, and I was still living with Rosalie then, right in the depths of it. God, what a fool. Itale investigated the beer jug again, found what he expected, nothing, and got up stretching his arms. I'll be stiff tomorrow morning. I'm out of condition for riding. Look here, Itale, while we're talking. I, while we're talking. Itale looked down at him, grave. What about Luisa Paludiscar? So I ask myself. What's gone wrong? I don't know. I don't understand what it is she wants. You never will. What is it you want? Itale put his hands against the heavy mantelpiece, looking down into the fire. To sleep with her. Is that what she wants? I thought it was. But now she wants more than that? No. Less. Itale spoke very slowly, trying to say what he did not know how to say. I don't understand it. We're in love, but we... we don't get on. We hurt each other a good deal. I don't understand why. I don't understand. I don't understand, said the straw in the fire. In love. Love is an invention of the poets, Itale. Believe me, I should know. It's a lie. It's the worst of all the lies. A word without meaning. Not a rock, but a whirlpool, the emptiness that sucks down the soul. But there must be... Oh, well, I don't much want to talk about it. I'm running away for a while. Maybe I'll see things clearer. Afterwards. You wouldn't look back when we left Krasnoy. You were right. Estenskar nodded. But twenty-four hours later, after their night at the Golden Lion and a day's ride through pleasant, quiet country, when they were lying on a great straw mound in a barn loft, each wrapped in a horse blanket lent them by the hospitable farmer, all the smells of barn and stable strong in their nostrils, and all the stars brilliant outside the great loading window of the loft, he returned to the subject. Louisa is trying to make the world, he said, the way I did, and she'll destroy it the way I did. Don't let her pull you off course, Itale. I don't know what my course is. I thought I did. I don't know what's right, what I ought to do. I don't like this. She calls it freedom, an affair, a love affair, secrecy, nothing ever to count on. That is her freedom. She's no fool. If she married you, then you'd be free, and she'd be the one trapped. Love's the game where there are only losers. Listen, Itale, I won't bring this up again. It's none of my business, I know that. I've known Louisa for years. I might have fallen in love with her if I hadn't met the other one first. She's like me. She tries to take and choose. She sees you, and she can't let you be. If she can't own you, she will destroy you. You do not know. I hope you never know the envy that eats her when she looks at you. But I know it. Look out for her. Look out for me. We will destroy you if we can, Itale. His tone was cold and playful. But you can't, Itale said, slowly, not playfully. Go alone, Estenskar whispered. Go alone. The stars shone splendid in the great square of the window, Vega overhead, the lion like a mower's sickle left lying in the white wheat, the swan on the river of stars, and in the southwest Scorpio, huge among lesser constellations, cold above the warm earth night. The horses and cattle in the stalls beneath snorted, shifted, 
slept their queer waking sleep. A few late crickets trilled, no longer alarmed by human voices. Itale slept, and waking before dawn, opened his eyes to colorless gulfs of space, where, fading, Orion stood, hunter and warrior of the winter sky. They came that day to Sorg, a little city on the confluence of the rivers Sorg and Ross, and following the Ross for a few miles in late afternoon, left the Freilana province and entered the Polana. As if waiting for them there, the east wind rose after sunset, carrying the chill of great spaces crossed, long plains and empty hills. They stayed at a village inn, wakened often from sleep by the bleating of hundreds of sheep penned in fields behind the inn, the clanking of sheep bells, the carousing of the drovers in the common room beneath. The next day was cool. A fine fog was dissolved through the sky so that in the pale glare reflected from horizon to horizon the sun looked small and wan. As they went east and south the wind blew in their faces. The land grew poorer as they rode. Plowlands yielded to grasslands rolling to an interminable distance. They rode all day alone between earth and sky, with few trees or streams or houses or men to keep them company in the middle space. The road mounted, taking a whole day to rise a thousand feet. As they neared Eston, the slopes became steeper, the rare farms poorer, crouched with their sheep pens under the western side of a hill in the lee of the endless wind. They came to the village of Colay in the late afternoon, and pushed on four more miles to Eston, arriving after night had fallen. All Itale saw of the house then was its lights hidden among trees at the foot of a hill, whose high, smooth curve blocked out the east wind and the eastern stars. All round were dark hills in starlight, no light to be seen but the stars and the one house, lonely as a ship in mid-sea. After a brief supper with Estenskar's brother and sister-in-law, the travelers went off to bed. Itale was given a room at the southeast corner, high, sparsely furnished, clean as bone. All the house was like that. The house, the room, smelled of the country. It was utterly silent. Waking late, he opened his eyes to a flood of white sunlight. In the yard below his window, a stable boy was singing as he curried a stamping, snorting horse. Itale had never heard the tune, and the dialect was hard for him to follow. In Rakava, beneath the high walls, I left my love forever. I came to live among the barren hills where runs no river. The archaic turns, the high, harsh, fluent voice pouring over trills and catches as a shallow stream pours over rocks. It was all part of the stirring, bright, windy morning, and Itale got up ready for whatever came next. He took breakfast with Amade in the long dining room. Ladislas Estenskar was on the fields, as his wife said, at work. She sat with them, though she had got up long before, when her husband did. She was quiet, dark, barely eighteen. She had been married five months. Her manner was more that of a girl at home than a woman head of her household, and she was evidently in awe of her brother-in-law. With Itale she got on at once, and he said to his friend as they climbed the hill above the house, I like her, your little sister. Ladislas is a man of sense and taste. They don't come like that in the city. I knew a girl like her at Malafrena. What became of her, the girl at Malafrena? They sent her to a convent school in Esnar, married a rich widower. Should never have let her leave the country. Town spoils them. My word, what a view! Beneath them now, the house and stables huddled at the head of the vale, at the edge of a sparse, straggling wood. All round the barren crest where they stood stretched pale, rounded hills, even in the farthest distance hardly blued by the dry, pure, sunlit air. The grass on them was short as stubble after mowing. Here and there the flocks, ragged gray like patches of dandelion and seed, were scattered on the slopes. Sheep bells made a faint, sparse music over all the great landscape. Northward, beyond the end of the woods, on a scarped and wrinkled summit higher than the other hills, something stood at the edge of sight, a wall or tower. What's that, Amade? Estenskar turned. The wind and light made him squint. His hard, thin face looked as if it was made of the same stuff as the high, pale, arid land. That tower? Rodico, it's called. Castle? 
Blown up in the War of the Three Kings, not much of it left. Which king did they back? Estensky laughed. The Pretender. People here are never on the winning side. When they came down from the hilltop, the cessation of the wind was a relief, as was the presence of things close at hand, walls and trees, giving shelter from the pale distances. They met Ladislas coming into the yard, and with him went to the stables to look at the two horses Amade had bought in Krasnoy. Admiring the brown mare, he stroked her neck and said, You always had an eye for horses, Amade." And it was plain that he was glad the younger brother had come home, that he loved him, admired him, and was afraid of him. In the afternoon they rode out to show Itale the estate. The elder brother talked farming with him, the younger was mostly silent. Sheep were raised in the Montana, but Itale had had little to do with them, and had never seen flocks or pasturage on anything like this scale. He was impressed, fascinated asked Ladislas endless questions, to which the answers became increasingly technical and complete, as Ladislas discovered that he was talking to a man who had worked on the fields, and began to forget that the guest was a literary fellow from the city. They reined in beside one of the deep stone-mounted wells and dismounted to look at it, and remounted but neglected to ride on, discussing intently and with passion the principal problem of farming in the Polana and its principal difference from farming in the Montana, the lack of surface water. Amade sat silent, patient on a patient old horse from the stable of the farm, gazing at the hills. As he rode back to the house with Itale, he said, It's queer coming back, like coming to a foreign country, utterly foreign, and finding one speaks the language perfectly. That night after supper they sat talking by the fire. Ladislas's wife began to gather courage, and when Amade said something about his book now in press, she asked in her soft voice, Have you brought it with you? Only my rough copy. Rochoy has it. It'll come out early in twenty-eight. You're the cause of our meeting, Amade, his brother said. Giovanna wanted to see what Estenskar's brother looked like. I'm Estenskar's brother, and glad to have been of use. It's the first time I've heard of my reputation doing any good to anyone. He is weary of fame, Itale said. Soon he will get weary of being weary, I hope. He always runs his books down, too. The better they are, the more he reviles them. This next one may really be quite fair, going by that indication. Is it a novel? asked Giovanna. What will it be called? Can you say what it's about? It's called Jivan Faujin, and it's about him, Amade replied, with an evident effort not to intimidate her. Very gloomy. It didn't really come off. See, said Itale, no one has seen it, but we've all been told how very poor it is. It's not poor, Amade said. I wouldn't publish it if it were. Ladislas grinned. Either he liked to see his brother teased a bit, or liked to see him fire up. It's merely mediocre, Itale said. It's not what it should have been, that's all. It's not as good as Carantai's book. I wish it was. The young man, Leve? Givana asked Timorous, her eyes very large and dark, her hands tensely clasped in her lap. There's young Leve, you know, in person, Amade said, indicating Itale, who at once got hot in his turn. Oh, rot, Amade! Givan Carantai was writing that book before he ever met me. Besides, there's absolutely nothing in common. Sorde, too, is weary of fame. Sorde's dignity is hurt, and he can't think of anything clever to say, said Itale. Is that a piano hidden over there? It was a delicate and cranky old harpsichord, and Giovanna played for them, formal little salon pieces of the last century. Her husband stood protectively near her while she played, turning the pages of the music. They sang together a Scottish love song, so the yellowed book said, a yearning tune in which their voices blended with reticent clarity. They had sung it before, alone in the lonely house, for their own pleasure. Itale, watching them, thought, But this is how it should be. How have they found it so simply? And for a minute there in the peaceful room by the fire listening to that music, it seemed to him that life was an infinitely simple thing if only one looked at it clearly without fear, that if one were thirsty one need only look to see close by, however dry the land, the deep well, the well of clear water. But it wasn't his spring. It wasn't his land. He stayed a week at Eston, 
He went about the farm with Ladislas, went shooting with Amade in the sparse forests, talked with the brothers and Giovanna in the evenings. He felt half at home because it was the country, a farm, and half strange, a city visitor among these hard-working people, no part of the spare silent current of their life. Amade was increasingly silent, speaking curtly and sometimes at random out of some inner preoccupation. On his last day there, Itale suggested they ride over to the ruined tower, Radico. No, Amade said. Then, becoming aware of the uncouthness of his refusal, he scowled. Nothing there, he said. I'd rather... I want to go there alone. I'm sorry. His face was angry, obdurate, suffering. Everything, Itale thought, came hard to him. He could take nothing lightly in life. Even Itale's admiring, undemanding friendship caused him pain. All love hurt him. The ropes burn my hand, said the ferryman of the icy river in his first book. Stay a while longer, he said, late that last night. Ladislas and Giovanna had gone to bed, leaving them talking by the fire. I promised to meet Isabere. It's a foul city, Rakova, Amade said, brooding, gazing into the fire. You shouldn't go there. Only Easterners can understand the East. Then come with me. Help me with these articles. Amade merely shook his head. Next day at noon, beside the little dusty coach that would take Itale to Rakova, he said, When you see Karantai this winter, tell him... He paused for a long time, shrugged, looked off down the dusty, straggling street of the village. It doesn't matter, he said. The driver was up on his box. It was time for Itale to mount up beside him. Don't stay here too long, Amade. Come back to your friends, he said putting out his hand to touch his friend's arm, to embrace him if Amade would. Amade pulled away from him, saying, All right, goodbye, have a good trip, and without looking at him, turned and went off. Itale stood a moment nonplussed, then swung himself up on the high wheel and took his place. The coach set off with a jangle and commotion of harness and wheels and shouting. Itale looked back through the dust thrown up by the horse's hooves, and saw his friend already mounted on the bay horse, riding off on the road to Eston. Behind him the mare, her saddle empty, followed quietly. 2. Late that night Amade lay awake and listened to the wind. It had risen strong and cold, bearing gusts of rain. When it was still a moment there was sighing sound, which might be the settling of the house whose wooden walls strained against the blast, but which sounded like breathing, as if the wind itself took breath before its next sweep across the hills into the west. Amade sat up at last, groped for the tinderbox, and lighted his candle. The room appeared around him, an island of dim light in the night and the storm of wind. On one high wall hung a map of Europe, which he recalled from his earliest childhood, the Latin names of realms, the strange indented coastlines, the boundaries of nations, all changed by eighty years of history, the decorative monsters sporting in the ocean he had never seen. The east wind in the darkness blew towards that ocean, towards the remote and cold autumnal sea, over the hills, plains, cities of the inland, the dawn behind it and the sunset ahead. Sunrise might catch it on the coasts of France, or it catch up with evening on the Atlantic, near the shores of the western world. A great gust like a storm wave struck the house. Voices cried along the eaves and roof peaks. The candle flickered, smoky. I'm through. I'm done, he whispered furiously in the sighing stillness after the gust. It's gone. All gone. There's nothing left. What do you want of me? Silence, wind, darkness. The walls of the room where he had slept as a boy. When he blew out his candle, he could see the window as a paler oblong, and as the clouds streamed westward, glimpsed Orion, fiery in the black gulfs. In the afternoon, he went to the stable to take out the bay horse. The other horse he had bought in Krasnoy, the brown mare, was in the next stall. He heard Itale in the Golden Lion Inn, saying, You must take the mare tomorrow. She has a lovely gait. The pleasant, easy voice and the open, easy dialect, the generous heart. Again tears came into Amade's eyes, as they had when he tried to say goodbye to Itale beside the coach. 
no warm sentimental expansion, but a painful and frightening storm of grief like an attack from behind, which he met as best he could, turning to face it with surprise and rage. He saddled up the mare instead of the bay and set off alone towards Rodico. In the forest October was setting its somber fires, the birches were beginning to lose their leaves, the wind had blown itself out. The mare's long gait soon took them out of the trees and up the long slopes towards the high place. The hills were empty except for his brother's scattered flocks, the agile, heavy-bodied sheep turning their remote gaze on the rider. The sky was pale blue. Once a hawk circled indolently near the sun and flew off to the north. At the top of the hill he dismounted in what had been the courtyard of the keep. A long mound, broken by angles of half-buried stone, showed where the walls had stood. The wind that never stilled on these summits played in the yellow grass. The body of the castle was gone except for a fragment of the gateway, and overhanging the scarp some ruins of the outer defense wall. The tower stood scarred and intact, sharing its eminence with two things, the sun now sinking to the west, and far off in the east, more sensed than seen in the obscure distances of autumn, a violet bulk, the mountains of another land. A ramp led up inside the tower to a first floor of stone. The higher floors had been burned away when the castle was taken, a hundred and eighty years before, leaving only stone beam supports and a jagged blue circle of sky overhead. Weeds flourished between the stones of floor and walls. In a window fifty feet above the floor a few purple daisies nodded. Amade went to the south window of the first floor, a narrow bright shaft of view over sunlit hills. An inscription was scratched in the sill in the hard yellow-gray sandstone. Amadeus Ioannis Estensis Anno Milesimo Octingentissimo Duo Devicesimo Vincom he had cut the words there two days before he first left Eston for Krasnoy. He had been seventeen years old. He remembered in one intense, imponderable vision full of scents and weathers and the light of other sunsets all the times he had stood alone here in Rodico. The first time he had come had been in the days after his mother's death. He had come to the tower on foot. He had climbed up the broken ramp and sat down, worn out, here under the south window and found himself in a place where death had no power, all here being dead, and yet enduring, invulnerable. The sun had gone down, the tower had filled with blue shadows. He had heard his name called on the hills, and at last had answered. His father, Ladis, the servants, had been out looking for him, calling. He had been only a boy of ten. Again the tower filled slowly with shadow, and as it did so grew cold, as if the shadow were clear still water. He went out and sat on the ruined wall over the cliff in the sun's last warmth, looking out over the vast landscape that, as a child, he had pretended was his domain, he the prince of the fallen castle, until the shadow had risen to the top of the highest hills. The frightening pang of loss that he had felt parting with Itale, all the bitter restlessness that had followed him from Krasnoy, dropped away from him at last, here, among the largeness of things, the high ruin, wind, evening. When he stood up at last he still lingered, surrendering to those things, acknowledging their absolute healing indifference and their absolute claim upon him. He stood alone at last, in the only place where he could be alone, could be himself and free. This is it, the place. This is where I was to come, he thought with triumph. In the same moment he turned again, seeing himself posing and boasting, a fool in the house of grandeur. Why had he refused to come here with Itale? Because he was ashamed. He did not want Itale to see the word scratched on the stone of the tower, I shall conquer, and in his ignorance and magnanimity believe it. For Itale believed in victory, in the spirit's struggle and triumph, he had not lived in the ruined tower on the barren land. He had not seen that there was only a single choice between illusion and hypocrisy, a choice not worth making. What am I doing here? Amade asked himself, jeering, and went to remount. Once off the steep heights he put the mare into a run, leaving behind him in the dead place his defeat and his irrecoverable glimpse of peace. 
In a bad mood that night he got into a worse one, seeing his brother meet his sullenness with patience, and the little sister, Itale's voice again, grow shy and circumspect. But why couldn't they let him alone? He could not manage their interest, their affection, their human needs and offerings. He was not able, he had never been able, to live with people. He should leave them and go. But he did not know where to go. I liked your friend very much, Lottis said, days after Itale had left. They were in the stable yard. He had asked Amade to help him rehang the gate with a new set of hasps from the smithy in Collet. They had just got it mounted, and he was testing the iron latch tongue. His dark face bent down to his work, as it mostly was. He wasn't what I had imagined your friends there to be. Amade flooded his hands at the pump to get the rust from the old ironwork off them. Friends, he said, he's the only person I met in ten years there that I ever think of here. Are you planning to stay here? I think so. It's all right, the older brother said, you know that. Where I'm concerned, and Giovanna, it's your house. But how old are you, twenty-six or seven? This is no place for a man unless you want to come into the farming with me. There's nothing else here. You seem to find enough. I'm a farmer. Also, I've got a wife. I had to ride sixty miles to court her. You need more than that. What do you want with rye and sheep? That would be to waste your work. I have no more work to do. It's done. Ladislas looked up then from the gate latch. What do you mean? Your books? You're done writing? It's done with me, is the way I'd put it. Finished, used up and thrown away. Ladislas's eyes were extremely direct, a steady gaze. You can't give up a thing like that, he said with certainty. I tell you, it's given me up. Ah, Ladislas said with disgust. You haven't changed at all. That brotherly contempt based upon knowledge and unshakable loyalty, that unanswerable, just, forgiving assessment of character left Amade wordless. He felt like a child who has said something very foolish, and he flushed up red as he stood with his arms on the pump handle, staring at Ladislas. That night after supper Amade spoke not at all to his brother, but more than usual to Giovanna. He made her laugh. He disconcerted her by praising her understanding, and reassured her again by a blunt correction. He began to describe, for the first time since he'd come home, the life he had lived in Krasnoy, people he had known, the fashionable, the literary, the actors, the politicals. It was all the Arabian Nights to Giovanna. She was enchanted, shocked, fascinated. She begged more detail, more circumstance. Her eyes were dark and bright, and she said, I don't believe it, Amade. That night in his room in bed, Amade heard her. I don't believe it, Amade, and saw her round, strong, childish hands clasped across the dark bodice, and cursed himself aloud to get the sound of her voice out of his head, and turned over and lighted the candle at last. The other one, the older one, lay in his bed in the darkness beside her while she slept soundly, and heard her voice. I don't believe it, Amade, and clenched his hands in anger, jealousy, and savage self-accusation. Three more nights passed the same way. After supper, Amade and Giovanna talked, laughed, and played the harpsichord. Giovanna sang for him, or mocked and admired the bizarre impromptus he played for her. She had become quite at ease with him and teased him as she never teased Ladislas, ordered him about as if imitating the Krasnoy great ladies he described to her, flirted with him. The idea of the theater fascinated her, she asked endless questions about the stage, the plays, the players, the actresses, women whose lives were in all ways, in all things, the opposite of hers. Where do they live? How are they paid? What do they do with their money? Do they ever have children? On and on, commanding Amade to answer. And the young man, with his jarring laugh, obeyed her, while Ladislas sat silent beside the hearth. The fourth night, Ladislas left the house after supper and went down to the sheepfolds. He sat a long time with his shepherds by their fire there, as silent and dour as he had sat by his own fire. But when he came back to the house, his wife sat alone, sewing by the hearth, looking tired 
and a little scared. Where's Amade? he asked in an unnatural tone. In his room. No music tonight, eh? he said and winced. The wind's so bad, she said. They always said that in the Polana. She looked up at him and put up her hand to him timidly. You look tired, he said. Go to bed. His voice was very gentle. She went upstairs. He stayed by the fire and did not follow her till after midnight. There was light under Amade's door, the thin rayed fan of gold across the worn hall carpeting. He was awake, alone. The older brother stood outside the closed door in the darkness, broken by that fan of light at his feet, and fought for the strength to be silent, not to speak. On the other side of the closed door, Amade sat hunched over the scarred writing table, seeking the word, the gift of speech, in an emotionless ecstasy. He had got from Giovanna what he wanted of her, the excitement of nerves, the uneasy, impatient, tenacious desire blocked at its own inception, which was his poetic mood. As soon as Ladislas left the house, he had left her and come up to his room. Rancorous with shame and self-contempt, he sat down to write a letter to somebody, anybody in Krasnoy. He had to get out of here and go back to Krasnoy. As he cut his pen to a new point, words appeared in his mind, shifted, stabilized, reshifted. Here at the ruined tower, the end of hope. Here at the house of desolation, prince, at the tower at the edge of hope. The words fell apart, the pattern changed. The residence returned and filled the universe out to its boundaries, and he dipped his half-sharpened pen blindly and began to write, scribbling, crossing out, scribbling again, wrestling the angel skillfully, cleverly, a professional fighter out to win. For four days he stayed mostly shut up in his room. When he appeared he was good-humored and heedless. He ate whatever was put in front of him, answered questions at random, and went back up to work. On the fourth night he came into his brother's study, a cold shed of a room where Ladislas shut himself up to do his accounting. Can you spare me half an hour? Come in, I'm sick of this. What is it all? Taxes. Three years running I've appealed to Rakova for clarification. They send back the same stupid orders from the administration in Krasnoy. How do they think our peasants can pay this new house tax? Do they want blood? They'll get blood all right one of these days if the estates can't change things. My God, here too. Taxes make revolutions. You didn't have to go to the city to learn that, Ladislas said with irony or self-irony. What's that? Want to hear it? Ladislas sat down at his desk. Amade, standing, read the long poem aloud in his harsh, clear voice that scarcely softened even for the most musical lines. It had all the fluent tenderness, the sweetness of sound that his verse was famous for, none of which was in his voice as he read it or in the sense of the words, a fantasy or dream piece on the ruined castle, a flood of somber and precipitous images in darkness ending with darkness, obscure, abrupt. When he was done there was silence. Then Ladislas, in a curious gesture, held out his empty hands before his chest, and looked from one to the other with a smile. There you are, he said in a whisper. No, not I, it, the place, Rodiko, unless I've failed. Ladislas looked up at him. Rodiko? In nightmare? In reality, in itself? The poet's voice now was softened by the release of feeling after reading the work. The only road across the hills goes to it and there is only one road to it. It's like a dream, where you never choose. There are never any choices. It is frightening, Amade, the older brother said in his grave, diffident voice. And Amade smiled, accepting for a moment praise, victory. You were always my best reader, Lotus. He sat down and they faced each other. Lotus lost, dark and watchful, Amade dressed as always carefully and formally, his reddish hair well cut and combed. He crossed his legs, tapping his knee with the rolled-up manuscript of the poem. It was a dream, of course. This isn't the place itself, it's a dream, a vision of it, months ago. 
Last July, I don't know if I can describe it. I hadn't done anything for weeks, hadn't written anything for months. One night in July I went back. I went back to a house I used to go to. A woman. You know that story. I'd broken with her more than a year ago. I was beginning to respect myself again, working with Sorday and his lot. I was... So I went back to her, and she took me in, of course. It amused her a good deal. She sent away her current lover to make room in the bed for me. I got drunk and cried, and she turned me out again finally. It was... I went around the city all night. I remember parts of it. Got home in the morning and went to sleep. I got up in the evening. It was hot, July in Krasnoy. I was sick, of course. It was... it was farther down than I'd been. I sat at my window for a long time. I kept those rooms five years because of that window, looking out over the park, down the mall to the Sinalia. The big chestnut trees under my window, and then the lawns and the mall full of people and carriages in the slanting light on an evening in summer. And behind all that, the facade of the palace, long and regular behind the trees, a kind of dreary splendor, a melancholy, the end of something. Well, I sat there where I had sat ten thousand times, with a warm wind blowing in over my table, and the light getting broken up in dusty shafts between the trees, not thinking anything, run out, run dry at last, empty. And then I had this dream, if that's what it was. I wasn't asleep. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was about, even. In the novel, I tried to write about a man who couldn't get away from his destiny. All he did was part of it, even when he thought he was acting freely. The dream was like that. I saw my own life behind me and ahead of me, as if it were a road lying along the hills, but I wasn't on it. I could see it, and the hills. I could see places I knew. But had I known them before, or did I recognize them because they've always lain ahead of me? And that, that's all. I can't describe it. I can't bring it back. He sat poised as if listening. No use, he said, and shrugged. But then when I came to write this, and he tapped the paper on his knee, when I came to the passage about the castle at night, then I realized I was describing one of the things I had seen in the dream. Radico at night, in the rain, in the dark, before sunrise. I saw that. I saw it in broad daylight, two hundred miles away. Why? How? What does it mean? I don't know. I've given up asking. I have no right to ask. I've forfeited my rights. I lived in my mind, in my emotions, in my vanity. I lived in the world I made and made the rules for it. I chose to dream. But then when you wake up, you've lost your citizenship in daylight. You've forgotten what real things mean. You've forfeited your rights. Had one ever any rights? Amadei sat silent. Ladislaus stood up, solid and stocky, in the sheepskin vest he wore for warmth in the cold room. He walked up and down the room a couple of times. When I was twelve and you were six, we went over to Fonte for the Easter Mass. Do you remember that? We did that most years, didn't we, when Mother was alive? But we came back by the old road by Faustin and Radico that time, because the bridge over the Garaina was out. It took all night to come back. We passed below Radico a while before sunrise. I remember it because you woke us all up. You were wide awake at the window, trying to get it open, and saying, Look at the castle, look at the castle. And Father gave you a cuff, and we all settled down again. But I remember waking up suddenly like that and seeing the tower looming up on the sky with the darkness just lifting behind it, exactly as in your poem. You are describing that moment. I don't remember it at all. Twenty years ago. Queer how the mind works, isn't it? Amade said. His hands were shaking uncontrollably. This moment of his childhood, which his brother could remember, but which he could not, this was no explanation, no answer, but an abyss. From it he turned away in terror. It's cold in here, Lottis, he said. 
Let's go in by the fire. Go on, his brother said. I've got to finish this. Three. Winter settled down over the Polano with cold and rain and the endless east wind blowing. At evening, under a ragged, iron-gray sky, the flocks came in over the hills to the great paddocks of Eston. The fields lay gray and poor, the forest was gray, leafless. Giovanna and Ladislas followed a steady routine, the girl as methodical in her housework as the man in his farm work. Amade lapsed into listlessness, finding nothing that needed his doing. At times he found it impossible to get up, cross the room, and trim a guttering lamp. The ounce of energy was lacking. He sat still. His need to make poetry had been his master. Having lost his master, he had lost his freedom. Like a tree grown up on a hill crest where the wind always blows the same, he had grown all in one direction, trunk and branches shaped to the wind, and the wind had ceased to blow. He would stand at the window for an hour at a time, looking out at the rain-lashed garden and yards, staring, not thinking, not wondering even why he had come here, and why he stayed here in this winter of boredom, this waste, this prison. The new year came, and in a burst of energy he wrote all his friends in Krasnoy, Itale, Carantai, Heliscar, Luisa, that he was coming back as soon as the roads were fit to travel. He wrote them long letters full of crazy puns and jokes. He would come back to the city in April or in May when the lindens would be flowering along the Molson Boulevard and the chestnuts in the park and the pretty women on the mall. He would leave behind him at wind-beleaguered Estin all his cobweb notions, his self-torment, the last senseless tatters of his adolescence. For that was all the trouble. Given up to his imagination, to the drunkenness of words, he had never taken time yet to become a man. It was time to face the real world. What would I be running from? he said angrily to the night, as if denying a grave, heedless accusation. And the wind went on in its tremendous tides to the west, to the sea, under Orion, standing brightly above the January hills. He thought of his boast and promise scratched in the stone of the Tower of Radico. I shall conquer. The word now remaining both lie and truth, as enduring as the stone of the Tower itself that ignored in its solitude all conquerors and all defeat. When Ladislas and Giovanna called on their wide-scattered neighbors, he went with them, and they had people come in as often as they could, perhaps in an effort to entertain him. He was aware of their shy attempts to offer him work or talk or simply mute companionship, though he was not able to make adequate response. The evenings with other people were easier. The visitors did not really want him to talk. They were daunted by him as a poet, a famous man, a city man, and wanted at best to look at him, then to turn back to one another and discuss sheep, weather, neighbors, politics. The political arguments got hot. He kept out of them, listening with a sense of detachment and disloyalty. Ladislas was a strong reformer and constitutionalist, and he was supported by the parish priest of Colet. Most of the other Dome and farmers combated his opinions, but not out of love for the government. Things were not going well in the country. Taxation fell heavy on those who had no cash to pay it. Police investigations and arrests were becoming common even in small towns and the eastern provinces where independence and conservatism were so extreme as to deserve the name of anarchism were in a resentful, stormy temper. So Ladislas and his neighbors argued and grumbled, and Amade was silent, always with that vague sense that his silence betrayed something or someone, and when there were no other women kept home by the bitter weather and the foul roads, Giovanna also was silent busy with her handwork and with looking after the tea, the supper, and so on. She was pregnant, and beautiful in pregnancy. She had gained in self-possession. She was gentle, reasonable, timid in manner. Yet Amade saw in her now also the unshakable strength, the assurance of her womanhood. She knew her way. She was happy. He watched her without envy or hope of participation. Ladislas and two neighbors were going at it hammer and tongs, 
She came over to the harpsichord near which Amade was sitting, sat down, and with a smile of mockery began to play very softly. He came to stand beside her. Oh, they are so boring, she said joyously. They'll never even hear this. It won't bother. And she played and sang half under her breath. From out my tower window I saw the red rose and the may. From out my tower window I saw the red rose and the thorn. Who rides beneath my window before the break of day? Who rides beneath my window before the morn? Go on, said Amade, who knew it from childhood, the ballad of death who carries the girl away. But Giovanna smiled and said, I can't sing, I'm so short-winded and went on playing one of her quaint old sonatinas. When she was done, she tuned a couple of the wires, which forever needed tuning, and then, sitting back on the bench, asked him, Do you still mean to leave in April? I don't know, he said absently, his gaze following the design painted on the front of the harpsichord, a wreath of roses and hawthorn chipped and faded on the cracked varnish. I don't want to leave. Then why? Because I know it's a mistake, so I do it. She played a C scale, one octave up and down, a tiny ripple of clear notes. It's foolish to talk that way. I know. I'm sorry. If you go, will you come back? No, I don't think so. There's no reason to. I came here looking for the reason to come here, but I haven't found it. You see, when I went to Krasnoy, I knew exactly why I was going, what I had to do, to write my books, meet people, make my way, fall in love, all the rest of it. I did all that. I went through all I had to go through, and now it's done. It's all done. At twenty-six? Don't think I'm lazy, Giovanna. You've scarcely seen me work. I worked very hard when I had work to do, but it's done. So I can go back to Krasnoy or anywhere else and write articles and earn a living, take up life as most people do, get married, go on from day to day for fifty years if I like. I can see that, but I don't believe it. I don't see my life ahead. I have already lived it. All the rest seems meaningless. Do you know what I mean? You foresee your own life to come in a way, don't you? I never did until now, since I've been pregnant. I see things as if the baby saw them dreaming, a summer evening out there under the poplar. The child and I are standing there waiting for Lotus to ride home, I suppose, and it's a lovely summer evening, a little sad because the wind is blowing. She smiled. And because I'll be older then. Do I ride home with Lotus? That's for you to see. They had forgotten the others. She spoke without the least convention, and he answered, harsh and pleading. But I can't. I can't see anything ahead. There's no way to see ahead through one's own eyes. It's the child, as you say, the future you bear that's your vision, the truth. But I... I have lost the way. I can't see. You worked so hard, you said, so yourself. You're tired. You're worn out. You have to wait. It's like winter. Everything has to rest and wait. She spoke earnestly with confidence. The thaws came early. There was no snow after the last week of January. In February he received the first mail to come through to Colet since Christmas. Two letters from Carantai. One dated in early December, asking if he had any news from Itale. The other an empty envelope, the seal broken. There was also a packet from the Rochoy Publishing House copies of his new book, Jivon Faujan. He gave one to his brother. Read it next winter, he said, for Ladislas was in the thick of lambing season, at work twenty hours a day, and often not at the house for two or three days at a time. No, in a week or so now, Ladislas answered seriously. But give it to Jivana, it will please her. I will. Where are you off to? South Paddocks. I'll be along, if you like. Ladislas swung up on his little horse, raised a hand in salute, and rode off. Amade went to find Giovanna in the garden west of the house. It was a cold day, the wind blowing light and keen. 
Sunlight flashed, dimmed, flashed in rain pools on the raw black ground. Giovanna was stooping over a bed of dirt, her figure bright and frail in the restless light. My crocuses are up, she said proudly. Two of them, see them? And my book's out, see it? She took the book, looked at the title, turned it over, did not know what to say. He showed her the fly-leaf on which he had written with the bad pen and gummy ink of the Collet Post Inn. For Giovanna and Ladislas from their loving brother Amade. She read the inscription and sought for words to say. Then suddenly, breaking through her own constraint, she smiled and said, Read me some of it. She sat down on the garden seat, putting up her feet on a paving stone to keep them from the mud under the bench. Now? Now, she said with her little air of command. Standing there in the uneasy sunlight, he opened the book and read the first page aloud. He paused and shut the book. It seems years ago. Someone else's book. Go on. I can't. How does it end? You shouldn't know that before you read it. I always look at the end before I begin. He glanced down at her, then opened to the last page of the book and read aloud in his hard voice. Jivan made no reply for some minutes, but leaned on the railing of the bridge in mute contemplation of the river which ran fast beneath, foam-streaked and yellow, swollen by the torrents of spring. At length, raising his head, he said, If life is anything more than a brief exile from the kingdoms beyond death. He stopped again. He closed the book and laid it down on the bench beside Giovanna. She looked up at him, helpless. The wind blew, the sun shone out and faded on the high, pale hill above the house. It's a very gloomy book, the young man said. Amade, you are going back to Krasnoy, aren't you? He shook his head. But there's nothing for you here. All my kingdom is here, it always was. Hands in his pockets, he turned away to the gate, then turned back as if to speak again. He smiled a little as if in apology, shrugged, and went on around the house. Giovanna soon followed him, wearied and oppressed by the cold wind. She lay down in her room and dozed uncomfortably. Through half-sleep she heard Amade's voice down in the yard, the stamping of a horse. Rain began to patter on the roof and window, and she slept. Perhaps he went out to shoot in the forest, she said that night. Ladislas, at his long-delayed supper, nodded and went on eating. It's been dark two hours, he said, setting down knife and fork. There's been some accident with the horse, maybe. He got up. Giovanna, watching his exhausted face, said nothing. He came back from the forest past midnight. Gil is going on to Collet with a lantern, he said. Giovanna helped him pull off his mired boots. He sat back on the hearth seat and almost at once fell asleep before he had lain down. Wakeful in her pregnancy, Giovanna sat with him, keeping the fire built up. The old housekeeper brought quilts, and they made a bed of the hearth seat. Ladislas slept there until dawn when he woke suddenly. Giovanna was asleep, curled up in the armchair by the fire. Ladislas went quietly upstairs to his brother's room to check that no one was there, then put on his boots and went out into the icy white sunrise. The crest of the hill above the house was lipped with gold. Stables, yard, house, trees stood pallid and rigid in the dawn light. Ladislas pulled the collar of his coat up around his neck and went to the stables. The stable boy came clamoring down to meet him from the loft room. Where's the rock of our bridal? Ladislas said, his voice hoarse with sleep and cold. Did Domamade take it? Aye, for the mare. I'm going out towards Fonte by the old road. Tell them in the house. He set off on his little black horse through the frost-bound forest, up the hills now bright along their eastern slopes, riding towards the summit and the tower that stood yellow in the level light. As he came over the last rise before the valley under Radico, he saw the brown mare standing halfway down the steep ascent, her reins dragging. She shied away as he rode close. She ran a little, stumbled on the reins and stopped, 
turning her dark, nervous head to watch Ladislas. He rode up past her and across the fallen wall of the courtyard, dismounted and went to the foot of the ramp leading up into the tower. Amade had set the gun, a hunting rifle, against his chest under the heart, and had fallen forward, sprawled out, his head turned to the side. His coat was soaking wet with rain, and his hair looked black. Ladislas touched his hand, which lay on the muddy ground, mud-stained and as cold as the ground or the rain. The wind kept blowing on the hills, the domain of Radico, as it always did. Amade's eyes were open, so that he seemed to be looking westward over the ruined wall and the hills at the sky, where, for him, there had been no sunrise the night continuing. 